gentlemen, we have called you together to inform you that we are going to overthrow the United States government. Okay, I want to say thanks to each and every one of you for being here today. Um, it's going to be a great day. Uh, I'm going to go through um, what I consider to be the very heart of my material. And uh, people ask me a lot, they say, you put out a lot of material on your website, what is the main thing? If, if, you, had a, if you had to tell me the main thing that I should check out, if I check out nothing else that's up there, what would it be? And I always tell them the same thing. It's the material on natural law. If, uh, if nothing else, that's the material that you need to understand deeply. So that's what we're going to be covering here today uh, in an extended uh, presentation format. I want to go through uh, a few things before we actually get started. So I call this section before we begin. And uh, the word begin is actually important here because that's really what this presentation is actually about. It's initiation. This is an initiation into really, really deep esoteric material that has been hidden from humanity for millennia. So I just want to ask people before we get started, how many of you are new or relatively new to my work? By a show of hands, please. That's excellent. This is great. That is great news. I am so glad to hear that. Okay. I, what I actually didn't want is to come here and talk to a bunch of people who are already totally f familiar with my work and have already heard it. So this is great, okay? Um, how many of you here today feel that the human condition and life on earth for humanity right now is tolerable just the way that it is by a show of hands? That's also pretty good because if that was the case, I was going to say, there's nothing for you here today. There's the door, <laughs> okay? So that's good, that we're all hungry for change. Uh, one of the things, one of the big complaints I hear about uh, my work, uh, when I check in on forums or something or read some YouTube comments, many people will say, there's nothing new here. I've heard this before somewhere else. Uh, this person covers this. I've read this in this book. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have news for you. There is nothing new here. I am not going to present anything new. I'm not going to present anything that has not actually been in existence and will continue to be in existence. I'm not making up new material. I, I call myself, I, I would refer to myself, Art uh, said it the other day, actually uh, yesterday when we were having dinner. He, he said, I consider you an aggregator of material. And I love that term. I, I, I love that description of what I do. I, I am an aggregator. I bring things together into a tapestry and then help to explain it in simple and easy to understand terms so that people can readily absorb it, take it in, and then do something with that information. So you will not be seeing or hearing anything new here today, okay? As the old saying goes in, in, in all of the old mystery traditions, there is nothing new under the sun. And what that phrase actually means, many people don't know what that phrase means. It means that the truth, it, it is singular and eternal, Truth has always been here among us, and it will always be, be here. It is our perception that must be aligned with it. So there's nothing new you're going to hear today, okay? It is, these are eternal truths that have always been here among us. Um, another aspect I want to cover before we get started is about my presentation style. This is another thing that I get a lot of complaints about, and it's something that I have no intention of changing, okay? Uh, my presentation style has been described by some as extremely intense, 
and at times even combative. This is a word many people will use to describe my presentation style. Some of you here today are very likely to be angered by some of the things you may hear me say during the duration of this seminar. And I say, so be it. That's okay. If you get angry, that's okay. The fact of the matter is that truth itself, by its very nature, is belligerent. And I'll actually be uh, putting up a quote to that, re to that nature uh, later on in the presentation. The reason truth is belligerent is because it actually is, is at war. It's at war with the lie. It's at war with deception. It's at war with mind control. So truth can be belligerent. Many people don't want to hear it when they, when they first encounter it. So um, I tell people all the time, I don't do this, I don't present this information, okay, to be liked. I don't do this to make friends, okay? I'm not interested in making a whole bunch of new friends. If it happens, that's great, okay? But that's not the reason I do what I do. I don't do this to be popular. I don't do this to make money. It's not a popularity contest. Telling people many things that they don't want to hear is not going to make you popular or it's not going to make you a whole lot of new friends, okay? So those aren't the reasons I do what I do. To be honest, and I, I tell people this, and sometimes they get upset by just hearing this, I don't even really want to do this, okay? I don't want to do this with my life. I don't want to do this with my time, okay? As I already know, understand, and live the information I'm going to present. So I, I get this. I know this. Okay? I don't need to keep going over this over and over and over again for my own entertainment. Okay? The reason that I actually do this is because I recognize that in a time of such overwhelming ignorance of this critical information, this information which is capable of saving humanity from its current condition, all right? The fact that I do already understand this information places me in a position of moral obligation and responsibility. That's why I do what I do. I'm in a position of moral obligation to speak this information to other people in an effort to help to get them to understand it and live it as well. And that is the reason I do this. Every person here today who wishes to take real world value, practical value from this seminar here today, I'm going to ask them to make a deliberate and conscious effort to do two things. The first is try to set aside, uh, to the extent that you are capable of doing so, your perceptions of me as the presenter, okay? And this includes things like how you think I look, how you think I dress, the sound of my voice, uh, you know, my mannerisms, etc. Try to set those things aside to the extent that you're able to do it. And I know that's difficult for some. And I say this because paying attention to such trivialities will detract your own mental focus away from the information that is being presented today. And that's the worst thing that could happen because it's the information that is important, not me. Try to ignore me and focus on the content, all right? The second thing I ask people to try to do is to be consciously aware of any of your own impulses that you may have here today to immediately reject the information that is being presented in this seminar based solely upon your own initial, initial emotional reaction, your initial emotional response to this information, okay? Th this is a logical fallacy, okay? You cannot think with the emotions. So if you hear something you don't like or that angers you, that's okay. Feel the emotion, but don't just immediately say, that can't be true. It's, and, don't, and don't believe me either. It's about checking it. It's about a process of truth discovery. It's about doing your own due diligence and actually researching this material, okay? But if you try to gauge the veracity, meaning the truthfulness of this information, solely based upon how it makes you feel when hearing it, you are committing a logical fallacy, okay? So I ask people to try to... Try as much as possible to suspend immediate reactions of disbelief, okay, and saying, no, I don't want to accept that, no, it can't be true, based on how something may make you feel that you hear today. That's very important to keep in mind. And lastly, this information 
The entire seminar is a tapestry. Okay, it's like pieces of a huge jigsaw puzzle. All right, it is meant to be seen and taken as a whole in its entirety. Now I know I'm asking a lot here too, because it's going to be a long day. Okay, and my goal here, my work here, is to keep your interest and your attention and your focus throughout the entire course of the seminar. And that's a challenging thing to do. But what I'm asking people is, you have to try to see it as a whole, because. If you, if, if you took the time to be here and you gave a monetary donation to be here, I'm highly recommending that you stay for the whole duration of the seminar. Uh, there's a reason for that. You're only going to get the full tapestry, especially if you're new to my work, by hearing this information in its entirety. Okay? So if you don't do that, you'll probably not recognize the patterns, which is what this is all about. That's what this day is all about, pattern recognition. Okay? That are, that are inherent to this tapestry of information. And more likely than not, you'll have wasted the time that you took to be here today and wasted the money that you spent to be here today. So I don't want anybody to waste their time and their money and their attention. Uh, and I don't think you do either. So that's why I, I'm asking people, stay for the whole thing. You'll get the maximum value out of this seminar if you stay for its duration. So with that having been said, let's jump into the material. This presentation is called Natural Law the real law of attraction and how to apply it in your life. And I, I emphasize that term, real law of attraction. Many people will be familiar with the new age variants of the so-called law or laws of attraction. And this is going to differ quite widely from what people have heard in the new age community and in the, in the new age movement regarding what the law or laws of attraction are. These are the real laws of attraction you're going to be hearing today and hopefully understanding today. So let's start in. The first section is about teachability. The teachability of the student, okay? How is, does a student place themselves in the best position to learn? An individual's teachability or their ability to learn by way of being taught by someone else is extremely dependent upon the open-mindedness or closed-mindedness of the individual being taught. Low teachability derives from arrogance and rigid skepticism. But it also derives, low teachability also derives from naivete and gullibility. High teachability, on the other hand, derives from a balance between healthy skepticism and an open-minded willingness to learn and change. So we don't want rigidly skeptical people, okay, that don't have an open mind at all, and we don't want naive and gullible people that will accept everything they're told. We want to, we want to, we want to strike a balance between these two modes. This is called a teachability bell curve, okay? And down here, is uh, the mental state of the student, whether they are, and it goes from arrogance, cynicism, skeptical nature, uh, a teacher, a student, and then up to being trusting, then being gullible, and then being outright naive. Okay, so the, that's the whole spectrum of teachability. The best position to learn is up here at the top of the bell curve. This means you will learn the most if you are here. And that means you're in the balance between teacher and student. It means that you're somewhat skeptical and you're also somewhat trusting. It means that you're able to hold a proposition in your mind without accepting it or rejecting it immediately. It means you will consider the information with an open mind, okay, somewhat trustingly, but also somewhat skeptically. All right, that's going to be the mental state we want to attempt to keep during the duration of this seminar, and therefore you will be in the best position to learn. Of course, as we already said, the poorest positions to learn, the, the things that, if you're in these mind states in arrogance and rigid skepticism and naivete and gullibility, you're, you're not going to take very much away from this seminar. Okay, so we want to remain at the top of that bell curve if at all possible. Human beings should consider with great care where their information comes from, the source for the information. And this is because by refusing to present certain information 
and by influencing people to dismiss, to dissuade them from looking into certain information because they're telling you that it's unimportant or unnecessary to consider, many modern institutions like media, like so-called education uh, institutions, are seeking to actually control human perceptions, or let's call it outright what it really is, to control the mind, okay? And therefore, to limit what human beings may even come to understand, and therefore, by limiting what they are coming to understand, they're actually limiting what they're able to do, what they're able to change, what they're able to create in the world, okay? So very, you have to be skeptical of where your information comes from. And that's why I tell people at the very beginning in my lectures, do not believe me. The worst thing you could do is believe what I'm telling you. You need to look into it for yourself. And most of all, you need to do personal introspection to really feel inside of yourself whether this information resonates with truth. Everybody has that intuitive capacity. That also has to be turned on and engaged and used. All right? If anybody is coming to this seminar from the perspective of modern, organized, institutional bodies, meaning political thought, political agendas, political organizations, religion, religious thought, religious organizations. I'm talking about organized religion here, okay? What I call scientism, not real science, but scientism, science as set up by institutional bodies to be rigidly skeptical belief systems that blot out anything that could possibly say anything to the contrary of their pre-existing beliefs. I call that scientism, okay? And of course, the New Age movement, which you could group that in with religion. It's just enough, it's for those who don't fall into the religious mindset, this is an alternative religion proposed for them and they call it the New Age movement. And I tell people, uh, please don't think uh, this is going to uh, concur with any of these belief systems with any of these boxes for consciousness. This presentation is going to shatter these boxes. It is. It stands outside of all of these because these are limiters for perception and thought. They want to put, place everything in a box, say nothing outside of this box is fit for human consumption, so do, do not go there. And as a result, they act as a mind control influence. The other and biggest limiter of uh, of the per human perceptions and the mind, and ultimately of our behavior, is money itself. If you want to talk about the biggest religion, if these, these other religions aren't big enough and powerful enough for you, there's the one that is the ultimate power in the world, the ultimate religion, the god of this world, if you will. Okay? So, what I'm basically saying here is if you're already in a mindset approaching the, uh, let's call it the um, uh, discovery of reality or the exploration of reality from any of these perspectives, you will be sorely disappointed here today by what you're going to hear because the information here falls well outside of any of these institutional limiters for consciousness, okay? The requirements for creating change and the role of knowledge. Let's talk about these concepts for a moment. Human beings everywhere say that they want certain things in their life, and they say that they want certain things to be present for all humanity, okay? We say we want certain conditions to be present for ourselves and our species as a whole. And, and we, we say we want things such as happiness, health, peace, prosperity, freedom, etc., and all these things are great things to aspire to. And we say we want them. Most people will say and tell you we want these things. All right? However, you know, I don't really feel that they're truly being honest with themselves. Okay? They'll say they want them. But then when you tell them, well, those aren't automatic conditions. They don't just magically manifest. Okay? There are requirements for obtaining these conditions. Okay? And... People wouldn't say they want these conditions if these conditions were already omnipresent, right? 
They're saying that they want something because they don't have it at all, or at least in fullness, right? So when you tell them there's requirements for obtaining them, many people will say, oh, well, you know, I may not be willing to go there. I may not be, I may not want to exert that much effort. And they believe that somehow they're going to magically get these things, right? Well, this is what the real laws of attraction are about. It's explaining conditions that you want don't just automatically manifest by thinking of them or just having a feeling about them. This is a new age deception. There are requirements for obtaining the conditions that we say we want. Requirement exists in nature. It does exist. If you want something to be different than the way that it already is, than the default conditions, then requirement exists. If you're okay with things being the way that they are now, requirement doesn't exist. There are no requirements to creating change. You just accept the default conditions the way they are now and go on with your existence and accept it's going to be this way and possibly get worse. But if you want real change to happen, requirements exist. And this is what many New Age teachers will not tell you or they'll outright deny that requirements exist for creating real change. Specific requirements exist in order for human beings to obtain the conditions that they say they want. If the requirements for obtaining those conditions are not met, those conditions do not just magically manifest by magical means automatically. That's not how it works, folks. Uh, you know, and that bursts a lot of people's bubble right off the bat. But this is a key concept to understand. So what are these requirements? We need to know certain things. Knowledge is required. Knowledge. Knowledge that will spur us to action. That's what's required. Okay? Since human beings as a species do not already have the things that they say they want, and again, at least not in fullness. If we want to split hairs, we could say we have a, a modicum of what we, say, we may say that we want, but we don't have it in the fullness that we will say that we want it, as, especially societally, globally, okay? So since we don't already have these things, it follows logically that the knowledge of the requirements to obtaining these things, okay, either must be absent, they are not, the knowledge is not present anywhere, or if it is present, if that knowledge for obtaining those things the requirements for obtaining those things, if that knowledge is present, then it must be willfully being ignored. It is here, and yet people aren't paying attention to it. They aren't taking it in and accepting it and doing anything with that knowledge. So they're ignoring it because it's uncomfortable. As long as this knowledge continues to remain either unknown or ignored, the manifestation of the desired conditions that we say that we want is impossible. Can not happen. It is an impossibility for it to magically, automatically manifest without the requirements being met. And that's what we're going to talk about here today. What are these requirements? What is this knowledge? This knowledge is occulted, meaning hidden. Okay, now, how many people here came here today thinking that they were going to hear information about the occult by a show of hands? Okay, about half the room, good. Okay, for the rest of the people, that may come as a shock. But what you have to understand right off the bat is that the word occult, it's simply derived from Latin, the Latin adjective occultus. Occultus in Latin means hidden, hidden from sight. And it's derived from the Latin noun oculus, which means eye, okay? The word ocular in English means related to the eye or related to sight or vision. So what the occult is, is something, it is a body of knowledge that has been hidden away for a specific reason. And we're going to get into what that reason is. Okay, so... Uh, from the, the term oculus or eye in Latin comes the verb occultare. Occultare means to hide, to conceal, or to keep secret, to keep hidden from the eye so that it cannot be seen. 
The information regarding natural law is occulted knowledge. It is knowledge that has been hidden from humanity. Okay? It has been, it's held by the few, which, which is represented here at the top of this pyramid. You can look at this as a pyramid representing knowledge or ignorance. At the top of the pyramid, you have knowledge. It's the, the highest, higher you go in the pyramid, the more knowledge. Okay? But the pyramid tapers because at the top, very few people understand that information. Very few, few people have that knowledge and have actually integrated it into themselves to the, to the point where it becomes understanding. All right? Down here, you have no knowledge, the igno ignorant masses. Okay? And, and up here, you have the people who are in the know, right? Who have this knowledge about how natural law works and are actually using it for a certain reason. We're going to get to that next, what that is. So please, as you go through this seminar, please keep in mind, if I ever use the term occult, all I'm talking about here is hidden knowledge. That's what it means. Occulted knowledge is hidden. Now, why would anybody want to hide knowledge that is extremely important? Well, there's a very specific reason, all right? But before we even get to that, we have to talk about what is this occulted knowledge? What, what is the body of knowledge? What does it comprise? When, I, when I'm saying the occult, the knowledge of the occult, what do I mean by that? All right? Occult knowledge constitutes two things. There's two general bodies of occult knowledge. In, in, in the actual mystery traditions and in occult schools, they talk about these as arcana, A-R-C-A-N-A, -A, arcana. Ar the word arcana is also Latin. It means knowledge, okay? That's all it means. So there's two bodies of knowledge. There's one body of knowledge in the occult called lesser arcana, the lesser arcana or the minor arcana. This means the, the knowledge of the microcosm, the knowledge of the small things, okay? It doesn't mean it's less important. It means it's dealing with the individual units of consciousness, the human psyche, the, the psyche of the individual, okay? So the first part, the first major body of occult knowledge constitutes knowledge of human consciousness, how it works, how it operates, what our motivations are, things like that, okay? The second body of occult knowledge is called the greater arcana or the major arcana. All right, And again, this doesn't refer to that it's more important. It refers to it is the macrocosmic understanding, the understanding of the very large laws of nature that govern the, the, the macrocosm. Okay, So universal laws are part of the greater arcana of occult knowledge. And what I call here today, under the umbrella, the term natural law, falls into that second category of greater knowledge, the greater arcana of occult knowledge, okay? And what these natural laws are, are unseen and universal spiritual laws. We're going to talk, we could talk about the word natural here too. Natural is derived from Egyptian and other Middle Eastern tradition languages, okay? The word netter in, in Egyptian, which would have been spelled without vowels. If we transliterated it, it would be N-T-R in English. Netter means spirit in Egyptian, in ancient Egyptian. The, the, the suffix A-L, even in English today, but if you go back into Arabic languages and uh, you know ancient Middle Eastern languages, um, A-L as a suffix actually means of or related to, or having come from, okay? So natural, if you put these root words together, netter and al, right, it means of or related to the realm of spirit, of or related to God, actually. The word netter also meant God, spirit or God, okay? So this is the spiritual domain, the laws that actually are operating in the unseen realm, okay? Now, they manifest in the physical realm. We're going to talk about that. Okay, because that's the, the operation that it trickles down from. It starts in the spiritual domain and then it manifests in the physical domain. All right? So it's important to understand these two bodies of knowledge, the lesser arcana, okay, is about the monad or the individuated unit of consciousness. 
of the human being. And then the greater knowledge is about the laws that govern the macrocosmic universe. All right? So what these laws do, this body of, of uh, the workings of nature that I am calling under the umbrella natural law, they're universal spiritual laws which govern the consequences of behavior. They govern the consequences of behavior. And I would add a caveat to that. They govern the consequences of behavior for intelligent species, for beings that are capable of coming to their understanding. Okay? I, I, and I would delineate that from, like, the animal kingdom. Okay? The animal kingdom is not held to the same standard as the as human beings when it comes to this body of information because I don't think you're going to sit down with your cat and explain natural law to it. Okay? So when people say, well, why doesn't the animal kingdom uh, held to account in the same way the human beings are? It's because, surprise, surprise, we don't share the same level of consciousness. Okay, there is differences in levels of consciousness and abilities to comprehend information and, and uh, to actually know how something works. Just like you will not be explaining physics to your dog anytime soon, okay, you're not going to explain natural law to the animal kingdom and have them grasp it because they're not at the same level of consciousness as, as we are. Okay, so we are held to a different account when it comes to natural law. It governs human behavior. It would be an easy way of saying it. This body of knowledge has actually been called consequentialism by past researchers and teachers. And I have no problem with that term. I, I, I've actually looked into consequentialism and it's quite similar, okay, in, in its scope and what it teaches. It's been called karma, karmic law in many Middle Eastern and Eastern traditions, okay? And I have no problem with that term for it either. It has been called in some of the Western traditions and Christian traditions moral law. And I have no problem with that term either. Uh, religionists have called it God's law. And I have no problem with that term either. I have no problem with any of these terms being applied to the umbrella of natural law. Because th that is essentially what it is. But we're going to get into deeply into how it works and operates in our lives here today. Why is this knowledge hidden away from people? To what ends? The knowledge of the occult, the hidden in knowledge about how natural law works and how consciousness works, is not commonly known. That's why it's not the exoteric. It's not given to the masses. It's the esoteric. It is reserved for the few. And there's a reason for that. It's been deliberately hidden away and kept from the general public in order to create and maintain a power differential. Because if someone else is an extreme level of knowledge, and they know how something works, like something as trivial as how human consciousness works, how human motivations work, how human perceptions work, how human beings can be manipulated. If somebody has deep knowledge of that information, and there's a whole bunch of people over here who have not one iota of how that works. What kind of a number do you think somebody can do on people like that? See, the way I ask people to look at this is real simple. Imagine a very, very, very advanced psychologist at the top of his field, wrote all the textbooks, okay? And he's got a house out in the burbs. He comes into the university. To t he's got tenure, okay? He's got the trophy wife, the house out in the suburbs, the three-car garage, driving the Lexus into work at his tenured job, and he finds out that his trophy wife is having an affair because she's bored. She's not satisfied with him at home. And it's maybe the 19-year-old, uh, uh, you know, uh, captain of the local uh, high school football team or something. He's a senior. He's a star football player, right? The jock, yeah. And she has a fling with him. Well, what if he decides I'm going to become buddy-buddy with my boy here after finding out about his wife's affair? And this kid, this punk, who's cheating on, you know, my wife's cheating on me with, uh, he knows nothing. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't study the mind. He doesn't know anything even about himself. 
who watches TV six hours a day, plays violent video games, is obsessed with football, you know? What kind of a number you think that psychologist can do on that kid? Total number. That's the answer, exactly. That's right. He could do a total number on him. He can gain his confidence. He can get into his head. And I guarantee you, you give him a little bit of time, he could screw up his life based on what he knows and how he would be able to manipulate based on his hatred of that person. Well, guess what? That's the position humanity's in. We're that punk jock. And I'm not saying we necessarily did something to deserve it, but we're in that same position where the people with this knowledge at the highest levels, they hate us. And they're doing a total number on us because we don't have this knowledge. And until that changes, don't expect the playing field to be leveled. Expect it to get worse. Okay? The knowledge is hidden to create and maintain a power differential between those who hold it and those who are ignorant of it. It's that simple. The knowledge of natural law and its operations constitutes what I call the most deeply occulted or hidden information that exists on this planet. You will not find any more hidden information. This is the thing that all the distractions are there for, to keep you from learning. The endless trivialities, the nonsense you hear on the news, all the video games, all the nonsense television, the sports, you know, it's all there to keep people from understanding this. And I can't get you to accept that or believe it, and I don't ask you to believe it. I'm telling you that's what they're trying to, from my years of being inside occult traditions that are very, very dark, I'm telling you this is what they don't want you to know from firsthand experience. How many people here today, today know that I was involved in the dark occult in my past? Good. Great. Okay. The powers that be want to seek to keep this information hidden from the people of the earth at all costs because understanding this information about natural law will level the playing field and put an end to the currently entrenched systems of control that are operating on the earth. We should very clearly make a distinguishment between nescience and ignorance so that people fully understand the difference between these two concepts. How many people even have heard the term nescience? Very few. This is a word that has practically been sanitized from colloquial English. Practically been sanitized from the English lang language. And there's a reason for that too. There's two contexts to not knowing something. The first context is nescience. Okay? Nescience comes from the Latin. The prefix ne in Latin means not or not present or absent. Okay? And then scio, sciere in Latin means to know. It's where we get the word science from. Okay? So, you put them together, and nescience, it, it actually, those two roots form another word, nescire. Nescire in Latin means not to know, to not know, to not understand. But there's a connotation to it. It means to not understand because the specific information that you may be uh, having a, a desire to understand is completely absent. It is not present, and you cannot actually aggregate that information. You can't bring those pieces of grammar together to form the sentence, okay? It's not present, okay? So you don't have it at all. It's unattainable. This should be clearly delineated from ignorance. Now, nescience is not someone's fault. The information just isn't there, okay? You can't be blamed for nescience. There is no blame in nescience. The person who is nescient is not to be blamed for being nescient. The information simply wasn't present so they could take it in and then come to understand it. Ignorance carries blame. This is another thing people want to think in the New Age movement, there's no such thing as. Nobody's to blame. And that goes to that there's no cause for anything that's happening, as you'll hear a lot in the New Age circles. Okay? I very strongly put down these notions or attempt to. Okay? There are causes and effects. There are people who are responsible for what is happening. There is blame. Blame exists. Okay? 
There are, pe- there are people who are culpable. We're going to talk about moral culpability later. So ignorance has blame attached to it and responsibility attached to it. Okay? It comes from the Latin verb ignorare in Latin. And this means not to know, just like nescience means not to know, but in a completely different connotation. The connotation of ignorance means you don't know even though necessary information is present and right there before you because you have willfully refused or disregarded that information. Whether you've refused it because it made you feel uncomfortable or whether you disregarded it because you felt that's not important for me to know. I don't need to know that. Or you feel you already understand something that contradicts with what's, you know, the new thing that you're hearing or seeing. Okay? So when you willfully disregard something, okay, if I wanted to willfully disregard the gentleman sitting in the front row, he's present. I could sit just pretend he's not here and ignore him. That's what ignoring is. This is why I, I try to say, tell to, say to people that the impact of the word is almost lost to us of the word ignorance because of the way it's pronounced. I tell people, start pronouncing it ignorance. Ignorance. Then people will hear the word ignore in it and, and the connotation becomes clear. It means you're ignoring it. Ignorance. Okay? That's how I like to say it now. Because the connotation is clear that way. The, it's, it, the, the information is there. The truth is there. And somebody wants to ignore it completely. Now, that is inexcusable. And there is blame that is attached with that. So what I ask people all the time is, do we have a nescient society? Or do we have an ignorant one? Do we have an ignorant one? Is our society ensconced in nescience or is it ensconced in ignorance? I would argue absolutely that we are ensconced in ignorance in society, not nescience. I think we are drowning in information. I think we are drowning in the truth that is all around us, but people are ignoring it largely. Not everyone. There's many people who are very hungry for it and taking it in as fast as they can, you know? But I think the majority of human beings are in the state of ignorance, even though the truth is present all around us. And that constitutes what Art talked about earlier, this consensus trance, which people in the so-called truth community or truth movement have likened to sleep. They say that they are asleep. I liken it to hypnosis. If you look at the origins of the word hypnosis, right, it means suppressed knowledge. It comes from Greek. Hypo means under, as in hypodermic, under the skin. And gnosis means knowledge, the suppression of knowledge. Hypo means suppression also, under and suppression. So hypnosis is the suppression of knowledge. And that's the state that these people are in. And it's, it's done by themselves. It's not, see, we have to stop looking at this as victim, as a victim relationship. This is a willful choice. In a time of overwhelming information available at people's fingertips, the truth being ignored is not an option. It's a willful decision that people are making. And it's a decision that they should be held accountable to because of what is going on that they are ignoring, what they are allowing to go on in their name and not saying a thing about it. Content to let evil run amok. All right? And then people will wonder, why are we losing freedom? Why is freedom on the wane? Why is totalitarianism and tyranny rising up? Why do we see so much control and obsession with control in our society? You know, they'll see that. Many of them will see the rising police state. They'll see the injustices in our society. They'll see the restrictions on our our inherent natural liberty. Okay? But here's the thing. Many of them will not make the transition to grasping. You know? They'll say, yeah, this is what's happening to the earth. It's being turned into a huge prison everywhere. 
and at the most rapid pace right here in America. Okay? And they'll see this lock going onto the cage, but the question that they never get to, they don't even get to the question, let alone the answer, is why? They'll talk about the symptoms. They'll describe the prison. They'll describe every corner of the cage accurately in many cases. They can tell you exactly how it's working. They can tell you all the different aspects of the control system. But they can't tell you why it's actually going into place. Why is that happening? Well, that's what this presentation answers. Why are we losing freedom? And it gets to the actual heart of that answer. So what this presentation constitutes is a master key that unlocks all the locks to all the doors on all the cages in the prison, if it is accepted. And once again, I don't tell you that belief is required for that, because truth is always present. It's always here. It's a matter of will we perceive it as being present, acknowledge it's present by stop ignoring it, okay, and then accept it into ourselves, and then do something with it. Understanding is not the end. Taking in the knowledge and understanding it is the beginning. Action is required. See, knowledge is required. Understanding is required. But then action is finally required. Above all, if change is to be created. And that's how the laws of attraction really work. So, will people as a whole, as a society, accept that master key? I can't answer that question. All I could do is try to place it into their hands. After I have taken that key and unlocked my personal prison, my personal cages, and freed my mind, all I can do is try to help people to see, here's how this key works. Here it is. Here's the information that constitutes that key. And here's how you put it to work in your life. That's all I can do. Can't make anybody take it. Let's look at what problem solving entails, because that's really critical to understand if we're going to get past the, this stage and where we're at in our stifled uh, evolutionary development as a species. There's a few main steps to solving problems, any problem. doesn't matter what the nature of the problem is. The first is you have to recognize that the problem exists. Recognize that there is a problem to begin with. And I think by asking the question, is everybody content with the way things are, and nobody raised their hand, I think that's great because it, it at least acknowledges to me the people here today recognize we have a problem. And that's healthy. That's good. Okay? Many people out there don't believe we have a problem. You know, they, they, they like this place. They like the world the way that it is, you know, which is unfathomable to me because to me it's a living hell. And that's not because of how my own personal life is going. I'm very content with my own personal life. I have no self-inflicted suffering in my personal life. I don't create problems for myself. My life goes on very well according to how I live it without hurting anybody else. The problem is other people. And that's another thing new, the New Agers won't acknowledge, and they'll flip out if you say that there's a problem with someone else. There are problems with other people, okay? And people will say people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. My glass house has been taken down long since, long time ago, because I went through all that personal introspective work, and I dug deep into my subconscious and faced those problems and confronted them head on and healed them and came out of the mindset that I was once in. Okay? So, you know, people will say, if there's something you don't like, you're seeing in, in other people, that's something in yourself that you're seeing in them. This is new age mumbo jumbo nonsense. Okay? If you're not part of the problem, I'm not part of this problem. I can say that honestly. I'm not part of this problem. I can look at every single person, anybody who's watching this, and say, I'm not part of the problem that's happening on the earth with all honesty and knowing that I am telling the truth with that. Okay? But, but see, at one point, I was part of the problem and a, a big part of the problem. Okay? What I had to do at some point is stop doing this and pointing out and saying the problem lies elsewhere while I was still part of it. 
And then I had to do this and point squarely at myself and say, what do I need to change here, here, and finally here in the guts? in the courage. You know, people will say, yeah, change happens in the mind, it happens in the heart, but lastly, it happens in the guts. We need to generate what I call the heart, mind, guts, okay? You gotta care enough to know and then put it into action. The heart, mind, guts, okay? That taking action is the most important step when it comes to creating change. And we're gonna get to that in a moment. But the whole point here is I had to look at what I needed to change about myself in my thoughts, my emotions, and my actions, and then change those things in myself. This is what most people want to run away from. They want to say, yeah, I want those things that I say I want to magically, to be present in my life, but I don't want to do those things that require self-change in how I think, in how I feel, and in how I act. I want it magically to happen without changing those things in me. So I can honestly look at the rest of the world and say, the problem does not lie within me. I am not seeing a manifestation of myself in other people. Other people have not done the same process that I have, the introspective work that I have, and gone through that painful, painstaking work that involves effort, hard effort. I'm not up here telling people, I'm offering you the, the tonic. You're going to take a sip and magically you will be enlightened. Okay? Knowing what's going on in the world is hard work. It involves destruction. It's a destructive process. It involves destruction of belief systems. It involves completely breaking down barriers that are in your head. Okay? Hardly anybody wants to do that work. People want to run a million miles an hour in the opposite direction from that work. Anything but that. I'll take the grave instead of that. Okay? That's where most people's heads are at. All right? So let's get back to the steps here for problem solving. The first is you got to recognize that there's a problem. If you are in denial, good luck. Let me know how that works out for you. Because you're not solving any problem in a state of denial at all. Fear-based denial of the problem must first be dealt with and conquered and stamped out. And you have to acknowledge how bad it is. You know? People feel symptoms coming on of a disease or something and they want to ignore it because they don't want to believe I'm sick. I don't want to believe I'm sick. I don't want to believe I have a problem. Then you're waiting, waiting, waiting. You don't get it diagnosed and then it turns into a much bigger problem, which is where we're at as a society for ignoring this information. This is what denial looks like, symbolically. Okay, A person with their head in the sand like an ostrich. And please take note, ladies and gentlemen, when you're in this position, when you're in the position of denial with your head in the sand, you're on your knees with your ass in the air. Okay? I, I almost say it's amazingly synchronistic that the human body was designed like that. That in order to put your head in the sand, symbolically so to speak, you have to be on your knees. Okay? And that's where most of our society is at. They're on their knees. And in that state of denial. The second step to problem solving is to recognize that the symptoms that are being displayed, the symptoms you are seeing, are merely effects of underlying causal factors. You can't treat symptoms and solve a problem. It's not possible. That's not how problem solving works. You have to get to what caused the problem. Okay? Instead of simply treating symptoms, make an accurate diagnosis of the causes of the problem. So what does the word diagnosis mean? Diagnosis comes from Greek. The preposition dia, transliterated there, there in the parentheses, you see it in, in Greek script, okay? It means through or by way of. So by a method, by a particular method, all right? And the second part of diagnosis is the Greek noun gnosis. Gnosis means knowledge in Greek. So what a diagnosis means is through knowledge or by way of knowledge. You're going to solve the problem by way of knowledge. There is knowledge that acts as the requirement to solving the problem and getting what you want. 
And here's another thing, and I'm going to keep going back to this. It's going to be like an undercurrent in this. Because the New Age community, and I'm going to be, I'm, have been, but I'm going to become a more outspoken opponent of New Age ideologies. Because they are lying to people. Whether it be through direct, willful deception, or whether it be but through useful dupes and useful idiots. They are telling people things that are completely inaccurate to how things really work. All right? Because they want to keep people suppressed and non-active. They want people in acceptance mode of everything. Accept, accept, accept. Never rebel. Okay? Don't take action. Just observe. Just watch. You'll hear all of these things in the New Age movement. Okay? The reason I bring it up is because when you even say the word knowledge to some New Agers, they almost take offense. Because what's, what the New Age is becoming is the new modern day variant. It's a new form of what's known as solipsism. And we're going to get to what solipsism is in a little while. Okay? But essentially, people don't want to hear that knowledge is what is required. Because the attainment of real knowledge, not pseudo-knowledge, real knowledge, requires work. It requires effort. It requires reading. It requires listening. It requires watching. And you know what most of all it requires that people don't want to give up? Who can tell me? Time. Thank you, sir. It requires time. There's one of the currencies people don't spend, uh, you know, on many things that they don't feel they can get immediate gratification from, which is why immediate gratification is so stressed in our society by the control system. That's what keeps people in their ignorance. So a diagnosis means if you're going to get well, you've got to have the knowledge of the underlying causal factors that, that led to the creation of the symptoms. You're not going to treat the symptoms and get well. You've got to have the knowledge to get to the causal factors to find out what cause put this into effect. And we're going to talk a lot about cause and effect. The third step to problem solving is through the knowledge that you've acquired now via making an accurate diagnosis of the problem of the causal factors, right? You're going to then put that knowledge into action. Understanding what created the problem is like step two, right? Stop being in denial. Understand what caused the problem. Act on the knowledge you now have to solve the problem, to make it right, okay? So action is required. We make the diagnosis, then we have to take the required action necessary to rectify or to set right, which is what the word rectify means, the causal factors that led to the manifestation, of the problem. Let's talk a little bit about the concept of what truth is, how I refer to truth in all of my work. Because people have a real deeply mystified concept of what truth is or what it means. You know, they'll get into all these really deep abstract discussions of uh, the mind of God and, you know, uh, trying to get into like, you know, quantum theory and everything. Th this is mystification of the concept of the truth. And we have to demystify it. We have to bring it down to real simple, easy to understand language that anybody can comprehend. And then really completely delineate that from perception of any given thing. Because the two are not the same. When people say perception is reality, nothing could be farther from reality than that statement. Perception is not reality. Okay? It is just what it says. Perception. Seeing through. Perceive. To see through something. Like a lens or a filter. Okay? I perceive things differently without these glasses. That's one perception. When I put them on, I perceive things quite differently and more clearly. Okay? Well, that's how human perception works, like a lens. It's a filter. Okay? But what's there is the same thing. What's there is the same thing. All the change is how I perceived it. All right? So let's look at this concept. Truth is objective. That means that it's not dependent 
upon the perceptions of human beings. No one wants to hear that. That is, that is a direct assault, a direct frontal assault on the human ego. Because everybody wants to hear, my perceptions are important. And we want to also believe my perceptions are accurate. Okay? Now people will say, well, what makes you say your perception of this topic is going to be accurate? That's because I went through the process of having to admit over and over and over and over and over again endlessly how wrong I was about my former perceptions. I went through that destructive process of breaking down my former belief systems, of breaking down my former emotional patterns, of, uh, and of, of most of all changing my behavior. That's the thing that's the most destructive because we get attached to our behaviors and patterns. So asking people to change, I recognize it's not easy. It took me like probably, probably about eight years of my life to do it. Most people don't want to spend a minute on creating personal change, let alone eight years. And you know, when I look at myself, in all honesty, again, none of this is to sound egoic or to toot my own horn, but I look at it like I was a mild case of ego entrapment a mild case compared to where I see other people at. I, I, I feel like I was the, uh, uh, you know, a very brittle stone that just needed to be hit with a chisel a few times and it broke into powder. You know, other people are hardened granite or diamond. You know, to break them down is going to take enormous effort and work. And most of them don't even want to do it. They're so calcified you know, they're so, the, the, they've been so compressed into that hardened state that they don't even want to start. So I realize telling people your perceptions are not what really matters. You know, that the truth isn't based upon how you perceive things, that it's independent from your perceptions. Most people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that. Human beings' perceptions are capable of wavering. They can, they can waver slightly from the truth, and they can waver wildly from the truth. All right? What truth is, is that which does not waver. It doesn't move. It's that which is. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks about it. It doesn't matter whether anybody believes it. It doesn't matter whether anybody knows it. It doesn't matter whether anybody sees it. It doesn't matter whether anybody wants to see it. It's there. It's always been there. It's always going to be there. Nothing anybody does can change what has happened. Can anybody change what has already occurred in what we call, in, in the thinking of linear time, the past? Not one person here is capable of doing that. Let me tell you something. Not one being in the entire manifested universe is capable of doing that. Because that which has already occurred is set in the record of the universe. Nothing can change the past, ever. Great movie on this. Watch the new movie, The Time Machine. Not the original 50s version or 60s version. The new one. I think it came out in late 90s or early 2000s. Okay? This movie got crushed in reviews. Crushed. Whenever reviewers crush a movie and give it the worst ratings, go see that film. Because I guarantee you, there's very important allegorical concepts that you need to understand embedded in that film, and that's why the reviewers crush it, because they don't want you getting any ideas, you know? This movie got crushed in the theaters, and I'm telling you, it's one of the best films to understand the concept of the absolute impossibility of changing the past. The past cannot be altered. You know what can be altered? The future. That's what that movie's about. And you know where the alteration of the future begins? In the present moment. That's exactly right. That's the only place it begins. Okay? So what truth is? The demystified concept of truth is it's simply that which already exists. It's that which has happened in the past and is happening in the present moment. The truth does not exist in the future. When we get to those future moments and it's the present, truth will be existent then but not until, okay? So there is no such thing as truth in the future. Truth is that which has occurred in the past and that which is occurring in the present. It is simply that which is and that which has been. 
please recognize when I use the word truth, that is all I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the mind of God. I'm not talking about the entire reason for the existence of the universe. I'm talking about the events that have taken place in the past and are taking place in the present. That's all. And guess what? That's all the truth is. It doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. Okay? You want to make it more complicated than that, call it something other than truth so as not to confuse people to what truth really is. Truth versus human perception. Okay? Now, I want to ask people to imagine, see these white lines? Imagine these white lines that do not waver as truth. And imagine that the perception that is set against the truth, we're going to take three different individuals. This is individual A, this is individual B, this is individual C. Okay? Their ability to perceive what has occurred and what is occurring is what I would refer to as consciousness. Okay? Consciousness is a being's ability to recognize patterns and meaning with respect to those patterns. Meaning you have an accurate understanding of what's taking place within and around you, or you have an inaccurate understanding of what's taking place in and around you. If your consciousness is high, meaning it's at a high frequency, okay, that means you're going to have more of an ability to understand and recognize the patterns. If your consciousness is low, you're at a low frequency, you're going to see the pattern less. You're not going to accurately perceive. So I liken this to a waveform. In simple, you know, physics, a wave, this is a simple sine wave, okay? It has its crest here and its trough here, okay? And then the pattern repeats, goes up to the crest, down to the trough, and, and, and it repeats over again. The distance between the uh, either crests or troughs of the wave is called the wavelength, okay? The longer the wavelength, the shorter the frequency. What that means is how frequently is it going to be intercepting the line that represents truth? How frequently is it going to be aligned with this line? which we are calling truth, okay? Now, can everybody just, with that love, with that explanation, understand this simple model and what I'm talking about here? Is that clear? Okay, because it's important. Because this is a low-frequency vibration. It's a low-frequency wave. A wave like this, if it was an audio wave, would produce a low frequency, it would produce a low bass tone, Okay? As we go up to a higher frequency, you can see the wavelength is shorter, meaning that it intercepts the line which represents truth much more frequently. We can count them. One, two, three, four, five here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine there. Okay? So this is a higher frequency vibration. And we go up to an even higher frequency. Let's say person C has this consciousness. They have a higher frequency. Okay? and they're intercepting the, the uh, line that represents truth much more frequency. I won't count those out because there's a lot of them, okay? The higher the frequency, the more in tune with truth we are. What would happen if this frequency became infinitely high? What would it become? It would be indistinguishable from a line. And therefore, someone would be aligned to that which is. The higher the level of consciousness or frequency, which is their perception of reality being accurate, okay? Not wavering as much from the truth because it's hitting it in more places. We would, we would basically, this wave would turn into a line at some point, the higher the frequency went. Think about this in sound, right? You hear a low bass tone, it's like, then it goes up, and it would go eventually outside the range of human hearing because the frequency went so high. Same concept here. The higher the, the, the higher the, um, frequency, the higher the perception of reality, the quality of the perception is going to be. Okay? The concept to keep in mind here is perception is not reality. It's the filter we see reality through. What the human being's work is to do is to align their perception to the reality which exists, which is truth. We need to set aside what we want the truth to be and look at what it is. What it is is altogether different than what we want it to be. 
But until we recognize what it is, we're, we're not even in a position to make an accurate diagnosis of what's going on and therefore create what we want it to be. So I'm going to give the first quote here. It comes from a gentleman I, I personally greatly respect. How many people are familiar with Travis Walton by a show of hands? Hardly anybody in the room. Wow, two people. Amazing. And I know Barb is in the back because we've met him personally. I spoke with this gentleman at a conference last year in 2012. And I just want to say, I just think he's a totally genuine individual. I don't care what anybody thinks of me saying that. Okay? I believe him. Do I know factually that what he claims happened to him did? No, I do not. But I believe what he is saying for a reason. When I am around somebody, especially for any length of time, I think I can, my intuition is good that I can get a feel for their heart. Okay? And when he's telling you stuff, it's very consistent. And in his book, he asks people, you need to listen to my whole story, suspend your disbelief for a minute, and then do your research and then make a judgment call. Do you want to believe me? Do you think I'm telling you the truth? Do you think I'm lying to you? And then make up your own mind. Okay? And what, what Tra who Travis Walton is, he was, uh, claims that he was a, an abductee, that he was taken uh, on board uh, an extraterrestrial craft at a, a point in his life. He disappeared for days. They were out looking for him, and his best friends were accused of murdering him. And he shows up five days later in, like, deplorable conditions, uh, you know, out on a country road someplace. Um, but anyway, again, I spoke with him back in 2012. I just bumped into him again. We were just at a conference. I'm bringing this up for a reason. We were just at a conference in Philadelphia where he spoke. And uh, this quote, I feel I, I would start, if I was going to quote somebody, I was going to make this like the first quote in the presentation today. Travis Walton says in his, in his book, which is called Fire in the Sky, he said, I have come to realize that the biggest problem anywhere in the world, the biggest problem anywhere in the world is that people's perceptions of reality are compulsively filtered through the screening mesh of what they want and do not want to be true. Now, when I read that in his book, I got chills up and down my spine because I said this meshes exactly with what I'm talking about in my section, in my presentation called Truth Versus Perception. And he's encapsulating it in a sentence perfectly. All right? We want things to be true. That doesn't make it so. That's not what makes truth the way that it is. What makes truth is the way that it is, is what behaviors were taken and what is the actual effect in the manifested world. That's how things are. Okay? It doesn't matter how we want them to be. They may be a completely different way right now than we want them to be. And I would say for the people in this room, they are a completely different way than we want them to be. But most people in the world think they, they kind of believe that they're the arbiter of truth. And that's a bad place to be in. That's a very, very low level of consciousness. To think that if I don't believe that it's this way, it's not this way. Many people are trapped in that state of mind. Okay? Now, the reason I even bring this up and included uh, Travis's quote here is at this conference that we were just at a couple of weeks ago, Okay, I didn't speak at it, I tabled at it. Um, a woman came up to my table and she picked up my New Age Bullshit DVD, which is available here today in the back. And she said, what's this about? With a real skeptical look. And I, said, I explained, I said, well, it's a seven hour extended pod, po video podcast that uh, has many, many slides, okay? I, I gave a shortened version of it at the Free Your Mind conference in Philadelphia. And this is the extended version that goes deeply into the deception of the New Age movement and how it is a religion that is designed to suppress the masculine side of the personality, which is the side that actually takes action and creates change. Okay, And that's, of course, pushed by the sacred feminine, which is care and creativity or, and compassion. Right, Both need to be present. We're going to talk about that here today. But I said, this is about the suppression of that masculine energy. And that's what the New Age movement is about, the suppression of the masculine. Right. So 
I, I said, what the New Age religion wants to teach people is just accept everything the way it is, no matter how unjust it is, no matter how deplorable the conditions are, no matter how much evil, evil is taking place in our midst, accept it. That's the New Age religion. And here's what she said. Here's what she said. That's exactly how I am. I just accept everything. I don't make any judgments on anything that occurs, no matter what it is, no matter how it's perceived. You want to perceive it as evil? That's your judgment. I said, yes, it is my judgment. You know why? Because it's evil. It really is. There is such a thing. I said, and you're content to let evil run amok and take this whole world because you don't want to act. Because what's really there is cowardice. That's what it really is. Okay? And she didn't want to hear that. She said, I prefer not to see it that way. Now, align this with the quote. I prefer not to see it that way. Okay? And I hope by some miracle she happens to see this presentation at some point. Okay? And, you know, in hindsight, I didn't say this to her on the spot, but I thought about it for a little bit the next day. And what I should have really said is, no, you prefer not to see, period. That's the truth. Okay? So, I prefer not to see it that way means, no, I want to ignore reality. I want to believe what I want to be true is the way that it already is. And this is what the New Age hoax is peddling to people. Okay? So, great quote that I thought accurately sums it all up. See, she, this woman also told me that she is a follower, quote unquote, of the uh, New Age ideology that is referred to as the Course in Miracles. How many people have even heard of this? A lot of people, okay? You know what that is? It's called solipsism, wrapped in a nice, neat new package. Solipsism. How many people are familiar with the ideology called solipsism? Good. More than I would have thought. Most people have never heard of this, okay? Solipsism is a completely egoic and destructive ideology that has absolutely no bearing or resemblance to truth in any way. And the people who are solipsists are mentally ill. I'm not even going to provide any evidence of that. I'm telling you, you need to research this religion and sickness for yourself. It's a mental illness. A solipsist is a mentally ill person who should probably be somehow removed, segregated from society, and institutionalized until they are made well because they are a destructive influence on society. This is what I focused on on podcast number one of my podcast series and radio shows. I went into the ideology of what solipsism is and how destructive it is and how it's a religion, okay? What this is, well, first of all, let's look at the word. And you'll, you'll notice I'll be breaking down words all day long because if you don't understand where words came from, you don't really understand what they really were intended to mean. Regardless of whatever connotation they may have taken on in the modern world, the intended meaning of the word, the original meaning, is derived from its etymological derivation. You need to go into the ancient languages, Latin and Greek roots and other languages, Germanic, Arabic, etc., and you need to break down the words from their etymological origins. Then you will understand their real meaning. And I'm telling you, you do this, and the top of your head will blow off by what you will find, by what words we speak on a daily basis actually mean, and we have no idea what they mean. Okay, so the word solipsism comes from the Latin adjective solus, which means alone or one. And then the Latin pronoun ipse, which means self, myself, etc. Okay, the ideology of solipsism is that nothing exists outside of me. I'm the only being that exists in creation. Or essentially it's another way of saying I'm God. Okay, that my perception is the only real perception, and no one else is here. Now imagine that. Now, what I'm, tell what I'm essentially telling the audience here today is your perceptions are not the truth. 
You have to work to align your perceptions with the truth. That's damaging enough to the human ego, okay? If I just said, none of you exist, I'm only perceiving your existence, I'm the only one who exists, imagine how egoic that statement is, and actually how demoralizing it is to other people, you're even telling them, I don't even consider that you exist. That's what a solipsist is. They believe the universe is a big illusion created for somehow for their amusement, and that there's no objective reality that you don't exist, you don't exist, you don't exist, you don't exist. I'm the only one who exists. And that's not mental illness. We don't diagnose that as mental illness, okay? I, I don't care if you want to accept the notion everything is one. I personally accept that notion. I do accept that we are all one. That doesn't mean you're not existent in the physical domain right now as I'm talking to you. Of course we all exist here. We are in the physical domain, okay? The whole point is these people want to believe the entire spiritual domain a physical domain is such an illusion that nothing that takes place in it matters or has any significance and should just be watched and nothing should be done to change it. And you know, let me explain what this is, folks. When I was a Satanist, okay, and I was working inside the Church of Satan and other dark occult organizations, they have a, they have a set of sins, believe it or not. They don't look at them as sins in the same way that, like, you know, religionists look at sin. But they have the things that, these are behaviors and thought patterns that should not be engaged in by the dark occultist themselves, by the magician, if you will. You are not to engage in these behaviors, but we are to peddle them to other people. We are to get them to engage in these behaviors. Okay? You know what the first one is? No, it's not. That's the, that's the second or third. I think it's the third, if I'm not mistaken. I don't have the list handy. But the first one is stupidity. That's the first satanic sin. Okay? For the dark occultist. But they want other people in deep stupidity. They want other people in deep ignorance. The idea here is we will know it all. We will know the truth so that we can control others and keep them a dumbed down herd, okay? There's a bunch of other ones, but I think the second or third is solipsism. Solipsism is one of the biggest sin for, for Satanists and dark Luciferians and dark occultists. They don't, want any, they don't want any of their membership believing in this mental illness nonsense, okay? But they want to pr propagate it and peddle it they want to do that. And they, they told me personally, higher ups in this network told me personally when I was working with them, wait until you see the new age books that we, our membership, will be writing or either writing ourselves or putting into the hands of useful dupes to write and put out there. We'll be giving them the idea. They'll write it for us, put it out there as their own idea. And they said, we are going to propagate and peddle solipsism like you have never seen. And you know what? When they say something, they do it. I'm serious. They're aligned. Their act is together. They act on the same page. And for that, I have respect for them as an enemy. And I don't take anything they do lightly. I recognize they have the will. They're not like the rest of, of humanity. They, they, they align their thoughts, their knowledge, with their version of care, you know. It's not like our emotionally based care, but they care about what they're doing, and then they act. And when they act, they act in concert, and they get it done, okay? I'm not saying, you know, I agree with any of their agenda, because I don't, and I'm trying to stop it. But I have respect for their unity, they are unified and on the same page, and humanity is not. And that's why, in all honesty, we're having our rear ends handed to us in this spiritual battle right now, at least right now. Solipsism is the ideology that only one's mind is sure to exist. Solipsists contend that knowledge of anything that is outside of one's own mind is unsure, and hence there is no such thing as objective truth. Okay, no such thing as objective truth. 
And therefore, nothing about the external world and its workings can actually ever be known. Just think about that statement. It's saying no one can ever know anything. You cannot come to know anything at all. There is no such thing as knowledge. So what I would say to somebody who's following the quote-unquote course in miracles, or a course in solipsism, or a course in acceptance of all forms of evil in this world, is you can't know anything by reading the course in miracles because nothing can be known. You know? How could a solip why would a solipsist ever pick up a book? Why would a solipsist ever watch anything, any video? Why would a solipsist ever engage in a conversation with another human being? You know? Tell a solipsist you can't know that you're going to fall off that cliff, so why don't you go try to walk over it and see what happens? Because you can't be sure of anything. They won't do that, though. You know? The whole point here is this is a religion. This is a New Age religion. And I'm telling you who it's peddled by. It's peddled by the occultists who have the knowledge of how natural law works, and are trying to put out whatever ideologies they can, destructive ideologies they can, to get people not to understand it. Or to even go so far as to believe that nothing can be understood. But why would you bother to look into natural law? Nothing can be known. It's unbelievable that anybody would be so gullible and naive to fall into this mindset. Let me just tell you what it really is. It's a person who has given up on life. They feel that it's so difficult to know anything and they don't want to do the work to come to that level of knowledge that they've just said, I don't believe it can be known. That makes me feel more comfortable in my ignorance and laziness. That's the, re that's the truth about what solipsism is. Okay? And that's the truth about my friend I bumped into at the, at the MUFON conference. And I'd say that to her face. Okay? So, we have to realize we're, we're battling this force. This, and this, this religion is on the rise. Solipsism is on the rise. More people are becoming solipsists or solipsistic in their beliefs, in their, in their thought processes. Let's look at some basic definitions and working definitions. <clears throat> now, first thing we're going to define is definition. Let's define what a definition is, okay? A definition is an exact statement, a statement of the exact meaning of a word, all right? We're looking for an exact meaning, not a connotation, not a maybe or a like or a somewhat. We're looking to narrow the focus. That's why it definites it. It makes it finite. We're taking it not infinite. We're finiting it. We're making it finite, okay? We're, we're, we're actually limiting through words, what something means so we can be clearer about what we're saying, okay? It's an exact statement or description of the nature, scope, or meaning of something. Another way we could look at a definition when we're talking about visual or audio, audio definition is it's the de degree of distinctness or clarity of an object, image, or sound, okay? So why do people buy HD? TV sets, they want higher definition. They want a higher clarity of the picture, okay? If you have high definition audio, for audio files, they won't accept anything but high definition audio because in comparison to low def audio, the clarity of the sound is very good. It's much better, okay? So that's what definition is. It is all related to clarity. When we use it in conjunction with words, it means the clarity of the meaning is amplified. Okay? And when it's with a picture, the clarity of our vision, of the ability to see what the picture is, what the information in the picture is amplified. And same thing with sound. The more accurate the definitions that we have for words or concepts, the better our clarity of meaning and therefore our understanding of those concepts, words or concepts will be. So definition simply means clarity of meaning when we're applying it to words and concepts. So therefore, let's define natural law. So this is what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the day. We have to define it. <clears throat> the simple definition of natural is inherent, 
having a basis in nature, reality, and truth, not made or caused by humankind. So if it's natural, it wasn't made by man. Mankind didn't make it. Okay? And again, the origin of the word, neter in Egyptian, means spirit, and all means of or related to. So of or related to spirit. It is all of nature, the spiritual domain. See, this is the other part. People believe that the spiritual domain is separate from the physical domain. This is a huge thread and a huge central focus in all of my work. If you think the spiritual domain is not where you are at now because you're in the physical domain, you're mistaken. If you think that the spiritual domain is someplace other than the physical domain, you're also mistaken. If you place emphasis on one above the other, and say, well, this one takes precedence, and this one's not important. Either way you do it, whether you say the spiritual is more important and the world of matter should not be given any significance, it's imbalanced, and it's not true, okay? Or if you say, hey, like scientism does in many, you know, left brain scientism, the, the material world is all that there is. This is just a dead mechanized clockwork called the universe, and it happened by accident for no reason. You know, and this, there's no such thing as the spirit you know, spiritual domain. Both of these worldviews, and we're going to get to a breakdown of these worldviews, they're completely inaccurate, they're not based in truth, and most of all, they're based on brain imbalance. And we're going to see how one of these worldviews or another develops when either the left brain hemisphere or the right brain hemisphere has taken precedence and dominance within the individual consciousness. So natural means spiritual. The, these words could be used interchangeably. So when I'm talking about natural law, I mean spiritual law, unseen spiritual laws. But overall, the dictionary definition of natural is it's inherent to nature and it's not made by man. The word law is, the definition is an existing condition which is both binding and immutable. So let's look at each one of these words. Existing, it means that it is present. It is present, okay? It cannot be just ignored and expected that, well, that doesn't make it true and it's, it's not going to have an effect. It's there. It's present. That's why it's a law that it's in operation, that is in operation. It is binding. Binding means it has an effect. It means it doesn't matter whether you believe that it has an effect. It doesn't matter whether you understand that it has an effect. It doesn't care. And this is another big hammer to the ego. The human ego wants to hear what it wants to hear. One of the things it wants to hear is, the universe cares about you, personally. It cares about John, it cares about Bob, it cares about Mary, it cares about Elizabeth, whatever, okay? It cares about you individually, as a being. Now, you could go so far as to say you believe that the creator of the universe cares about you. I'm not, I'm not denying anybody or saying don't th think that. What I'm saying is that the laws of the universe don't care about you. Laws have been created in this realm that work flawlessly, 100% of the time, flawlessly. Let me, let me ask people to envision this scenario to try to clarify this. A couple are on a picnic. They're out in a state forest or something like that. They're on a picnic. About... 50 yards away from where they're at, okay, there's a pretty tall cliff, maybe about 200 feet, okay, and it ends in some jagged rocks. They brought their two-year-old child on the picnic with them. They un unfold the blanket, take out the picnic basket, they're having their picnic. Maybe uh, passions got heated and the husband and wife were, you know, making out a little bit. Their, their kid, two-year-old daughter in her nice Sunday, sundress or whatever, wanders off, gets to the edge of that cliff. Will gravity care if that girl goes over the edge? Will gravity allow her to go over the edge? That, yes, it will. Gravity is not going to say, this girl doesn't understand this law, and she'll die if she goes over that edge. She's innocent. She's nescient, even. Not even ignorant. Innocent, and nescient, will that law still have an effect? You damn better well believe it will. And so does natural law in the same way. It doesn't care whether you don't know 
doesn't care whether you're nescient or ignorant. It's in effect, it's binding, and it is immutable. Immutable means that nothing you can ever do can ever change it. It is in effect eternally. Because man didn't put it into effect. You know who put it into effect? The creator of the universe put it into effect. And I don't really care what you think of that force as. You could think of it as an impersonal force. You could think of it as the man with the beard. You could think of it as this remote control. I don't really care what you think of it as. Personally, that's none of my business. But you know what? If you think of it that it's man that makes the laws, then I have a problem. Because man doesn't make these laws I'm talking about. The creator of the universe set these laws into motion. Put them into effect, and they bind you. You and I are bound by these laws, whether we like it or not, whether we accept it or not, whether we understand it or not. They're in effect, and you are already creating the reality that we are experiencing based upon interaction with these unseen laws. Already. You're already doing it. You can never not be doing it. That's an impossibility. Okay? You're always creating, co-creating in harmony, I'm sorry, in cooperation, I should say, whether it's in harmony or opposition is a different story, in cooperation with these spiritual laws that I'm going to talk about. You are already creating in cooperation with them and can never not do so as long as you exist in the physical domain. Okay? So that's what the simple definitions that we're working forward with. Natural law doesn't mean anything other than this. That's it. It means, so let's put them together. Inherent, existing conditions. Conditions that exist in nature which are both binding and immutable. They have an effect whether they're understood or not, and they cannot be changed. So what would be our requirement of knowledge here? What do you think should be done? If we are always working with these, do you think we're going to create something that is wise to create? that is good, that is in alignment with what we say we want if we don't know how these laws operate? You know what's going to be created? A mess. Total chaos. Something you don't want. Something that leads to enormous suffering. Which is where we're at. If, on the other hand, you have that knowledge of how these things work, then you align your behavior to them, you're going to create a whole new different ball game. And then you're going to not have self-inflicted suffering. Okay? That's what this is all about. So let's give a working definition. This is what I call the sound bite. Right? People say, well, tell me what natural law is, Mark. Uh, you, you have a few days? Maybe a, 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 a large portion of the day like we're going to cover today. Maybe. Some people will get it. Okay? But uh, really, you need to devote a large amount of time to studying this, understanding it, reading about it, and even experimenting with it. These are, this is not an untestable hypothesis, okay? And it's not a hypothesis, it's actually a law. But it's not untestable. You can test it. You can apply all the scientific methodologies to natural law. Same thing. Gather your information, observe, hypothesize, hypothesize, observe, test the results, publish the results. That's scientific methodology. The scientific methodology will be borne out for everything I'm talking about in this presentation if it is applied. Because this is not a religion. This is not some new age mumbo jumbo. This is a science. It is a science that constitutes knowledge of how laws that are existent, in operation, and immutable in this universe work and how we are creating what we experience in conjunction with these op operating laws. And man didn't put them into effect. Whatever created this universe put them into effect. I'm not here today to tell you what that is. Your, your job in, in your own personal experience is to get in touch with what you feel that is. I'm not here to tell you what that is. Now, I'm not here to tell anybody what that is. But my whole point is it created these laws and they're in effect. And if you want to stop suffering, and if you want the human condition to change, you have to understand how these laws work. There is no way around that. Knowledge of these laws is required. And this is what people in the 
so-called New Age movement and in religious communities and in other communities don't want to acknowledge. They don't want to uh, acknowledge that work is required. So let's give a working definition for natural law, my soundbite variant, okay? I tell people who want the 6 o'clock news edition of what natural law is, okay? Natural law is universal, non-man-made, binding, and immutable conditions that govern the consequences of behavior, and specifically, at least on this planet, human behavior. I would say in the universe, it governs the behavior of all intelligent beings. Intelligent beings, okay? Natural law is a body of universal spiritual laws which act as the governing dynamics of consciousness. The governing dynamics of consciousness. That's the working definition. Let's look at the dynamics between discovery and belief. The difference between discovery and belief. Because again, natural law is capable of being discovered, understood, and harmonized with. Now, does that sound like a religion? Religion asks people to believe, accept, and do without question. What this is, is saying, this exists, you're bound by it, the best you can do is to understand its operation like you would understand gravity and therefore not just walk toward the edge of a 200 foot cliff that is bottomed, bottomed by jagged rocks. If you're intelligent and you understand how the law of gravity works, you won't do that behavior. Okay? Just like if you're intelligent and you understand how natural law works, you won't do certain behaviors to create a prison for the entire species, for your entire species. Unfortunately, humanity has not reached that level of consciousness yet. They are not at that level of co-creative intelligence to understand how these laws work and then align their behaviors to them. So natural law has nothing to do with religion. It's not a belief system. It's a science. It is a discoverable operation that is already in effect that we can either understand and align our behavior to or remain ignorant of and suffer as a result of that ignorance because it's already in effect and already has, an, has a binding effect upon you and your behaviors and everyone's. So when it comes to belief, and anybody that was trying to propagate a religion wouldn't put this slide up here. When it comes to natural law, it, is, it works just like gravity. So the clown that's going to jump over the cliff saying, I don't believe in gravity, what's going to happen? Down he goes. Because belief is irrelevant. Because natural law does not care about you. It does not care about you. It is in effect, no matter what you do, deal with it. And people don't want to hear that. And I recognize this. I, I recognize I'm not telling anybody anything they want to hear. If, if I wanted to sell a lot of stuff, if I wanted to be real popular, I'd come up here and I'd tell you exactly what you want to hear, and then I'd be making $50,000 a presentation like Wayne Dyer does. Okay? And that is his fee. I, I know because I've actually had some people speak to his management. That's what, that's what a new age presenter gets. You know what I ask for? Zero. I don't even ask for a stipend. Because I don't want, I don't even care about fake money. I care about making real money. Real one eye. The word money is actually one eye. And people don't even, have said it a billion times in their life and never recognize what they're saying is one eye. And it's the symbol of the one eye which represents spiritual enlightenment is plastered all over the one dollar bill. Okay? Well, this is the one. See, I tell people, I'm a poor man when it comes to the fake money, but I'm very rich in the real stuff. The real thing, I have tons of. The fake stuff, I don't do so well with, and I don't care. It's not what I'm concerned about. I know it's fake. Okay? So I don't ask for a stipend when I present. I, I tell whoever's setting up the presentation, pay for my travel and lodging. Hook me up with a dinner or whatever. That's it. I'll come out and speak anywhere. Okay? The point is, 
If I was trying to appeal to somebody's ego and what they wanted to hear, I would tell you your beliefs are very important. Your beliefs shape, and they, they do shape your reality. In a negative way, if you don't align yourself with truth and you want to stay attached to a belief system because you prefer it over what's real, okay? So when it comes to natural law, I'm not telling people don't believe in yourself. See, people will say, there's forms of belief that are good. Yeah, I acknowledge that. I understand that. Believe in yourself. Believe in your own ability to, to, to come to this understanding of, of information like this. But I'm explaining when it comes to a law that is existent in the universe, your belief doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. The universe doesn't care what those, the, that, those parents at that picnic whose child just went over the cliff believed. It doesn't care whether that girl doesn't know what, how gravity works. It's going to have an effect. You act a certain way like a computer. Boom, you put this in, here's how you program this, that's what has to come out, invariably, invariably. It is nothing personal. Natural law is not a personal force. It is an impersonal force that every single mystery tradition and occult tradition that is actually wanted to share this knowledge with people, has been telling people about and attempting to tell people about since time immemorial. It is an impersonal force. It does not care about you. It does not worry or care in the slightest bit whether you understand it or accept it or not. It is an effect. You are bound by it. the end and stop crying in your milk over it. That's it. No one wants to hear that. And I'm not so naive that I recognize people don't want to hear that, that I don't recognize that. I do recognize that. Believe me, I realize the wall I am up against in saying this. I get it fully, fully. If I wanted to blow smoke up people's rear ends, I'd come up here and I'd say, the universe cares about you and what you believe. And it's going to gauge that. It's going to, it's going to look at all that and it's going to tabulate it. And it's going to say, well, what did he believe when he took this action? doesn't it's not going to say that it's going to say is this what happened yes or no yes here's the result that's it unwaveringly and invariably the human ego has a hard time with that there was a some popular tv show i don't even remember what it was uh barb had downloaded it and she was watching an episode and it said humanity's greatest fear is that truth is absolute. And I, I, I usually don't bother watching any television, okay? I, I, I have downloaded, I download a couple of shows to watch them because I, they're allegories and I want to pick apart the allegory. But I wasn't even watching this one, but I heard it and I, my head snapped around. Whoa! That came through a network television show? How'd that happen? Humanity's greatest fear is that the truth is absolute. The ego has a hard time with the concept of any absolutes. It loves relativism. That's another part of the big trap of where we're at. Relativistic ideas, and especially when it comes to morality. We're going to talk about moral relativism. But the concept here is natural law does not require your belief to be in effect. No more than gravity requires your belief to be in effect. Okay? It need, that needs to be understood. Human belief is completely irrelevant when it comes to the existence and operation of natural law, just as it is irrelevant in relation to any of the other laws of nature, such as gravity, inertia, momentum, thermodynamics, or electromagnetism. Similar, similar to such other phenomena of nature, the workings of natural law require no belief in order for them to be discovered and known. So what I'm saying is, your belief will not change natural law, but your inquiry into it can lead to an understanding of it. You can develop the knowledge of it if you are willing to open your mind and look at how these laws function and what we're getting as a result of our disharmony with them. The philosopher Soren Kierkegaard said that there are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what is not true, 
and the other is to refuse to accept what is true. Okay? So, believing in untrue notions, which is what religion is, all forms of it, all the, the five religions I posted at the beginning of the presentation, organized cultural religion, money, scientism, politics, and the New Age movement. There's the world religions, folks. People think of religion as only the cultural religions. No, there's four other ones. One's called government and authority, okay? Or politics, whatever, however you want to name it. The other one is money, finance. There's another religion. One of them is the New Age movement, and one of them is scientism, which I, I'm not going to refer to as real science because it is not. It is a belief system and a religion. So what Kierkegaard is saying here is you can believe things that aren't true and that will hold you back. And you can refuse to accept what is true and that will also hold you back. I say these are the only two ways that humanity ever creates self-inflicted suffering for itself. You want to know how suffering is created for the human species that it doesn't need to experience? We believe what's not true, we refuse to accept what is true. That's why self-inflicted suffering exists in our species. And if we, if we are to become wise, we need to stop doing both of those things, and then we'll stop creating suffering for ourselves. So let's look at consciousness and the human brain, okay? Because consciousness is an intangible force, okay? It's something that exists, but you can't really see it. Many people even have a hard time explaining what it is. But there is physiological expressions for consciousness in, in the physical domain, and the brain is one of them. And of course, people will say, well, don't leave out the heart. Of course, the heart is also very important. Heart has an even bigger electromagnetic field than the brain, and is tied into the physiology in an even more complex way than the brain is. But we need to understand the basic structure of the brain to understand the types of imbalances that go on within it that lead to these debilitating conditions within humanity that continue to create suffering for us. And also, what these belief systems do is they prevent the activation of the heart and the actions, of care and action. Not only do they prevent knowledge, from real knowledge from manifesting within the being, they prevent care and they create apathy and they, they uh, create um, uh, uh, inaction, laziness. Uh, inaction and um, uh, cowardice so that we don't actually act and take action based upon what we've come to know. So let's look at how the brain and consciousness actually work. People will also try to give ridiculously overcomplicated and mystified definitions of what consciousness means. And many people are even scared of the term, okay? We have to demystify these terms and bring them down to real simple English and real simple concepts that the average person can grasp, okay? And stop trying to make it more complicated than it is. Being conscious of something, meaning having consciousness of it, is an ability of the being to recognize patterns. Remember, this is all about pattern recognition. To recognize patterns and meaning with respect to events that are taking place or have taken place, okay, both within oneself, okay, in the inner realm, in the, the lesser realm, the realm of the individuated consciousness, and in the realm in which the self exists and operates, the macrocosm. So let, let's break it down, right? Ability of a being to recognize patterns and meaning with respect to events taking place within oneself, the microcosm, and in the macrocosmic world, the world at large. And the events taking place is the truth. So it's our ability to accurately perceive truth of what has happened and what is happening. That's consciousness. That's consciousness. And it's, it's made way overly complicated by people. It's mostly made overly complicated in the New Age movement, again, which I, I can't stress enough how big of a deception it is. For people, really have to go and check out my work on the New Age deception, okay? It's on my website, it's uh, in the video section, 
and it's in the podcast section. And it's a seven-hour presentation. But I'm telling you, it will be as worthwhile for you to check out as this seminar. So that's what consciousness is. Now, how does consciousness express? There's a difference between what it is and how it expresses in our life. Consciousness expresses. I ask people, just tell me, what are the ways you could ever make yourself known to any other being? How can any other being come to know who you are in this incarnation, in this physical manifestation? How could they possibly come to know you? How could you manifest yourself or make yourself known to them? And there's only three ways. Thoughts, emotions, and actions. Okay? And I would say speech falls into the line of the, the combination of thoughts and emotions. And speech is also a form of action. I'm using force to, you know, make the air flow over my vocal cords to make sounds come out so that you can hear my vo what the concepts I'm trying to express. So it is a form of action. And it derives from what we have thought up to this point and the emotions that we have, and we could express it through speech. So thought, emotion, and action. Thought you have to look at as the creative force that is the expression for consciousness within the individual. Okay? So it's a neutral force. You don't look at your thoughts as masculine or feminine, do you? But you do look at them as creative forces. In order for anything to manifest in the physical domain, it had to first exist as a thought. This computer, somebody had to envision all the parts, how it works, how it's put together. Okay? This camera equipment, the clothes you're wearing, the, the seats, everything that exists had to first exist in the realm of thought. Had to. By law. Then it comes into physical manifestation through action. Your emotions are a polarized component you could look at it as. It is a feminine, feminine aspect of consciousness. Because... Other people don't feel your emotions. They could perceive or, sen or sense them. You're the one who's feeling the emotions in your physiology. It's an internal expression. You feel emotions inwardly, inside in the physiology. Hence, this is a feminine expression for consciousness. It is something that is not externalized and put out. It is something that is felt within. So the emotions in the mind-body-spirit connection are the spirit spirit in which we do something. Okay, so that's the feminine force or the spirit. Of course, thoughts are within our mind, hence that's the mind uh, component of the consciousness. Then there's a marriage between them. Okay, so you can look at thoughts as the creative essence, which then blends with or marries to the feminine. Now, see, we're getting into a notion that is taught in all many different religious traditions. It's called the Trinity. And I challenge anybody, go and look in any of the trinities that exist, in any of the religions. You can go back to Babylon. You can go to the Indus Valley traditions. You can go to the Egyptian and Kamesian traditions, the Christian traditions. Every single religious tradition that is talked of a trinity, okay, it is always a Father creator, a sacred feminine figure, okay, of some kind that the father then work, uh, impregnates or um, inseminates in some form. And then th from that offspring is born a male child, always, okay? What we're talking about here is the father being the mind, the creative essence then the spirit or the emotions being the sacred feminine essence, okay? Or the Holy Spirit, the emotions. And then the child, the male child, is behavior. It is the active or masculine principle that actually interacts with the physical world to change it. And hence, that is the only way to actually save ourselves. And again, people in religious thinking will immediately attack this and say, you're saying that saving ourselves will not come through faith. Yes, I am. Saving ourselves will only come through action. Action will save humanity. 
Faith will not do it. So sorry to, to again, smash another egoic um, attachment that people have to religious notions. But this is, these religions are created by the control system. Okay? People don't understand that exoteric Christianity is created by the dark occult of the ancient dark occult mystery schools. They don't understand where this religion came from because they haven't studied astrotheology. And I'm not telling you there's no good concepts in any religion. I say take all the good concepts and leave the nonsense. Because one of the nonsense is that you need to believe in something to, to be saved from the current human condition. You don't need to believe in a thing. You need to know the truth. And right in their own religion, there it is. Let, let me just stay on this for a moment. Because in their own scripture, the exoteric Christian scriptures, what is the one prescription that the Christ figure gives to the people when he is asked about freedom? He's only asked about freedom like once in the Gospels. Okay? In the words attributed to his teachings. And they want to know what will save us, what will make us free, and what is his prescription? No, that is not. There's something missing there. You're close. What is, what is the actual saying? Know the truth. Knowing the truth will make you free. That's the prescription, even in exoteric Christianity. It's right there in the Gospels. But Christians don't want to hear that because the controllers in the church who came from the dark priest class gave them this nonsense that all you have to do is believe and everything will magically change. Well, good luck with that. When people's behaviors have no alignment with morality, you think your belief's going to change something? Again, let me know how that works out for you. And again, I'm not mincing words up here. You know, I'm telling it like it really is. I don't care who it offends. So, the expressions for consciousness are thoughts, emotions, and actions which are likened to in the consciousness community of mind, spirit, and body. And it's a trinity. A father creator, which is the thoughts, the mind, the feminine essence, which is the, the mother of the trinity, the emotions, the inward aspects, the spirit. And then they give birth when the thoughts and the emotions come together, they give birth to action in the world, which is the male child. I, this is very important to understand. I hope everybody is clear. This is our internal trinity, which constitutes the expressions for consciousness. Okay? So let's move on. Yes. Okay, how, how, how much time? It is. Okay, we're going to stop right there and take a break. We'll, we, we will resume at 1.15 precisely. Okay, so you want to come in a few minutes early to get settled. I will start again at 1.15 p.m. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, welcome back, everyone. I hope everybody had a really good lunch and is energized for the afternoon session. Um, we're going to have, uh, I'm going to go until about 3.20 p.m., uh, in the first part of this, and we'll take a 10-minute break there, and then we'll start in again about 3.30, and we'll go until 5, and then we'll come to our dinner break. So, let's pick up where we left off. I was talking about brain structure and human behavior, and how these two things are completely interrelated. <clears throat> brain health plays a critical role in human behavior, so it is extremely important for human beings to become familiar with the brain's basic structure and function. Now, <clears throat> I'm not telling you that this is the totality of neuroscience, what I'm going to show you here today. I'm saying that this is the basics. It's the essence of how the brain structure works. So this is part of understanding the physiological uh, aspects of how consciousness works, all right? So there's three main complexes, structures, that comprise the, the total human brain. The first is the R complex or the reptilian brain. So this part of the brain facilitates <clears throat> basic survival functions. It's the part of the brain that goes to work and becomes active when we're in what's called fight or flight mode, okay? 
uh, when survival is at stake. It also controls basic motor functions and, and respiration, okay? The second part of the brain is above the R complex. This is called the limbic system. It's also known as the mammal brain, the mammalian brain. This part of the brain facilitates human emotions and it makes um, human emotion possible to be felt in the physiology. It does this by releasing what's known as neuropeptides into the bloodstream through different, different glands that comprise the, the limbic brain or what's called the midbrain also. So uh, the final part of the brain, the, the highest structure uh, structurally and the newest part of the brain uh, evolutionarily, it's called the neocortex. Now really what this part of the brain is really called is the telencephalon. That's what we traditionally think of as the gray matter of the brain, okay, uh, with the hemispheres, okay. Uh, the neocortex is where all of the actual uh, electrochemical activity that comprises our human modes of thought takes place, and that's in the outer shell of the telencephalon, which is known as the neocortex. So this part of the brain actually facilitates all human functions of thought, what we consider the things in thought that make us a human being and separate us from the animal kingdom. Higher thought functions, logic, um, uh, intuition, creativity, okay? So we'll, we'll break down these parts of the brain and uh, give you some visual understanding of them. So down here, <clears throat> which, sorry. Down here is the reptilian brain. It's comprised of the brain stem right here, and this part of the brain is called the, um, the uh, cerebellum, okay? These two components together essentially comprise the R-complex. So again, the R-complex is the lowest consciousness part of the brain. We don't do any thinking with this part of the brain. It's the reactive part of the brain. It reacts to stimulus. It's the stimulus response mechanism. Now up here, in this middle part of the brain, these are all the different glands like the hypothalamus, the thalamus, the uh, pituitary and pineal glands, etc., that comprise the, the midbrain or the limbic system. All human emotions are facilitated, are made possible by this part of the brain, okay? So um, this part of the brain, if it wasn't working properly, you would not be able to experience a normal range of human emotions. This is part of what psychopathy is. Psychopaths, this part of the brain is not functioning properly, whether it be from a birth disorder or whether it be from um, conditions over one's life that if someone has stayed in chronically has numbed out this part of the brain and it is not, is not functioning properly anymore so the person's not actually experiencing a normal range of emotions. This part of the brain, which again is the telencephalon, this gray uh, matter part with all of the grooves, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> that's the neocortex. The neocortex is the outer casing, basically, of the telencephalon, the higher brain. It's the human brain, okay? Neo means new, so it's the newest part of the brain structure uh, as far as uh, evolutionary development of the human being goes. So this part of the brain facilitates all higher order thinking. Now, if what you have to understand about the, the telencephalon or the hemispheres of the brain is that they're, they're first of all bilaterally symmetrical and they generally control different functions of thought. Now I'm not telling you it's 100%, neuroscience is more complicated than that, okay? But in general, the left part, the left hemisphere of the brain is uh, what governs logic, analytical thought and scientific and mathematical thinking, and also linear thought processes, okay? Physical world tasks and details, being able to break things down and analyze them, all right? So this is taking things apart, breaking them down into smaller components and analyzing the pieces. That's what the left brain does. You could look at it as, you could look at it as a series processor, okay? It has to go into this, part first, then here, and then here, and then we can spit out the output. A linear process, like a series processor, okay? 
the right side of the brain, the right hemisphere, uh, governs or generally facilitates and makes possible human creativity, our emotional makeup, okay, all the emotional dynamics of the human being, holistic thought, being able to see the big picture, big picture thinking, pattern recognition, and then things like compassion, nurturing, care, okay, um, ethics to a large extent. And I don't say ethical thinking comes from a, a balance between the two, as we're going to get into. Now, if this left part of the brain here becomes chronically dominant, the masculine part of the brain, and again, I'm putting these symbols here. This is an ancient uh, archetypal symbol called the blade. It's a simple upward-pointing triangle. And this downward-pointing triangle is an, another ancient archetypal symbol that is, was referred to in the ancient world as the chalice, the cup, etc. Okay? And you know, this was a rudimentary phallic symbol, and this was a rudimentary womb symbol representing the male and the female, or the masculine and feminine, more accurately, components of the consciousness. The idea is to keep a balance between these two. When we have a balance between the two, that's when we're operating on all cylinders, so to speak. That's when real consciousness and pattern recognition is developed. And that's when real morality and ethical considerations are also created within the personality, within the being. If this part of the brain is chronically dominant, the left part of the brain, okay, what happens is the, the right side of the brain is, is imbalanced. It's not really functioning uh, at a higher level, okay? And the, the limbic brain will actually suffer that effect, okay? It will also start to shut down. So you will have a lot of left brain patterns going on and a lot of left brain processing going on. But if that's all that's happening and we're not using this part of the brain it, it, equally, the R complex of the brain is what essential um, executive functions are going to be routed to. We're going to be living from the R complex in a kind of stimulus response only mode instead of living from a holistic uh, brain balanced mode, uh, which, which is when, when we're in that balanced state, the neocortex, which governs higher order thinking and makes higher order thinking and ethical thinking possible, is what rules the personality, okay? Now, conversely, if the right side of the brain is chronically dominant, so let's put it this way. The left side of the brain being chronically dominant, you have the controller. That's the, ma that's the master mentality. The, the right side of the brain being chronically dominant, that's the slave mentality. That's the I won't stand up for myself and I'll just accept everything the total new ager, in other words, okay? So this part of the brain, if it's chronically dominant, the opposite happens with the structures of the brain. The R complex will shut down. It will suffer, okay? It will not work properly, which the R complex is necessary. It makes you stand up for yourself when you're under attack. Again, it's the fight-flight response. In a dangerous situation, you've got to know whether you're going to fight whatever's attacking you or whether you're going to get out of dodge and run away. Okay, that's a survival mechanism that's necessary when there's danger. So uh, when this part of the brain is chronically imbalanced, the R complex gets shut down. People freeze essentially, and they don't stand up for themselves and take action. What they're being, what's happening is they're being ruled by their emotions. And again, the the limbic brain governs all emotions, positive and negative. So that's compassion and that's fear. It's any possible human emotion. The, the, the midbrain is what's ultimately facilitating that emotion in the physiology, all right? So if this part of the brain is chronically dominant, the opposite happens. You go into slave think, you shut down, you freeze, you're ru ruled by the emotions, and you don't stand up for yourself. So the neocortex of the brain has two hemispheres. The left brain largely facilitates logic and scientific thought, while the right brain hemisphere largely facilitates creativity and compassion. When both hemispheres are in balance, the neocortex acts in its proper role as the executive command center of the whole human brain. And that's when true intelligence is born. Now, true intelligence is a concept that I think more people really have to understand. People have equated intelligence with intellect, especially in the Western society, all right? Intellect is not intelligence. Let me say that again. Intellect is not intelligence. Intelligence comprises more than intellect. Intellect is left brain understanding. 
True intelligence is holistic understanding with the right brain included in the process, the nurturing, compassionate, creative, and intuitive sides of the consciousness together with the intellectual aspect of the consciousness. And you can see this in the word. Intelligence, right? Intella is where intellect comes from, okay? And gens, G-E-N-C-E, comes from the Latin verb genere. Genere means to generate or to create. So it's the creative aspect of the personality or the right brain. So intellect plus creativity, logical thinking plus nurturing and compassion, that's real intelligence, holistic intelligence. And most people in our society are not in holistic intelligence. They're in one form of brain imbalance or the other. So let's look at how this manifests. If a human brain's left brain hemisphere becomes chronically dominant, the R complex will take over executive function of the brain and the person will become ruled by selfishness and base desires. And they will develop a personality that is based in domination and control. Conversely, if a human being's right brain hemisphere becomes chronically dominant, the limbic system will take over executive function of the whole brain, and the person will become ruled by their own emotions and develop a personality that is based in submissiveness and naivete. Okay? The, the slave think mentality. The schism of the individual. Okay? Now, this is critical. Because this is not only a schism within the, the individual consciousness, it's a schism of worldview, of the way we view ourselves in the world and the way we view our relationship to others in the world. So I call this the mental schism. And it highlights basically what will happen, what kinds of thinking will, will manifest when certain types of brain imbalance are present. So, when we're in this schism, and again, most of humanity is, if we're, too, we're overly intellectualizing everything, and we're too much in the masculine hemisphere of the brain, okay, we're not using the right or intuitive capacities of the brain, the right uh, brain hemisphere. What this can lead to in the world is, again, rigid skepticism. Now, what did we say about that? It's not conducive to learning. People aren't really going to learn when they're rigidly skeptical. This is a hallmark of scientism. Scientismists, I don't know what other thing to call it, uh, worshippers of the altar of scientism, okay? They are, they have this rigid skepticism because they're purely intellectual. They're not really intelligent. The, the creative aspect is missing from their personality makeup, okay? Um, atheism is a hallmark of overly dominant left brain thinking because that, you know, shuns all aspects of spiritual reality. There is no spirit. The universe is a grand cosmic accident. You know, from there you get things like solipsism. People will say, well, isn't solipsism purely left brain? No. It is right, it is right brain. I'm sorry. Isn't, is it purely right brain? And I say, no, it is left brain imbalance as well. Solipsism can be generated from both forms of imbalance of believing nothing can actually be known. There is no truth. The, you know, truth is a dirty word to many left brain individuals. You'll note, you'll note, you know? So solipsism plays into left brain imbalance as well. All of these states here inevitably lead to these things down here. Moral relativ relativism comes next. The idea that there's no such thing as the difference between right and wrong, that we just get to make those things up. They don't exist inherently in nature, you know. We just can decide on what's right and what's wrong for ourselves and make it up, you know, randomly. So very, very dangerous ideology, which we're going to be talking about a lot. Social Darwinism inevitably comes after that, all right. Th this is the idea that a certain class of society can get to direct how the lives of everybody else will go uh, because they're the intelligentsia, so-called. Okay, where the intellectual people really is what the, what it is, uh, the over intellectualizing, and um, will direct society because we're the fittest. Like Darwinism postulates the survival of the fittest, well, social Darwinism postulates the survival of the most socially ruthless, and many people believe that's the natural order. 
They believe that's the natural order and nothing could be farther from the truth. What that is, is it's the psychopathic chaos. It has nothing to do with nature and it has nothing to do with order. It's the exact opposite. So this state, and, and these are hallmarks of dark occultism as well. Okay, I think I should know a thing or two about it as I was a priest in it for almost 10 years. I might know a couple of things about Satanism. Okay, so moral relativism is one of the big tenets of Satanism. It's actually one of the pillars of Satanism. Social Darwinism is highly praised and valued in Satanism and eugenics. Okay, because it's, if people don't understand what eugenics is, eugenics is basically people, you know, who have gone so deep into this form of left brain imbalance that they believe they're God and they can get to decide who lives and who dies. That's really what it is. We will control who breeds and who does not get to breed, who gets to live and who does not get to live. All right? That's essentially eugenics in a nutshell. And again, these are all authoritarianism, forms of authoritarianism. Okay? Um, and it's the idea that man is the author. Man is the creator. Man is the God. Man will make the law. Man will decide, who, you know, life and death at any given moment. We will decide what's right and wrong, etc. That's, that's essentially what all of these forms of thought are. Extreme left-brained imbalance. And I was there. I was in this state in my life. I was in it for years. For years. All right? Um, let's look at the other form of imbalance. Uh, if the right side of the brain is chronically dominant, this leads to, you know, similar kind of imbalance, but in the exact opposite form. The brain is still completely imbalanced, therefore the person's not in a high state of consciousness. They're completely unconscious to what's really going on within them and around them. But the manifestation is generally the opposite of the left brain forms of imbalance. So if you're in real right brain imbalanced state of consciousness, this will lead to naivete believing anything you're told, accepting things from quote-unquote official channels and official sources without actually checking into them for yourself. Blind belief. You'll believe the, ne the next uh, religion that comes along. You know, We just have to tell them what they want to hear, and oh, I'll believe that. You know? So you know, New Agers are basically in this category, naivete and blind belief. People who trust government, of course, are in that category, because again, it's about creating the masters and the slaves. That's, that's what brain imbalance is for. And th that's why the controllers want to propagate this imbalance and, and keep it in place. Again, religious extremism, that's hallmarks of right brain belief, right brain imbalance. Solipsism, no such thing as truth, you know, all from right brain imbalance as well. Feelings of unworthiness, self-loathing, accepting orders from other people, being an order follower. We're going to have a whole section on order followers later, and how this is the exact opposite of anything virtuous. For people that believe order following is some kind of a virtue, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you, but it's, it's the thing that leads to all evil in the world, is accepting somebody's orders and not actually gauging for yourself whether the activity, the, the behavior is moral or not. Okay? And it, it, it creates a willing slave. This, this form of imbalance is ultimately generating a willing slave, whereas this form of imbalance is ultimately generating a psychopathic master. And they're all forms of mind control. It's just, it's just another aspect of how mind control works. The, the propagators of mind control are just doing this to keep that imbalance present in one form or another. They don't even care which it is. As long as they have some that are imbalanced toward one direction and some imbalanced toward the other direction, that's how the dynamic plays off against itself. And you have a world that is continue to be kept under lockdown. So let's look at the worldview schism that goes hand in hand with the brain schism or the mental schism. And th again, this is worldview is exactly what it says. How do you view the world? How do you view yourself in it? How do you view others in it? Well, when there's chronic left brain dominance, the worldview that emerges is one of randomness. And again, this is a hallmark of scientism. The world is this grand cosmic accident. All right, the u whole universe is a grand accent. There's no purpose, right? It, there's no creator. Everything just ma magically manifested on its own for no reason from a single, a single singularity, a single point in space time for no reason. You give me that one, and I'll tell you what ha everything else that happened after that. But you got to give me that one, you know. 
and I have some bridges to sell you, you know? So, you know, there's, a, there's no underlying intelligence in nature. Nature is dead. That's what this worldview is about. Nature is dead. It's a dead thing. It's a mechanized machine that is there for no reason, okay? There's no such thing as the spirit at all. No such thing as spiritual dimension. No such thing as natural law, certainly. Because for, for one to accept natural law, well, where does it come from? You know, I, I ask people like whether they accept that natural law exists or that, you know, there's actual objective truth and morality. And like two thirds of people don't believe, don't accept it. They don't believe that it exists. They don't think there is objective reality and objective truth and objective morality. You know, they think it's all relative and we get to make it up. I've actually done a, a psychological, a uh, small psychological profiling or study, you know, uh, just asking people this question at random and collecting results and analyzing them. We're at about two-thirds of people who are moral relativists and believe that truth is relative also, that it's not objective, okay? Now, you ask the same people, do you believe in karma? 88, almost 90% of people believe karma is real and it exists. So I, I, I'm like, I can't believe this. You, you're going to tell me that there's no such thing as a difference, real difference between right and wrong. Human, they're constructs in the human mind is what they think, right? And simultaneously holding in their mind the idea that karma exists. Well, I, I asked them the question, what put karma in place then? You believe it exists. What force created it? What made it? What put it in place? And they have no answer for that. You know, they intuitively believe karma exists, but can't answer where did it come from, because that would involve a creator, and somebody in left brain imbalance can't acknowledge that. You know, so to a left brain imbalanced person, there's no such thing as spiritual or natural law; it doesn't exist. Uh, as a matter of fact, all of existence has no purpose other than to continue its existence. See, survival is the highest aspiration to a left brain imbalanced individual. Right and wrong have no bearing. There's, there's no point in even discussing it, okay? Because right's what's right for me if I'm super left brain imbalanced. Wrong is whatever affects me negatively, okay? It doesn't matter what's actually moral, okay? It's all subjective to a left brain imbalanced individual. And to them, nothing has any purpose. Since it's all a grand cosmic accident, how could there be a purpose for existence? Without a creator, who's going to create the purpose for it, you know? So it has no purpose other than to continue surviving. And again, that's right there is proof they're in the R complex, they're in the base brain. Survival is the highest goal. Survival is the only aspiration. Now, in Satanism, it's about as left brain imbalanced as it gets, folks. You know what their number one law is? Survival. Survival is the highest law, okay? And we hear about this in Darwinism, too. The ultimate purpose of the being is to continue to survive. I would highly debate that. I would highly disagree with that. There, is, there are laws higher than survival, okay? But in Satanism, they simply refer to it as self-preservation. And that means preservation of systems of belief as well. Systems that are serving the self, the egoic self, they must continue to survive. Self-preservation as the highest law. That's, what's, that's the number one tenet of Satanism. And it doesn't matter who you need to step on to do it, who you need to step on to get one up on somebody else. This is extreme left brain imbalance worldview. All of these characteristics in the randomness worldview are hallmarks of scientism, atheism, totalitarianism, and Dark occultism, you could add to that list. You know, whether you refer to it as Satanism, dark Luciferianism, it doesn't make a difference. It's the hallmarks of the dark occult. On the other side, on the right brain imbalanced side of the worldview, there's another worldview called determinism. Okay, determinism is based in right brain imbalance and is defined by, in general, helplessness, religiosity, and the dismissal of free will. This worldview will eventually lead to a society of blind order followers and willing slaves who accept their conditions as their lot in life. So 
hallmarks of deterministic worldview. God controls every event in creation. Nothing happens at random. There is no free will. So, so you can never throw anything a curveball through free will. Every event is preordained. Okay, and re religionists believe in this. See, I, I like to say my presentation is going to piss everybody off, and that's what it should do. Because if, if you're in one of these forms of belief systems, it's, it represents one form of imbalance or another. So people who believe in government and science are in that left brain imbalance. They're going to get pissed off that I'm talking about that form of imbalance. And then the people who are in religion and the New Age movement, they're in that right form of imbalance, so they're going to get pissed off at that. Good. Let them all be pissed off. <laughs> the truth will piss you off, and then it will set you free if you accept it. So... You know, all occurrences are preordained. Free will is an illusion. No, you know who just said this in his latest book? Stephen Hawking, who you would think is the most left brain person that you could think worships at the altar of scientism, believes the universe is a grand accident, okay, and a mechanized machine, okay? He, it's like, it's like this comes full circle. It feeds off of each other like a feedback loop, these forms of imbalance. He went so far through left brain imbalance. He's so in the left brain that he actually developed the hallmark of right brain imbalance, which is that there's no such thing as free will. No such thing. Since it's all a mechanized machine and there's no consciousness, there can actually be no choice. We are actually robots controlled by matter. Hawking believes this. He actually wrote this in his book. He said free will is as dead as God. Okay? And pe millions of people buy this moron's books, and I'll call him a moron right to his face. There's not a drop of intelligence in that man, and people think he's one of the most intelligent people in the world. You might be one of the most overly intellectual people in the world, but you have no wisdom at all. Zero, if that's how you think. And again, put him in front of me, and I'll tell it to him to his face. Okay? Because these pe people actually believe he's smart. That person isn't smart. He's dumb. He's intellectual, but that doesn't make you intelligent. Okay? He has no part of the big picture. None. Just because you can theorize something and, and visualize it and calculate it mathematically does not make you an intelligent person. That means you're great at using the intellect. You're great at mathematics. You're great at linear and logical thinking. That does not make you wise. All right? So... You know, this, uh, to, to continue with the right-brained imbalanced worldview, since God controls everything in creation, nothing is possible to change. Human beings are powerless to create change. Everything is being made to be this way by God. This is what religionists and right brain imbalanced people think. So, therefore, why take any action? Action is ultimately meaningless. A big hallmark of the New Age community, because it's a religion. You know, the Course in Miracles. Oh, we just need to accept everything the way that it is, right, folks? doesn't make a difference if evil is running amok in our midst. No, accept it all. Don't try to change a damn thing. Take no action, just observe. And see how far deeper that gets you into bondage. Because that's the best way to get real deeper into chains. Okay? So these are all hallmarks of religious extremism and what I call simply slave think, because that's what it is. Let's not euphemize anything. Let's call them what it really is. This is master think, that's slave think. And if you want a world that continues to propagate slavery, you'll stay in one of those forms of brain imbalance. And this right brain imbalance, in, in addition to religious extremism and slave think, is the hallmark of the New Age movement and their followers, their religious followers. Now, there's a balance that is struck between these, okay? And that's what everything really is ultimately about, creating a balance. Because there are components to these two worldviews that if they come together, it shows, it shows us what the truth is. And here it is right in the middle here. There is a deterministic component to reality. And there is a random component to reality existing in cooperation with each other, in conjunction with each other. The deterministic component is what I'm talking about here today and referring to under the banner of natural law. That is determined. It is law. It is set. You're not changing it. It works that way flawlessly 100% of the time. 
That's determined. Natural law is determined. Okay? It's the deterministic component to reality. Then there is a randomness component to reality that works continuously in conjunction with natural law. And this is called, this is a little thing called free will. Our ability to choose our behaviors, to do certain things and to not choose to do certain things. And we have it. Every individual has it, no matter what position, no matter what situation they're in. I don't care what institution you're in. I don't care what who you've listened to up to this point. I don't care what background you come from. I don't care what economic class you come from. Every single solitary being that is capable of thinking at all is gifted with free will. You have free will to choose your behaviors, and so does every other human being. Everyone. Okay? It's a gift of creation itself. Okay, we can choose what we will do and not do. Nobody can actually make anybody do something like a robot. Oh, believe me, there's people who are trying. You know? Like Art talked about, Jose Delgado was searching for means to electronically, directly control through chip implants and stimulus through chip implants in the brain, human behavior, like a robot, to put a technology into the brain to control the behavior of the individual. And that went on right here. This is where that took place, folks, right on Yale's campus, okay? Read, read some of his stuff. You want to be disturbed? You think what I'm telling you is somewhat disturbing. Read some of Delgado's material. He was telling people, we're going to show you that free will doesn't exist. We're going to show you there's no such thing as rights, that we make up what rights are. The ruling class makes up what a right or, and a wrong is. We tell you what it is, and you have no choice. And he's telling you, we're going to show you you have no rights, that you're our slaves. Yeah, read some of his material. And an excellent book Art recommended too, uh, uh, Jim Keith, Mass, Con uh, Mass Control, The Engineering of Human Consciousness. If you haven't read that book, get it and read it. And that's just an introduction. And many people think he was murdered over it. You know, so uh, truth lies in the middle of these worldviews. There's a deterministic component called natural law. There's a random component called free will, our ability to choose our behavior freely. So let's look at this debate that's been going on since time immemorial of human nature versus human nurture. And again, I'm getting ready to piss everybody off, okay? Um, this debate's been going on forever. Wh which is it? What's human nature really look like? What's its, what's its essence? Is it angelic or demonic? Okay? I would say it's neither. It's neither one of these things. It's not, it's not both. It's neither. So nobody wins here, you know, who, who falls on one side or the other. And it's a very difficult thing for people to accept as well. Because when we ask the question, what is the nature of a human being? It's a very similar question to asking, what is the nature of this computer up on this platform? What is the nature of that projector? What is the nature of those cameras? Well, is there, can I actually say what a nature what the nature of these things is, it's a computer. Its nature is to compute information. What is the nature of that projector? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it angelic? Is it demonic? Is that projector demonic? No. Its nature is that it projects imagery. What is the nature of these cameras? They capture imagery. That's all. So what's the nature of a human being? The nature of a human being is that it takes in information, it processes it, and then it outputs it through behavior. And as we're going to see, that's very much like a computer. I'm not saying that it is a computer. I'm saying it's like one. Okay? So human nature is neither inherently good nor inherently evil, as many people think fall on one side of this argument or the other. Instead, we should consider the operating conditions or the environment in which human beings exist which influence, influences behavior to a great extent, thus creating the current human condition. That's why it's called the human condition. It's not called, the situation we're in is called the human condition. It's not called the human nature. 
okay? It's called the human condition. There's a reason it's called a condition. For any condition to be in place, well, hey, what condition is my computer in right now? What condition is my projector in? What position is Richard's cameras in? They're in operating conditions. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing because they've been kept up in good condition. Okay, in the example of my computer, it has a working operating system without malware on it. Okay, it has software that does the job, that does what I'm asking it to do properly without bugs. Okay, those are the conditions. The operating conditions will determine how does it perform? What kind of output can it put out into the world? All right. So, again, what I'm saying here is that human beings are like computers, not that they are computers. Let me just state that emphatically. We're not computers, we're like computers, okay? We are programmable. That's the nature of a human being. How many people have ever heard anybody say that the nature of a human being is that a human being is programmable. Uh, to my knowledge, I'm the only person or researcher that is calling that human nature. Our nature is that we can be programmed. And pe there's another thing, that's another thing people don't want to hear. They don't want to hear this because, it, they, again, they liken it to a mechanized machine. And I'm not saying, again, uh, to emphasize, I'm not saying we are computers. I'm saying we're like them in the ways that we can be programmed. So what gets put into a person through the environment, which is called the culture, all right, and becomes their programming, determines what they will output onto the screen, which is called human life. And that will create the human condition in the aggregate as more and more people operate that way. All right, so let's look at how this works. Human beings are programmable much like computers. Like a computer, if a human being has a bad file system format, that's the first thing you do when you're going to get ready to use a computer. You have to format the drive. How many people here are somewhat techy? Not many. Okay, about a quarter to a third. All right. So some people will know what I'm talking about here. For the others, excuse the jargon for a moment. All right, I'll explain what it is. A file system format is you got to format the hard drive so you can prepare it for a specific operating system which is basically the task controllers. It's going to control what happens on the computer, what pro how programs get launched, how memory is used, et cetera, in a nutshell. All right? I, I do this for a living, so you know, I know all the technical stuff. I'll, I'll, so I'll try to keep it simple. So if the human being has a fed, bad file system format, right? this is akin to the operating conditions during a child's formative years the first six years of their life, essentially. Now, think about it. We call this their formative years, their formative years, like a format on a hard drive, because this is what puts the file system into the human being that prepares it for its operating system, okay? So, Largely, what programs the child at this stage is the parents and what they will see in their immediate environment and home and during their very early years in, quote, schooling. All right? Now, if, like a computer, if a human being also has bad, a bad operating system, now this is like Mac OS, Windows, Linux, uh, ex you know, et cetera, uh, Android, iOS, these are operating systems. Again, they are basically providing a platform that other programs will run in, and they're providing a graphical user interface. This is your culture. The operating system is the culture in which the programs run, okay? So let's say if you have a bad operating system, meaning you're already surrounded in a bad environment, in a bad culture, right? That's also going to negatively impact the output. And then they have bad software programs, now, these are the programs that you run. Now, if I didn't have a good presentation uh, software, piece of software, my presentation might come out sloppy. It might crash in the middle of it. It, it might not display the graphics or the text properly. Okay? So you've got to make sure you're working with good, reliable software as well. Now, what the software is, is the belief systems. What the person has taken into the mind 
and is processed and made part of himself. And th now, if all of those things are bad, we have three bad components. The format is bad, the file system format, which is the formative years of the child, okay? The culture is bad, meaning they're already growing up in a bad culture or in a con culture that condones moral relativism, etc., and doesn't understand natural law. And the software programs that have been input into the child are bad, meaning their belief systems, okay? What do you think the output of that, quote, computer is going to be like? Is it going to be good? Is it going to be chaotic? If I screw up my system's hard drive format, if I put an operating system that is like at alpha state and it's not ready for prime time because the development's not finished, it's half-baked, Okay, and then I load crappy software that's full of bugs and the developers didn't really care about programming them correctly. Do you think that computer is going to operate properly and give me the output on the screen I'm looking for or output on the printout I'm looking for or output on the internet that I'm looking for? Good luck. <laughs> if you know a little bit about computers, you're, you're laughing now because it would be ridiculous to assume that it could do that. Well, why do we think that we're going to have that in our environment when all of these things are badly programmed? See, the output onto the screen is also going to be horrible if all those three things, you know, that determine how the, the, the system works are also bad. So it will continue, it will contribute to deteriorating conditions on a mass scale. Like a computer, the behavior of a human being largely depends upon its programming. And its programming is the quality of the information that is being input into it. The quality of the information it's taking in. The quality of the information it's taking in is going to determine the quality of the information it's outputting, like any other computer. So if garbage goes in, surprise, garbage is going to come out. If good information goes in, quality goes in, quality will come out. And the output will be as one wants it to be. It will be able to process and create efficiently, effectively, not chaotically. Here's a very simple diagram. Again, if people understand it, they really get how natural law functions. And again, it's very unpopular. People don't want to look at what the bottom base foundation or platform of this structure is. Because once again, this idea that knowledge is what's required makes very many people upset because they want to believe they're going to achieve these things they say they want without doing the work to acquire that knowledge and therefore understand the requirements for obtaining those conditions. So we start with available information. And for when people look at what I'm going to describe here, they will recognize it as something. Uh, and I'll hold what that is for a moment. Available information is what you're starting with. This constitutes potential knowledge, and it can become knowledge if it's taken in, if it's amassed, if it's aggregated, okay? It can be gathered, it can be processed, it can be understood, and then it can be acted upon. We're you could call this the grammar stage of this three-part process I'm going to explain. Okay? You could also refer to this as the input stage. If we're looking at it in a computer model, this is the stage of inputting information or programming something. Okay? Now the next step that's built upon this is once you've taken information in, necessary information, you then come to a position of understanding it. You know what it means, you recognize the patterns. All right? So this is the second step in this process. Now. The, your understanding or lack of understanding, okay? Now, in the first stage, your knowledge or lack of knowledge is going to lead to understanding or lack of understanding. If you have understanding present, your decision-making processes are going to be in harmony with what you say you want, okay? You're going to understand, if here's what I want, this is what's necessary to get that, to make that happen, to manifest it. That's understanding. It's a decision-making process that happens within the mind. These processes take place in the human mind and are chosen by each individual based upon available information. So again, you can see if information is held back, if it is occulted, or even if it's just people are dissuaded from taking it in because people will say, no, there's nothing there, there's nothing to it. 
right? You could see how they'll never get to this step. They'll never understand. They'll never get to the, the, the second level of creating our reality, all right? Effectively, efficiently. The third stage to this process is what you do with what you have come to understand, to know and understand. So this is the action stage, okay? Each individual's behavior, the behaviors that they choose through their own free will, is based upon the quality of their decision-making processes that are happening within the human mind, okay? That process, as we've already seen, is in return based upon the quality of available information. So this is behavior. See, people don't think of wisdom as behavior. They don't think of wisdom as action. They think of it as something that you just know. No, wrong. Wisdom is not knowledge or understanding. Wisdom is action. Let me say this again. Wisdom is action. It is knowledge and understanding that has been applied. Application. That's the program that you're going to run on the computer that you've put an operating system on and formatted properly. The application is the action. When you're working in a computer doing things, you're working in an application. You're not building the things you're building with the operating system. The operating system's what's supporting the program that allows you to be creative, okay? And in return, the file format supports the operating system. So, we start with available knowledge. That can be converted in uh, available information, which can be converted into knowledge, which can then, through decision-making processes and filtering of that information to eliminate inconsistencies can lead to an understanding. In, in, in uh, continuation, the understanding can then lead through our free will decision-making processes to be converted into behavior, into action in the world. That, when it's done properly, it's wisdom. When it's done with morality and ethics in mind, it's wisdom. When it's done without that, it's folly. Okay, and it leads to more and more chaos. So, b based upon these three processes, something is generated. Something is created in the physical manifestation, physically manifested reality, the real world, so to speak. So, the manifested reality is based upon the aggregate behavior. Aggregate behavior. No one person is creating the reality we are experiencing. Okay? It's another fallacy of the New Age movement and thinking. In the aggregate, we are creating our shared reality. All the behaviors put together creates the output on the screen, or the generated result. Is it orderly? Is it chaotic? Well, that's going to be based upon whether someone took in the information processed it efficiently to come to an understanding, and then acted upon it. The manifested reality is the quality of the condition which manifests in any given society based upon the aggregate quality of human behavior within that society. This is how our reality is actually created. The conditions that we experience as the daily events of our life, it's a simple three-stage process that leads to a result. And for many people here, you will recognize if you've looked into this discovery process and this creative process, is known as the trivium. This is what the trivium is, okay? In the ancient uh, traditions, this is what the trivium was labeled. It was labeled knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. In the later aspects, when they passed out of mystery school tradition hands and went into some other think tank and society hands, the, the knowledge of the trivium was termed grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Grammar being the knowledge stage of aggregating available information, logic being the understanding stage of making a, uh, using uh, processes to analyze and, and filter uh, said information and come to an understanding of it. And then the rhetoric stage was the application, the action, taking action based upon what you've come to understand. Now, there's a third way of looking at the trivium in computer jargon, and that is input, 
processing and output. And then you get the result on the screen, which is called life. All right? Any way you want to look at the trivium, I don't care. But understand it, know how it works. Okay? Because this is why we're a big part of why we're in the situation that we're in is that the trivium methodology of truth discovery has been completely obliterated from public consciousness. Completely obliterated. And I ask people how many people have even ever heard the word trivium. Raise your hand if you've heard, heard the word. So a good portion of the people here have. Many people have never heard the word. And if you do a Google search on it, most people are going to get back the band, the metal band, the trivium, which is not a bad band. But, you know, but the, the whole point here is we'd ra the results that are going to come back through Google or Bing or, or Yahoo or whatever are going to give you a metal band a heavy metal band, instead of the trivium method of learning, the classical liberal arts education methodology. Because they want to try to sanitize that as much from human consumption as possible. They don't even want you to understand how that works at all. And that's why it's been removed from public schooling. And that's why, as long as this society stays the way it is, it'll never be put back into public schooling. You know, I tell people a little anecdote. It, uh, when I was in, when I was in uh, high school, and Thank God I went to the high school I did because they really hammered Latin and Greek into you. You were going to know your Latin and Greek when you came out of my high school, okay? For whatever other indoctrination they put into you, that's a different story. But I'll tell you what, you came out of there knowing your ancient languages. They, they, you know, it was still part of the curriculum when I was in high school. And, uh, you know, again, uh, I, I think I came out better out of there because of simply the linguistics knowledge that I gained from it. And, uh, we read uh, Gaius Julius Caesar's war journals in their original Latin and translated them. And in one of them, he's talking about he's absolutely lambasting one of his um, centurions. Okay, they're on a campaign in Gaul, which is France now. And Caesar is, you know, making his rounds of his troops and they're getting ready to, you know, push deeper into Gaul. And he finds, you know, when, when they would have their encampments, they would have a lot of, uh, you know, slaves of the Roman Empire that they would take with them on their campaigns that would do a lot of the, the lifting of the equipment and the carrying of the equipment for the centurions to do battle in the next battlefield location. And uh, the slaves would have to do all that manual labor. And uh, Caesar says to one of his centurions, he's passing by their encampment, and he sees one of the actual centurion leaders teaching one of the slaves the trivia method. And he flips out on him in this journal. He says, I caught one of my centurions, you know, teaching the trivium, and freaks out on him. How dare you teach a slave our method of learning? Soon they won't want to be a slave anymore. There'd be an uprising if they knew what we knew, if they knew our truth discovery methodology. He said, but I think, I forget how it really ended, but I think how it ended was he told this centurion, if I ever catch you doing this again, I will personally throw you, cast you into the wilderness of Gaul and let the Gaulians deal with you, who knew that the Roman Empire was trying to conquer their people at that point, which is basically saying it would be a death sentence, but I won't even carry it out. I'll let our enemy carry it out on you. That's how much he didn't want their slaves to understand their methodology for learning. And that's the trivium. And that's why most people have never heard the word. So you got to look into it and understand how it works. That's all I can say about it. It is how we build our reality, either efficiently or destructively. So let's look at some of the principles of natural law. Now, in my extended seminar, which goes over a six-week uh, class of of uh, lessons, um, I get into these principles deeply in, in, you know, in an extended form. We're not going to do that today because time doesn't allow. I'm going to briefly touch on each one, okay? The word principles, let's define it. Principle comes from the Latin noun principia. Principia means first, foremost, leading, chief, or most necessary. It is that which matters most it is the first things that must be understood. Before anything else can be understood, principles have to come first. 
And this is the problem. Our society does not put principles first. It puts trivialities first, and we're no longer a society that even cares about principles or first things. So first things first. First things or principles have to come first. So let's look at what the principles that underlie natural law. These are the things that are most important. That's what principles should mean to people. If we ask people to find what a principle is, first thing they should say, that's the most important thing. The most important thing in my life. Now, when in, in the natural law seminar, we did a homework assignment. We asked people what the most important thing was to them. Very few responded with principles. Most people responded with saying that people were the family was the number one response. The familial connection was more important to them than principles. Now, when people hear me say that that's backwards, they'll say, how cold are you? That's so cold, okay? What I'm telling you is that the familial connection, no matter what it is, between a mother and a son, a mother and a daughter, a father and a son, father and a daughter, husband and wife, doesn't matter as much as principles. I'm not telling you they don't matter at all. I'm telling you, you have to put principles first Otherwise, those relationships are just meaningless. They don't really have any real value unless they're based upon principles first, which is why so many relationships are dysfunctional. Principles have to come first before you can even build a solid relationship with another human being. So let's look at what some of the principles of how natural laws work first before we can actually find out what the expressions of these laws are in our lives, which will be the next section. These are what I call the general principles of natural law. Natural law is expressed through seven basic underlying principles, plus what I have referred to as an eighth or hidden principle, which you, t you hear very few other researchers, even people who are studying this from the occult perspective, who are studying this from the consequentialism perspective, you very hear them incorporate the eighth and all-encompassing principle, which I'll, I'll get to last here. This eighth principle, which I call the lost principle, binds all the other seven principles together. All right? These principles together constitute a master key through which universal wisdom, including the knowledge of the requirements to obtaining what we desire, is then unveiled or de-occulted. When, when, when people ask me, well, what do you consider yourself in your performance of, of present, presenting what you present. I tell them, I consider myself a de-occultist. I'm no longer an occultist. I'm a de-occultist. I'm attempting to take this information out of hiding. It's been hidden. The hiding of it is destroying the fabric of our society and putting us into bondage. It needs to come out and be non-hidden needs to be unveiled and shared widely and freely with anybody who's capable of accepting it and comprehending it now. Because we're, in, we're not in a position where we could wait longer. We're, not in a, we're at the precipice, okay? There is a, uh, a moral obligation to bring this information to the public now, okay? So I consider myself a de-occultist one who takes things out of hiding and presents them openly. These are the seven general principles of natural law. Many people who have studied some variants of occultism may recognize these as what are known as the hermetic principles. Hermetic essentially comes from Hermes. Hermes tr Tresmegistus, the, the, the thrice great one, as he was referred to in the ancient uh, Greek mystery traditions. Okay. He was uh, considered a messenger of the gods. He brought the wisdom of the gods down to humanity. Okay, In the ancient Egyptian and Chemetian tradition, traditions, he was the scribe of the gods known as Thoth. All right? He has other incarnations as well. But the hermetic tradition is named such because it's hermetically sealed, like natural law is. Natural law is hermetically sealed. It is binding principles that are immutable. They are laws that are in operation that cannot be changed. Hence, they are hermetically sealed. So, these pr seven general principles, they are mentalism, correspondence, vibration, polarity, rhythm, cause and effect, which is a huge one, which we'll be getting into, and gender. So, I'm going to briefly describe what each of these 
are and what they are about. The principle of mentalism states that the all, everything in creation, is actually a manifestation of mind. The all is mind. Okay? What this means is everything that happens has to be a result of a mental state which preceded it. Everything. For anything to exist, thoughts had to form first, and then they formed the physical reality after. The universe itself is a mental construct of the Creator. Thoughts lead to the manifestation of things and events. Thoughts create conditions. Thoughts create things and conditions. They cannot just magically manifest themselves. Thought comes first. Thoughts create our state of existence and the quality of our experience here on earth, ultimately. Therefore, be responsible for everything. We should be responsible for everything that we create by being responsible for that which we think. Because the thought processes are what are driving the behaviors. People behave the way they do because they have certain belief systems embedded in the mind and running like a program. Their thoughts and their emotions are driving their actions. So the behavior is not magically suddenly going to just change. The thoughts and emotions have to change because they're the driving force behind the behavior. That's when reality will change. See, people don't want to hear that, once again. They don't want to hear, if you want to change reality, you, yourself, have to change the way you think. Because the way you think is not conducive to the requirements for getting what you say you want. They're doing the exact opposite of that in many cases. So that's the principle of mentalism. The principle of correspondence states that that which is above is similar or like to that which is below. So what this means is that which is below uh, and that which is below is like to that which is above. It's a mirror, okay? The above is like the below, the below is like the above, all right? The above in this case is the macrocosm, okay? The, the laws of the very large things, okay? The laws that govern the creation which we consider is seemingly outside of ourselves. We know, we know at the deepest level that it's not, that we're one with it, but, you know, we perceive this as out here, the laws that, that are, govern the, the large aspects of things. So the macrocosm, or the very large, the totality of everything, and the microcosm, which is the very small, or the individuated units that comprise the whole in their aggregate, okay? They are reflections of each other. They cannot be separated from each other. As one goes, the other goes. The universe is actually a holographic system, okay? It's a hologram is an image, okay? You pass a, a, a laser through it, and it then projects a 3D image, okay? It's like a flat image, and it projects a three-dimensional image. But the aspect, why they call it a hollow, like holistic hologram, holistic image, is if you break a hologram into multiple components by cutting it. So if I take a hologram and I cut it in four pieces, you don't have a quarter of the image on one part of the hologram and a quarter on the other and a quarter on the third and a quarter on the fourth. You have four whole images that only lose their resolution by a quarter. Okay? So everything is contained in all the smaller parts. Okay? That's the, like the reality that we're living in. Our universe is a holographic one. So the universe is inside the individual. And the entire universe is like an individual. They're reflections of each other. To know the workings of the individual will help lead us to an understanding of the macrocosmic laws. Similarly, to learn the macrocosmic laws will help us to learn the way that consciousness within the individual functions. These two things cannot be separated from each other. And once again, as I said at the, near the beginning, that's what occulted knowledge is. The knowledge of the occult is how the microcosmic world works, which is the individuated consciousness, and how the macrocosmic world works, which is natural law. So the other part of the principle of correspondence is that our reality is also fractal in nature. Now, if you studied fractals, these are self-similar mathematical generated patterns, 
okay? We see this through things like Fibonacci sequence in, in mathematics, and this is repeated endlessly throughout nature. Okay, so you look at, you look at the um, structure of the atom, and it's similar to the structure of the solar system, which is similar to the structure of the galaxy. They work the same way. They look the same. You pull back enough, you'll keep seeing the same pattern repeat. Everybody ever see the movie that was done in, I think, the 1970s or 80s? It's a short, like, 10-minute clip. It's called Powers of Ten. Has anybody ever seen this? Yes. A couple people. Watch this movie, Powers of Ten, and you'll understand what I'm talking about when I say that the universe is fractal in nature. Brilliant movie. It will blow your mind. Real short, 10 minutes long, something like 9 or 10 minutes long. They, they basically zoom up into the cosmos to show you how everything is self-similar. Then they zoom down into the cells of a human being and into the atoms that, that comprise the hand and, and cells of the hand and show you how everything is similar there, all the way down to the atomic level, okay, and the subatomic level. So uh, the universe is both holographic, meaning that the whole is contained in the parts and vice versa, and it is fractal or self-similar across all scales of its existence. That's the principle of correspondence. The principle of vibration simply states that there is no such thing as rest, as dead or, or non-motion, okay? Death, in that sense, is an illusion because true death would be the cessation of all motion and energy. There is no such thing. It doesn't exist. You cannot go anywhere in creation where something is com at complete rest, okay? And I joke around about this. Barb tells me funny stories when she comes home from, from work and she's trying to, you know, enlighten some of the other RNs that she works with. And she was trying to explain to one of the uh, other nurses, you know, that desk has atoms in it and they're not at rest. They're like in crazy chaotic motion, especially the you know electron clouds of the atom. And if you look at it at a deep enough level, you would see it's like you know chaos going on, and it's all kinds of motion happening, seemingly at random. And the other nurse nurse goes, Barb, you're so crazy. You know, uh, what what I say to that is, how could you have made it to nursing school and not ever have under have even considered the concept of the atom? Right. You know, and it's amazing. You know, she actually thinks the perceived stillness is actual stillness and didn't comprehend. If you zoom into that with a powerful enough microscope, you're going to see all kinds of motion and nothing's at rest. And she thought Barb was the weird one for trying to explain that to her. Okay, so there is no such thing as true rest. It doesn't exist. If, if something's in existence, it's in motion. Everything moves, everything vibrates, and at the most fundamental level, the universe and every single thing which comprises it is ultimately pure vibratory energy that is manifesting itself in different ways, different frequencies, different vib vibratory forms. The universe has no true solidity as such as we imagine solidity at the macrocosmic level. Matter is merely energy in a state of vibration, and what this is if we truly understand this, and many sciences are now finally really understanding this and try, trying to propagate this knowledge out into the public, we will, we will come to the understanding that this is a spiritual construct for experience to be gained, to have a, an experience and learn and grow in consciousness. That's what the purpose of this whole thing is for, you know? So nothing is truly solid. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, again, like we say, we are spirit having a human experience. The whole universe is spiritual, having an experience in solidity, all right? That's how you have to look at the principle of vibration. The principle of polarity states that everything has a dual nature to it. There are polarities in everything that exists, okay? Everything has poles. Everything has its pair of opposites. However, opposites... They, they are identical in nature, but they're different in degree. So let me give you an example of what that means. Are hot and cold really opposites? Or can we simply look at them as the presence of heat energy or the absence of heat energy? Meaning that they're the same thing, energy. And whether it's concentrated in a specific area, which would make it hot, or whether it's absent from a specific area, which would make it cold. Okay? 
That's what hot and cold are at the fundamental level. At our level of perception, they're opposites, but at the fundamental level, they're the same thing, energy or, it's, or lack thereof. Just like those three stages of the trivium. Are knowledge and ignorance the same thing? Yeah, actually they are. Because truth is always present. It's a matter of whether it's, pre whether it's taken in and processed or whether it's refused to be taken in and it's not processed. Okay? So it's, it's just like that. Uh, they're, they're, they're identical in their natures, but they're different in their degree. Okay? Extremes can meet and blend and, you know, play with each other, like as depicted in the yin yang symbol, masculine and feminine. They need to be blended. And at some level of reality, everything that is seemingly contradictory may be reconciled. Now, again, I stress the term at some level. At the unified field level, this, everything is consciousness, pure consciousness. However, at this level, there are differences in consciousness. At this level, there are things that are taking place that we need to understand. At this level, there are things that we need to set right and rectify because it does matter. It does matter, okay? So, again, be careful with some of the new ageisms that get put out there. Yes, do it, can all paradoxes be reconciled? At some level. In this realm, we need to have our feet on the ground in the physical domain. You know, the con this is the concept in the, in the hermetic tradition, which is where a lot of this understanding derived from, out of ancient Egypt, what was known as Chem, the land called Chem, was what the actual... Uh, commissions referred to it as. Uh, the word Egypt is a bastardization of the capital, the Greek pronunciation of the capital city of Chem, which was Memphis at one point. And that city was referred to as Hygeptos in Greek. And that became Egypt in English. But the original name for Egypt was Chem. That's simply called black or dark in their language. It was the, the black land. And we get the word alchemy, which means, again, al from. Okay? It means from the black land, al kemet, which is where alchemy comes from. And that means out of darkness, this knowledge will come and bring light. Because a lot of these mystery tradition teachings do come from chem. And also, the people who took it from chem and started to propagate it in other areas were the, the, um, uh, uh, the Greeks in the Greek mystery traditions. And again, there was light sides and dark sides to all these mystery traditions, okay? There were some who used the knowledge wisely and tried to propagate it and tried to elevate human consciousness, and there were those who wanted to use it selfishly for their own benefit and to control others. So uh, my point was uh, that um, in, the, uh, in the Egyptian mystery tradition, um, they... Um, uh, I, I lost my train of thought there, I'm sorry. Uh, I was talking about all, all paradoxes may be reconciled at some level. And uh, uh, I brought up the mystery traditions. I can't remember why I went into, into that, so I'll just keep going. Um, let's look at the principle of rhythm. Everything flows out and in. Everything has its tides. All things rise and fall. Okay, so everything has a rhythm to it or a swing to it. There's tendencies that exist in energy. The pendulum swing manifests in everything that we undergo, everything we perceive. The measure of the swing to the right is the measure of the swing to the left. It's just an opposite. It's perceived as an opposite. Rhythm will compensate. Now, what this, how this should be understood when we are talking about natural law is many people will say, well, that's just the way the tendency is moving us. It's just the way the tide is taking us. Right? But that's not really accurate. Okay? We can't look at these things as that the rhythms are set in stone and it has to be this way now. Right? One of the things that a lot of the Hermetic tradition taught regarding these laws, the, these principles, were they can be overcome by higher levels of consciousness. Okay? This one was one of them. Rhythm is a principle that is a tendency for something to swing a certain way. It's, it's, let's, let's liken it to genetics. You know, if you look at some newer biology, a lot of modern biologists are suggesting consciousness plays into whether a gene activates or not and expresses a certain condition. 
Well, this is the same way. There's something that can be done about the swing or the tide, okay? Let's look at it as you have a boat. You want to row the boat out to sea, right? You have to get past the tide. You have to get past the breakers and the waves. And if that tide's really strong at high tide, it's going to be very much more difficult. You're going to have to expend more energy to get it out to sea. If, however, you were taking it when the current's moving out to sea, okay, there, there's a, a, a flow that's moving outward deeper into the ocean, and you start rowing that boat then, you're going to be able to do it much more easily. Okay, so if there's... If there's winds pushing along a plane, it's going to have to expend less energy. It's going to get there qu more quickly, okay, because it's adding to the energy. If, however, you're flying against the wind, you got to expend a lot more energy. It's just a tendency. You can still get to where you want to go. You may just have to exert more effort. Right now, we're in a tendency of things are, are not flowing, okay? It's an ebb, all right? And it's something that needs to really have more energy put into it if we're going to resist the tendency. It doesn't mean nothing can be done about it. It doesn't mean it can't be overcome. It means at the time we're living in, okay, we want to make this motion go in this direction, but its tendency is to move in this direction. So more will is required at this time to move the consciousness. At other times, the consciousness may be flowing in a positive direction and it may take much less energy in order to move that consciousness forward. However, we're not living in that time. We are living at what many researchers have called the Kali Yuga or the age of darkness and destruction. You know, this is the, the point that resists the flow in consciousness the most. And it's going to take an enormity of effort to break down these pre-existing belief systems that don't serve who we are. So that's the principle of rhythm. This is the principle here in natural law that most fits in with how I'm using the term natural law today, cause and effect. Many people, again, in the New Age community don't want to believe that there's causes and effects and that effects are driven by causes that, you know, come first and then manifest conditions. So the principle of cause and effect simply states that every cause has its effect and every effect has its cause. Uh, every single thing that occurs happens according to law, all right? Chance is a name for law, a law not recognized. There are many planes of causation, but nothing escapes the law. So again, is there free will? Yes, there is free will. But is there free will to ignore law without consequence? No, there is not. That's the limit of free will. Free will is operating within boundary conditions that I'm referring to as natural law. It's a series of laws, actually, okay? Free will operates within these parameters or boundary conditions that cannot be exceeded or gone beyond without consequence. Oh, yeah, you can break natural law. Yes, you can break it, but you cannot break it without consequence. You cannot break it without consequence negative consequence. And that's why this body of knowledge has in the past been referred to as consequentialism. It is the knowledge of how consequences are generated by our free will decision-making processes within the boundaries of natural law. So this is the law of cause and effect, the principle of cause and effect. And I think this image, I was searching for images that encapsulate cause and effect, and I found this cartoon. I think it does it brilliantly. Most of all, because will the effect happen immediately? No, it will not happen immediately. There is a time lag. You set the cause into motion. The universe is going to intelligently bring to you through a rearrangement of all the dynamics that it needs to rearrange, the effect of what you've generated by setting that cause into motion. And there is a time gap between the, the cause going into place and the effect coming around and hitting you. This is why the pattern recognition of cause and effect is more difficult because it is separated by a time lag, by what we perceive as linear time. Now, if you did a wrong to somebody and immediately you were stung by a wasp every single time you did a wrong to somebody, 
it showed up and bit you immediately within two seconds of you hurting somebody, stealing from somebody, lying to somebody, etc. Would you start to connect the stinging to the wrong that you did? I think most people would see the pattern. They would recognize the pattern. But since that doesn't happen, and there's a time lag to, gener to experiencing something harmful to ourselves once we do something harmful to other people, it's very difficult for people to see the, the connection through the time lag. Most, uh, and moreover, it doesn't exactly happen in a one-to-one -one ratio like this, okay? It's more, karmic consequence is more complicated than all of that, all right? What's happening is that all of us are experiencing in the aggregate the wrongs that the human species is conducting on a daily basis which we do not attempt to rectify and stop through our inaction. Karma is being accrued. People think that karma can only be accrued from action. No, it cannot. It can be accrued from inaction as well. And that's where many people in our society is. They're not taking any action and they're willing to let evil run unchecked. So this is ultimately going to come back and bite us, you know? And what we set into motion is going to actually topple over onto us if we don't change our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. So nothing escapes law. We are bound by it eternally. You know, let me just go back. Go back. I'll leave it on, on this slide for a moment. You know, for some people familiar with my work, you've seen me break down the Matrix trilogy. And the law of cause and effect is brought forward extensively in the second Matrix movie, The Matrix Reloaded. And the, the scene that encapsulates this the most is the, the character of the Merovingian, who tells to the heroes who want to be free from the Matrix and its control, okay, you are coming to me without an understanding of why you are in this position. You don't understand the causal factors that have led to the current conditions that are in place. Therefore, you are coming to me with no power to affect change. You are powerless. So why should I help you? You're powerless because you lack knowledge and understanding of what set these events into motion. Why? The question why, he says, why is the only source of real power? Without why, you are powerless. He's talking about cause and effect, and he says it specifically. Causality, he calls the only real truth. And this is the villain. The words of truth come through one of the, it's a big technique in Hollywood too. The words of truth are spoken by the villain in the movie or in the series, okay? But if you listen, and there is a twist, a dark twist to what he says. He says, free will is like an illusion. No, it is not. That's where the dark occultist is trying to trip up the heroes. There are both, free will and natural law. He tries to say free will. The, the Morpheus character says to him, everything starts with choice. And Morpheus is correct. Our choices set that causality into motion before it becomes an effect. And the Merovingian tries to tell him, no, there is no free will. That's where the dark occultist will give you the bulk of truth and then poison it with that one thing he wants to get you to accept. Okay? So the, the next thing that needs to be understood is the two planes. All right? There's the plane of effects and then there's the plane of causes. No power to affect any change lies on the plane of effects, which is the physical manifested reality. Again, what already is, nothing can be done about. What already is, you cannot change. You cannot change the past. You can change what it is starting now and make sure that it gets changed in the future. But right now, what is, is the truth, and all you can do is accept that or reject it. You can't change the past. So the physical world that is manifested up to this point happened because of things that occurred in the past. The causes happened in the past. Nothing you could do about that right now. Okay? The plane of effects of the physical world is where manifested realities have already occurred, have already taken shape, have already formed due to their underlying causal factors. The plane of effects constitutes that which has already occurred. 
as such, no power to effect change lies here because that which has already occurred cannot unoccur. That which has occurred can't undo itself. It happened, it's already done. It has become that which is, or truth. Human consciousness seems to be trapped upon the plane of effects, meaning that humanity as a whole remains ignorant of the underlying causes, causes which they themselves have set into motion and which lead to self-inflicted suffering in their lives. So if you're trapped at this level, what you're doing is you're looking at the symptoms and you're stuck looking at the symptoms. Okay, this is everybody oh, there's a political solution to this. We need to vote in the right people. Oh, there's a financial solution to this. We just need to set the right monetary policy. No, there's a scientific solution to this. And technological advancements are going to be made that suddenly save ourselves and make the world any different. And they think all of this is going to be done while slavery is still in place. Well, again, good luck with that. And let me know how it works out. Okay? I speak at free energy related events. I work with the Tesla Science Foundation. I speak at MUFON-related events that talk about disclosure of extraterrestrial presence, okay? Both of these communities don't understand. The things that they say they want are impossible. And I'm going to start talking about them in, in this way more openly. You know, because I've kind of like uh, given them some soft teachings, and I think they need to hear it a little bit more harshly. Because both of these communities are not talking about morality to the extent that they need to. They think, we're going to have free energy, but nothing's going to change as far as the social structure of the world goes. We'll just develop free energy, and that'll magically save us. We'll still have slavery, but free energy will be here, and the world will be a magically better place. The UFO community, they often think, oh, we're going to get this closure. They're going to come out and tell us everything they know about other intelligences that are out there in the galaxy and in the universe with us, okay? And they think they're going to get that in a climate of slavery. Well, good luck with all those things. You got to take down the existing structure first. Okay? People think, oh, we got to build the new world while the old one decays. You have to destroy the existing power structure with the power of truth before anything new is going to grow here. Because this place is a garden full of weeds of poisoned ideologies and completely erroneous belief systems that have no bearing on truth whatsoever and cannot get us what we say we want. Until that cha those, those thoughts are changed, don't expect the results you want. So to the free energy movement, I say you're never going to get free energy in a climate of slavery. To the UFO community, I say you will never get disclosure in a climate of slavery. Slavery has to end first. Then you could get what you say you want. So, again, no power to affect any change lies in the world of effects. Cannot be done. You are rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic while it sinks. You're not creating any change doing those things. Because no, the underlying causes aren't changing. And the underlying causes are how we think, how we feel, and how we behave. And no one wants to look at that. They want to think all those things can stay in place and I can magically get what I want. I want to keep my hand over the fire, but I don't want it to burn and blister. Well, enjoy. See, find out what you get when you do that. Because that's what we're doing when it comes to natural law. So let's look at the plane of causality. This is the other plane. This is the mental realm. The mental world. Again, according to the law of mentalism, the first principle of natural law, Everything that manifests must first manifest in mind before it can manifest physically. So again, if the plane of causality is the mental world that's generating the causes in mind, okay, everything is happening there first and then it is trickling down to the physical domain. It is manifesting in the physical domain only after it has manifested in the mental world. The plane of causality is where causes are set into motion prior to those causes manifesting as formed realities in the plane of effects. <clears throat> this plane of causality constitutes the causal factors, the why, which underlies and precedes all manifested things and events. All power, all power to effect change lies on this plane of reality. 
Human consciousness must move away from the plane of effects and to the plane of causality in order for human beings to understand the causal factors of the conditions which they are collectively manifesting in their lives. Only then will humanity be able to co-create their shared reality on a conscious level, meaning with an understanding of how natural law operates, rather than on, on an unconscious level, meaning that we don't understand how natural law operates. And I just look at it in a simple graphic, in a simple you know, chart or graph. This is, the, this is the higher realm. This is the world of causality, the mental world, the why, the underlying causal factors, okay, that precede conditions which, which are manifested. This is where our consciousness has to go because this is where all power to affect change is at. In the understanding of why that manifested to begin with. So these are the symptoms. This, this line could be looked at as the diagnosis. You have to make that diagnosis and get to the underlying causal factors that lead to the symptoms. Okay? The plane of effects, on the other hand, meaning the physical world, is the manifested realm. That which has already occurred, that cannot be undone. At least in the, in the present moment, you could start in the present to undo it in the future. But as far as the present moment and all moments in the past go, you're not changing that. That's truth. That's what is. Okay? That's already manifested. You can't change it. No power to affect, to affect change lies in continuously analyzing the symptoms. You gotta do that long enough that you know where the problem's at. You've made the diagnosis. Now you can get to the causal factors and start going to work changing those causes. Okay? Unfortunately, this plane the plane of effect seems to be where human consciousness in the aggregate is trapped. It can't seem to get past there. Even if it recognizes the problem, it wants to keep describing the problem, it wants to keep describing the prison. It doesn't want to look at the causal factors because it's afraid of what the causal factors are. It doesn't want to acknowledge the causal factors lie in how we think, feel, and act, and until those things are changed, the, the external manifestation cannot change. That takes responsibility. The final principle of the um, seven principles of natural law, at least the, the formalized ones, are gender. Again, I'm going to talk about an eighth lost one. Gender exists in everything. Everything has its masculine and its feminine components or principles. We've already seen that when it comes to the human brain, consciousness, worldview, etc. Gender manifests on all planes of existence. Spiritual, mental, physical, everything. Okay? Very simple concept. What I want to briefly talk about is mental gender. Mental gender is the state of coexistence between the masculine and feminine aspects of the mind. Again, we've already looked at this. We looked at the breakdown of the physiology of the brain, at least of the higher order part of the brain, the neocortex. Our left brain hemisphere largely facilitates the masculine aspects of the mind or the intellect, logic, analytical thought, linear thought processes, while the right brain hemisphere largely facilitates the feminine aspect or intuition, meaning creativity, compassion, and holistic thought processes. This next section is what I call the lost principle. This is the eighth principle of natural law, which binds all of the other principles together. Okay, it is what I would call the encapsulating principle. Okay, it's the container inside which all the other principles fit very nicely and neatly. However, it's lost because we're not exercising it. See, we already looked at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven principles of natural law. And there they are represented by these circles overlapping each other. Okay? Can anybody see an eighth circle anywhere? You got it. Correct. Here's the eighth circle. And this might look familiar. You might have seen this somewhere. Okay? This, this pattern is called something. Does anybody know what this pattern is called? What is it? Not the flower of life. The seed of life. The seed of life. Okay? Now, what happens from a seed? It 
grows. It generates something. It creates something. A seed has an outer casing, an outer shell, okay? Then if you're going to get to the inner core of it that contains all of the creative, genetic, generative material, okay, that shell has to be there and intact. You break the shell of the seed, the creative essence of the seed is going to be gone, okay? Now, what is that principle? Here's what that principle is. It's the eighth or what I call the lost principle. And it's the thing that has to be present in order for any change to manifest itself. And it is not what most people think of it as. Even when I tell you what this is, I guarantee you there will be an inaccurate connotative meaning for what people think this means, okay? Here's what the eighth principle is. It is known as the generative principle, or the principle which governs creation, which actually is the causal factor that goes into effect and generates the result that we say that we want. But what's the real term for it? Who can guess what the actual term, what the generative principle of creation actually is? No, it is not action. It, okay, now most people will say it's love. I want to distinguish it from the concept of love, even as I'm going to describe love in this presentation a little bit later on. Okay? What is it? Procreation. No? What? Somebody said it. But somebody said something else. No? Who? Care. There it is. Okay? The generative principle is care. Now, this is different than compassion. People say, why don't you use the word compassion? Because that's not what I'm talking about. It is a different concept than compassion or even what I would describe as love. Care, and I mean care with a capital C, and here I didn't even put it with a capital C. I'm just putting it in all uppercase. All uppercase care. Th distinguish this from care with a lowercase c. Okay? This means... What are you giving attention and helping to grow? What are you focusing upon? Because what focus you're focusing upon, that's what's ultimately getting generated, getting created, and growing. And this doesn't mean be ignorant of what's going on in the world and don't look at anything that's negative because you're going to feed that and give power to it. That's not what it means. Okay? That means you know what you're feeding? In that instance, if you want to do that, you're feeding ignorance. And that's what's going to grow. It's the exact opposite that the New Agers want you to believe that it is. By ignoring the negative, you are ensuring that more of it occurs. You are fueling it by ignorance. Ensuring that it grows and takes over. Okay? What care has to be looked at here as is... This is what you're giving your energy to. This is what you're focused upon. This is what you actually care enough about to do, to spend your time on, to put your attention on, to manifest in the world. That's what I'm talking about as care, okay? That's what generates our experience in the aggregate. Most people don't care about what's really happening. Therefore, it is an impossibility for us in the aggregate to change the direction of energy, to change the direction of consciousness, and ultimately to get what we say we want. That's how the real law of attraction works. All right? Here's how it actually operates. The lost principle is the dynamic of care. What we care about on a day-to-day -day basis acts as the driving force of our thoughts and actions. What did I say we need to develop? The heart, mind, guts, right? Heart, mind, guts, in that order. Care comes first. You gotta care enough to know, to develop the knowledge, okay? Then you gotta act on it and put it into practice. Apply it. So that's the order. Heart, mind, guts. Care, knowledge, action. Those are the steps, okay? And all three of those have to be in place. All three. 
That's what unity consciousness is. It's unifying thoughts, emotions, and actions. The three aspects of consciousness, such there is no contradiction between them. Our thoughts, what we say, what, what we think, how we feel, and how we act are one and the same. There's no contradiction. That's unity consciousness. Okay? Therefore, okay, since it's the, care is the driver of our thoughts and actions, it all ultimately can be seen as the generator of the quality of our shared experience here on the earth. Care is what generates the whole thing. Hence, it has been called the generative principle. Liken the heart to a pump in the body. Well, what does a pump do? It's a generator. It provides energy. It moves the life force through the blood in the body. In every ancient tradition, they talk about the life force being in the blood. The heart is what pumps that through the whole physiology and enables us to continue to sustain life, okay? The heart is the generator, it's the pump. It's the center of the being. As important as the brain is, which we just talked about the importance of it, the heart is ultimately what's generating the experience because what we care about determines what we think about on a daily basis most of the time and therefore how we behave, all right? So, the, this principle has often been referred to as the generative principle. Uh, is anybody familiar with the compasses and square symbol of Freemasonry with the G in the middle? Well, that's what the G stands for at the highest level. They'll talk about many, many porch Masons. These are the exoteric Masons that are given the teachings of the profane and they think they're in the know, okay? They're given the, the information, well, this only means geometry, it only means God, etc., okay? One of the things they'll tell you it means in, at a slightly higher level is that it means gnosis, knowledge, okay, which we saw the meaning of in Greek earlier. At a higher level, at illuminated levels of Freemasonry, which are above 30, 32nd degree, they will give you what the real meaning of the G inside the compasses and square is, and it is the generative principle. It means genesis, creation, okay? And yeah, you can tie that right back to God. I'm not saying those things are different. And the, the forms that get created in the physical manifested world are geometric forms. So it is geometry as well. It's all these things. But at the highest level, it's the generative principle. That's what that G really stands for in esoteric Freemasonry. Okay? It's called the generative principle because that means to create. It comes from, the word generative comes from Latin, the verb Genere, as we've already talked about, means to create. The generative principle is what we create through. And it's lost because people don't care. They don't have care. Hence, it's the lost principle. Okay? Here's how it works, folks. What we care enough to put our will behind. Okay? So again, heart, mind, guts. Guts is the will. The action, the masculine principle, that's what gets, gets things done ultimately in the physical domain. What we care enough to put our will behind, and that's driven by the care. That's the generator or the pump that drives the will, okay? What we care enough to put our will behind is ultimately what gets created or manifested in our world. The world is the way that it is because most people do not care enough, even if they say, they pay lip service, okay, and say that they want things to be different. They don't care enough to actually change it through their actions. Because when, it, again, when it comes all down to it, and I said this in my New Age, uh, you know, uh, BS seminar or, or lecture, okay? What it comes down to is preventing action, preventing action. That's what the New Age community is designed to do. They want people inactive because the dark occultists know that the thing that is ultimately generating our reality is behavior, as you saw in that simple four-part chart, that little you know building block chart that I put up there. Action is what's generating the reality. That gets generated through what we care about because our cares and our desires drive our actions. Okay, so most people will say they want things to change, but then when you say, what are you doing to make that change happen? Not a word, silence comes back on the other end, okay? 
So, they don't care enough to change it through their actions. That's what the generative or lost principle is about. And until that principle is regained and people get out of their laziness and most of all get out of their cowardice. Again, in that New Age lecture, I'm talking about what it ultimately comes down to in the New Age movement. And I'll look at any New Ager in the eyes. They're cowards. Cowards. Ultimately, they know the evil that we're up against and they intend to do not a damn thing about it. That's what it really, that's what it really comes down to. And anybody telling you it's different than that is lying to you. Okay? They're cowards. Period. And I'll say it right to any of their faces. Anything I say up here, I'll, anybody that believes in that nonsense, come and bring them to me. I'll tell them right to their face. Straight and open, just like I said it here. Because I don't care. I don't care about their nonsense. I care about what's real. Okay? So, I'm telling you, this religion has to go. It's got to go. If people are going to make real change happen, the idea that it can't be done, uh, that it can be done without taking actual real world action has to be purged from human consciousness. Reality does not work like that. Period. The end. I, and I can't make you accept that. I recognize I can't make anybody in this room accept that. All I can do is put it out there for your consideration, and if you have some common sense and really, really think about it, you'll understand what I'm saying here is absolutely the way it is, okay? Many people want to deceive you through these religious notions, okay, which is all about getting people to stand down and accept their chains. That's what that religion's in place for, all right? This next section I call spiritual currency or spiritual currencies, all right? There's two spiritual currencies, time and attention. Now, look, we can readily see this, right? Time is money, people say. It's currency, right? What am I going to spend my time on? What am I going to pay attention to? Pay attention. You pay for something, you get something in return when you pay for something, right? That's what attention will get you here. It will get you something in return. You pay attention, you're going to come out of here with a lot of understanding, there's two spiritual currencies, time and attention. This analogy can be very readily, can be seen very readily in the saying, spending time and paying attention. Whatever information or endeavors we put our time and attention toward, we end up getting something in return for that investment of these currencies. This is what real money is, folks. Real money. This will get you real money. One eye, moan eye. Okay? If you want real money instead of the fake Federal Reserve nonsense fiat paper currency money that isn't worth the paper it's printed upon, then keep thinking that that has value. Okay? And people who say gold is value, gold is real money. Yeah, well, I ask people, what intrinsic value does gold have? And they say, well, oh, it's been traded with throughout time immemorial. People valued it all, all time. Does that make it intrinsic? You answered my question. It's like saying, uh, why, why does that projector have intrinsic value? And you say, because I find it valuable. No, that projector has intrinsic value because it's capable of projecting an image. And if I want that task done, that's what I use a projector for. Okay? Well, what's gold used for? Can you build clothing out of it? Can you build a house out of it? Is it malleable enough to be uh, molded into a weapon of some sort? You're going to take shelter under it? Well, maybe if you have enough of it. But, you know, the whole point is there is no intrinsic value to this. It's something that's bi the idea of it having, in of any precious metal having intrinsic value, other than, you know, okay, in a technological society, it's used for computers. This is true. Okay? But I'm talking about in nature. You know, where would this idea of intrinsic value of gold come from in the ancient past? People say, well, it's used as a medium of exchange. Okay? Money is not a medium of exchange. People think of it as a medium of exchange, and it's not. It's, it's incorrect. Okay? Money is the limiter of energy in the system. See, people think of money as currency. Even the name is a mind control technique because it's supposed to be about it's the current in the energy system. This is the current. It's the amperage, right? No, it's not. It's, it's not the capacitance either. It's not a store. That's another thing people will tell you money is, what they say is real money. Okay? It's all fake. It's all fake. It's not a store either. You know what it is? It's the resistance in the system. It's the resistance to change in the system. 
it acts as the resistor. Because as long as that modality of slavery called money continues to exist, there will always, it will always be extraordinarily difficult to create real lasting change. So again, again, I, I piss off everybody. <laughs> Religion's got to go. Scientism's got to go. New age thought's got to go. Money's got to go. All of it's got to go. You know why? It's all religion. It's all religion, and the word religion means to hold one back, to tie one up and keep them where they're at, as we're going to get to in a few moments. Okay? So let's get back to spiritual currencies. We end up getting something in return on what we put our investment of spiritual currencies toward. And you know what that, if it's put toward the right goals, the end result is true money, one eye. Okay? True spiritual vision. The ability to see, to unoccult something and see it for what it really is. That's what comes from truly putting time and attention onto the right things. This return could come in the form of knowledge. It could come in the form of understanding. It could come in the form of skills, expertise, and, and empowerment. But only if we invest these two spiritual currencies wisely. And let me tell you something, folks. That's what, why most people don't have any money. They got nothing to pay for it with. See, you, you pay attention and you get money. You spend time and you get money. I'm talking about the real thing. Cool. We're going to take a break in about five to ten minutes. Okay? So we have to invest our spiritual currencies wisely. We should seek to improve our quality of attention by placing it upon information that is capable of improving both ourselves and the human condition as a whole. G give me a heads up in about eight or nine minutes. Thank you. Such an effort would also constitute a valuable investment of our time. We should ask ourselves, what am I spending my time on? What am I spending my time doing? And what am I paying attention to? That's where you will find whether you're investing in real value, something that is truly valuable. If most of the time we're spending our time on nonsense and trivialities and, you know, divisive things and TV and sports and all other kinds of entertainment and distraction, well, you're going to have a return on that investment and that return is going to be low. It's not going to result in much money, real money, Okay. Most importantly, we need to ask ourselves, what kind of quality am I getting in return for my investments of time and money? A time and, and attention, I'm sorry. Okay? These are the spiritual currencies. And that's what most people don't want to give. They don't want to give these freely for a return on investment. They don't want to pay attention to the right things. They don't want to spend time on the right things. This is a simple chart of how our quality of our attention... Okay, and again, this is in the aggregate, but it's created by all the individuals. How the quality of our overall attention as a species will affect our world in accordance with the principle of correspondence, which states, as goes the microcosm or the microcosmic units, so will become the macrocosm. Okay, so over here, we have a pure information stream. This is good information. This is information that is capable that resonates with truth and is capable of helping to develop wisdom or right action within the being. This over here is the poison information stream like we get from the mainstream media, from scientism, from the New Age movement, from uh, government indoctrination centers called schools, okay? This is the poisoned information stream. Now, everybody's going to take in some form of a mixture of both of these streams. What the goal needs to be is to purify just like, hey, you take in bad food, you're going to have bad health. You take in bad information, the output through behavior is going to be bad. So you got to purify. Meaning, if there's valves here on the individual buckets, these are called the individual people, okay? And they're all coming together with the quality of their water, right? What they're holding within their consciousness. And that's all going into the big pool called the world. Everybody's bringing their bucket to the pool, they're pouring it in, and then they're jumping in. That's the world. That's the quality of the world, right? The quality of this whole thing here is going to be based on how much poisoned, polluted information was in your bucket compared to how much pure information was in your bucket, okay? So there's valves over here. 
we got to shut this one off, this brown muddied valve, muddy valve over here, and we got to open this one up. Okay? If we do that, the world will be purified and it, we won't be creating self-inflicted suffering. We don't do that, we're going to be swimming in brown muck. Okay? And generating all kinds of problems for ourselves. So, how are we spending our time? What are we paying attention to? Is this what we're doing with our time and attention? Sitting behind the hypnosis box? Which means suppression of knowledge. Hypnosis is the suppression of knowledge or the suppression of spirit. Okay? Or are we going to devote our time to some pursuits of wisdom? Which means developing knowledge, converting it to understanding by process it, processing it accurately, and then converting it into wisdom through action, through right action. And, you know, you got to read to do this. People don't want to hear that either. Okay? Reading is required. The ancient Romans had two words, the same word. Okay? They meant two different things in their language. The word was liber, L-I-B-E-R. Liber meant free, as in not a slave, a free being would be described as liber, free. It's the basis of the English word liberty, 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 freedom, okay? They had the same word also meant a different concept. So the word liber didn't just mean free. If it was used in a different context, does anybody know what else the word liber meant, L-I-B-E-R meant in Latin? Book. It meant book. Does that tell us something? They associated the word, the Latin word for book also meant free in their language. Okay? And again, liber is the basis for the word library. Okay? Liberary. Okay? Where you can go to become free if you read the right books. You know? And again, the world is our library now. You know, we've reunited all the parts of the big library that were cast to the four corners of the earth. The mystery traditions are available at your fingertips now, which hasn't been the case at any time in human history. And what are we doing? We're playing Farmville on Facebook. You know? So we have to ask ourselves, what are we spending our spiritual currency on? And are we investing it wisely? for a return of real money, which is actually spiritual enlightenment. I'm going to uh, take a quick break right there, and we'll pick it up with the next section in 10 minutes. 10 minutes, right back here to continue. Thank you. So uh, natural law has been called many different uh, things in different traditions throughout the world at different times in history. Let's look at what some people have called it. Uh, it's been called the law of cause and effect, or the laws of cause and effect. And there's a scientific connotation to this concept of cause and effect, too. Even scientists will say an effect invariably follows a cause. And they'll also say things like, for every action, there is an equal, there exists an equal and opposing reaction. So there's a consequence when an action is taken. In the uh, more uh, new age circles, you've he heard it uh, um, referred to as the law or laws of attraction, okay? I call this presentation the real law of attraction. So, uh, however, there are some uh, good things that uh, the new age community, I and I don't tell you it's all bad, I don't make that blanket statement, okay? It is a religion in, in many respects, but however, there are some truths embedded in it that can be taken on their own and, you know, uh, that can be value can be gleaned from. So one of those sayings is, the energy that we emit is the energy that we attract. This is true. What we're putting out into the universe is what we're getting in return from the universe and what we're creating in our reality. Uh, energy flows where attention goes. I just talked about this in the last section. What we put our attention on is what ultimately gets manifested in the world. As you think, feel, and act, so you shall be. You know, some of the... Um, Teachers of uh, different variants of law of attraction teachings have only put the first part in that. As you think, so you will be. No. As you think, feel, and act, so you will be. And most of all, as you act, so you will be. Most of all. Okay? So, 
it's been called karma. It's been called moral law, as I talked about before. And this is, you know, uh, captured beautifully by the phrase, what we sow, we reap. The seeds, the seeds that you scatter, that's what's going to grow, and that's the fruit that you're going to, to harvest. So a uh, very accurate way of looking at it. Uh, again, it's been called consequentialism. That's another thing I could put into this chart. In other words, that there is free will, but there is no free will without consequence. That's called consequentialism. That would be another very accurate way of referring to natural law. And finally, the golden rule, it's been called. Okay, And it's been stated in the affirmative as do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. I find this much more powerfully stated in the negative, or what I call the apophatic variant. And we'll talk about what apophatic and apophysis means in a few moments. Uh, I think it would have been much less ambiguous, the golden rule, if it was said like this. Do not do to others as you would prefer not to have done unto you. Now it, the ambiguity goes away because people want to be treated slightly differently. You know, hey, a, a masochist might uh, might want to get beaten by a sadist, okay? But that doesn't mean, uh, you know, do, do that to others because you like it. But people like know what they don't want. They don't want their rights taken. They don't want their property taken or, or damaged. They don't want to be harmed in their person, you know? They don't want any of those things. They don't want to be lied to. They don't want to be deceived. So don't do those things to other people. So let's jump into the, this is the heart of the presentation here. It's how natural law actually works in our lives. What are its expressions? How can we come to understand how this operates? There are ways of knowing, and they're, they, they're, they're through these expressions of natural law. So we defined what natural law is. We talked about the underlying principles that it's based upon. Now we are going to talk about how it works in our lives, okay? So we're going to build a chart of the natural law expressions in a moment. What these expressions are, are the recognizable workings in our life. And they take place through five basic expressions. Each of the five expressions of natural law have a positive aspect and a negative aspect. So that gives us a total of 10 overall natural law expressions. And we're going to build a chart regarding these expressions. Okay? So here's the expression, and then there's a positive aspect to the expression, and there's a negative aspect to the expression. The first expression of natural law is known as, and again, this is what I call these things. It's, and there's no hard and fast rules, it's just terminology. It's jargon to try to explain them in words. Okay? These are unseen concepts and laws in human, in reality in nature, in the nature of the universe. Okay, these are just English word terms that I'm applying to these concepts, okay? So the first principle of natural law I call the generative polarity. Or in other words, this is the force or energy that we are using at the base level to start the process of creation. Or you could say of co-creation, okay? We're co-creating the reality that we experience with the laws of nature. So you can look at the first uh, principle, uh, first expression of natural law, which is the generative polarity, as the force that we use to set all of the other events which are to come, which are to manifest in our lives, into motion. Or in other words, what we use, the force that we use to generate or create the quality of our experience. That's the generative polarity. The positive expression of the generative polarity is love. Now, this is not what many people think of as love, okay? It's not familial love. It's not relationship love. It's not Hollywood movie variant of love. It's not romance novel variant of love, okay? I call love consciousness. It, love is the force which helps us to expand consciousness and become open to truth if we are in it. If we are in that vibratory energy, we become open to truth. All right? So here's what it looks like visually. 
I try to put a visual aspect to all of these concepts, okay? And people would think I'm going to put two people together kissing or hugging or something like that, okay? Love is inside each individual if it's present, okay? It doesn't depend on any other person. You can express love with another person, and there's no problem with that. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. That's a great thing if it's present in your life. The capital L, capital O, capital V, capital E definition of love that I'm giving here is not that. It is this force that opens up our consciousness. It's the flowering expression of consciousness, okay? So how I word this is the positive aspect of the generative polarity, the first expression of natural law, is love. In regard to natural law, Love should be seen as the expansive force for consciousness. It is the force which helps us to become open to truth and expand our awareness. That's the connotation that I'm giving for the concept called love here. Okay, that's the positive expression of the, the creative polarity. Now, the negative expression of the, create, of the creative polarity is the exact opposite of love. So people will automatically think, well, that's hate, and it is not. Because the thing that puts consciousness in a box and prevents it from growing and keeps it where it's at is what? Fear. There it is, fear. Fear is the basis for unconsciousness. You cannot be unconscious of anything in particular unless you fear it. Okay, that's what shuts consciousness down. And here's my visual for it. Fear. I don't want to look at that. That's too horrible for me to contemplate. That can't be true. I don't want that to be true. That's all fear. Okay? The negative aspect of the generative polarity is fear. Fear is the contractive force for consciousness. Fear is the force which influences us to become closed to the truth, and it is the force which ultimately shuts down our awareness. That's why so many people are unconscious, because they are fearful. They are fearful of the responsibility that comes with knowledge, and most of all, they are fearful of having to act based upon knowledge, because that requires courage. The second natural law expression is the initiating expression, what I call the initiating expression, just my term for it, okay? The initiating expression is the first stage of tangible and recognizable results which we produce in our lives after we have, quote unquote, set the ball rolling, okay? Set the dynamic in motion uh, by choosing between the generative polarities of either love or fear, all right? So, we choose love and something starts to happen. We become open to truth, right? Well, love is the expansive force for consciousness that opens our minds to the truth and awareness. So what do we gain as a result of accepting or, or existing in the vibratory energy called love? We gain knowledge which is the acceptance of truth. Since love opens us up to truth, knowledge is its reception. It is the receiving of truth. We come to know, okay? So that's how it starts. I call this the initiating expression. Now, of course, there's a negative initiating expression if we are existing in the vibratory dynamic of fear. That would be the opposite of knowledge. What is it? Ignorance, right. Okay, now, this is what I put forward as knowledge. This is my imagery for knowledge. Okay? Uh, that's a being who knows themselves. You know, and as the mystery traditions of, uh, of Greece put forward uh, at the Delphic Oracle, know the self and you will know the universe. In other words, know the microcosm and you will know the macrocosm. Know thyself. The positive aspect of this initiating expression is knowledge or the acceptance of truth. Knowledge positively influences the quality of our lives because it positively influences our decision-making processes that lead to understanding in every area of our lives. You want to know how something works? 
and ultimately create something good? You have to have knowledge. You want to know how a car works? Keep it running in good order, you have to have knowledge. You want to know how a computer works? Keep it running in good order, you have to have knowledge. You want to know how the human psyche works and keep it running in good, good order so the conditions on earth manifest the way you want them to manifest? You got to have knowledge. Not getting out of this condition without learning. Learning is the key, it's the answer. That, it, knowledge is, is the answer. And people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear it. They want to think, we're magically going to manifest the, con the de desired conditions that we say we want without learning a thing. It doesn't work that way. So again, the negative initiating expression is ignorance. Ignorance is the refusal of truth. It is the refusal to gain knowledge. Okay? Because we are in fear. So here's what I put <laughs> as the image for ignorance. You know? The population that is hypnotized, that wants to keep paying attention to nonsense and trivialities, feed themselves tons of GMO food that is crap for the physiology, you know? Pay attention to distraction, entertainment, mainstream news and media, you know. Uh, it's all there to just shut the consciousness down and keep people in a depressed uh, psychological state and keep them in a state of psychological infancy. The negative aspect of the initiating expression of natural law is ignorance or the refusal of truth. Ignorance negatively influences the quality of our lives because it negatively influences these decision-making processes that lead to understanding in every area of our lives. If you're ignorant about how anything works, you can't create the desired condition. It's just not possible. It's important to remember, again, that ignorance should be distinguished from nescience, which means not knowing because necessary information is not present or was unattainable. Ignorance, on the other hand, means not knowing even though necessary information is present because that information has been willfully refused or disregarded. And again, to keep us in ignorance, they don't need to hide the information anymore because it's not hidden anymore. It's out. And then once again, it's available at your fingertips for free if you have the desire to take it in. But now, the, 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 the manipulation mechanism that is used is dissuade people from looking at it. Provide endless entertainment, provide endless amusement, provide endless distraction, and say there's nothing to any of that stuff. That's just some old crazy religion that you don't need to understand. It's no different than any other religion believing that natural law exists. Okay? That's what people will insist on telling you. So people will be dissuaded from ever looking into it, and they'll disregard it of their own choice. Thomas Jefferson said that if an, a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. Freedom and ignorance are antitheses of each other that can never coexist simultaneously. That is an impossibility in natural law. I'm going to put up a couple other quotes on ignorance. Samuel Adams said, No people will tamely surrender their liberties, nor can any be easily subdued. When knowledge is diffused, that means it's everywhere present, and virtue is preserved, meaning morality. On the contrary, when people are universally ignorant and debauched in their manners, meaning purely selfish and only worried about themselves, they will sink under their own weight without the aid of foreign invaders, meaning the society will turn inward on itself and collapse and destroy itself just based on the fact alone that the population is ignorant and they are ensconced in uh, moral relativism and um, other forms of debauchery and just uh, self-pleasure as their highest virtue, their highest uh, desire. Socrates said that the only good is knowledge and the only evil is ignorance. And this is a quote I'd like to be remembered for. Willful ignorance in the presence of knowledge is the measure of a bad person. And people will say that's extremely harsh. That's true. That doesn't make the statement untrue. The statement is true as well. It is a harsh statement. See, people in my family will ask me, why don't, why don't you have anything to do with me anymore? I've deliberately cut off many members of my own family. 
okay? Because many members of my own family say, I know what's going on and I don't, I don't care. I don't intend to do a damn thing about it. I'm worried about me, myself, and mine, and I don't care what's happening in the world. Well, you know what that's called, folks? That's called a bad person. <laughs> let's not mince words. Let's not euphemize. Let's call it what it is. That's called a bad person. And I don't want anything to do with bad people in my personal life. I don't hang out with bad people. I try to surround myself with good people who care. Because they're creating, co-creating wisely. Okay? I tell, my, I tell family members who I've cut off association with, because you do not care is what makes you a bad person. I don't want anything to do with you until you start caring about what's going on in the world. Then we could talk again. And I'll welcome you back with open arms and forgive you. But not until... You know, you want to stay in that level of consciousness? I want nothing to do with you. I don't want to be around people like that. They're bad influences, and they do bring other people down. You know? So I'll still put out the information. It's there any time for free that they want to go and engage it. And I tell them all, anytime you want to ask me and come over and engage directly with me, I'll make the time for you. But until you want to do that, until you develop that desire, I don't want to be in your presence. Okay? So maybe, I, I don't know if that's going to be effective. I don't know. And guess what? I don't care whether it's going to be effective because I'm not going to surround myself with bad people until they decide I want to make myself a better person. Then I'll, then I'll engage them and speak the truth to them. But until then, I'll put this out there for all for free and they can engage at any time they want. You know. But in my personal life, I can't make time for that. I don't have energy for that. I barely have energy for this. Uh, an anonymous quote, I believe this was from some internet forum. I don't know who the gentleman, what the gentleman's name was, but it was a great quote. Uh, Ignorance is the root cause of all evil. And since only knowledge eradicates ignorance, it is our duty and moral obligation, there's that term, to educate ourselves as well as the masses around us. That's a moral obligation if you're in a position of knowledge. And once again, that's why I do what I do. I don't do it because I like people. <laughs> Believe me, Barb will tell you how much I like people. <laughs> I don't do it to make friends. I don't do it to make money. I do it because it's a moral obligation and for no other reason. I don't serve people. I serve truth. Truth is a force, force which I serve. And I bend the knee to no other. That's it. That's it. So great quote on ignorance there, great few quotes on ignorance. Let's look at the next expression. The internal expression is what happens inside of us, very simply. So now we've started creating with a polarity. Something has happened in the world, either acceptance of truth or, or refusal of truth. Now something's going to take place inside of us, right? So look, this level is that knowledge level, right? This is the base consciousness level. You could look at, that's the foundation. Remember that four block diagram, right? You could look at this, here's the foundation. This is the foundation that lies underneath the trivium, right? Okay? That's as, low, that's as deep as it gets. Consciousness or unconsciousness, love or fear. That's what everything is a choice about between, right? Now here's that first block. Knowledge or lack thereof. Knowledge or ignorance, right? And you can see these polarities are like that concept of, uh, you know, uh, in, in um, uh, the uh, uh, polarity um, aspect of the, the natural law principles, okay? There's one thing that's real, and then this is the illusion, okay? These are two aspects of the same thing. This is consciousness, and this is its lack. This is acceptance of truth, and this is the lack of that, okay? So there, it's the same thing, but opposite in degree, which is why they're the same expression. Now, what happened after knowledge or lack thereof? We went up to understanding, right? So that's what this level is. It, understanding happens internally, right? It's an internal process, all right? So the positive aspect of the internal expression is when we come to understand through developing the knowledge and the acceptance of truth that we are sovereign. Sovereignty is the expression 
the internal positive expression of natural law. Now, again, underneath these, in quote, in parentheses, I always put what I call these things, another name that I've given to these things, these concepts. I call sovereignty internal monarchy. Internal monarchy. Now, monarchy means one ruler. Mon means one, is a prefix for one, and archon in Greek means ruler or master. So, internally, we each need to master and rule ourselves. This is our kingdom that we get to rule and know nowhere else. We don't get to rule over anybody else. Many people think they're the rulers of other people, but they're wrong. Each of us is a sovereign being. We're, sovereignty, as we're going to see, means that you're not owned by anyone else. No one else owns you if you're sovereign. Okay? So here's my expression, my visualization for sovereignty. Okay? Somebody who truly has the light. They have the light at their disposal. They're bathed in it. They're, it's flowing within them. Okay? And light has always been associated in different mystery traditions as knowledge. It's been a symbol that has represented knowledge. This is the person who has the knowledge and has, has gone through the decision making and filtering processes with that knowledge to come to an internal understanding that they are a sovereign being. And I have news for everybody. Whether you know it or not, whether you are familiar with the term or not, every person here is a sovereign. And you can never not be. It is an impossibility for you ever to be non-sovereign. It cannot be done. It cannot be done in nature. Okay? Every single human being on this planet is a sovereign being. And we're going to look at what a sovereign, sovereignty actually means. The positive aspect of the internal expression is sovereignty, or what I call internal monarchy, meaning one ruler within. Internal monarchy, one ruler within. As a state of consciousness, sovereignty means that one has unified the three aspects of their consciousness, such that there is no internal contradiction between one's thoughts, emotions, and actions. We become a being that as we think, so we feel, so we speak and act. And there's no contradiction between those. We're not torn apart from within in this state of internal opposition with our, amongst our, our own consciousness. Okay? Moreover, let's break the word sovereign down. That's where we're going to come to the real meaning of the term. Sovereign is derived from the Latin adverb super. Super means above. See, in classical Latin, there's no, there's no uh, V in classical Latin, right? There was no V character. Actually, if you wrote a V like that, it was a U, okay? And why a, a double U looks the way that it is. It's two Vs, actually. But that sound was U in Latin, if you see a V. There's no v, v sound in classical Latin. doesn't exist phonetically, all right? So th this, this uh, phonetic variation that we express as v, v or V in English, in Latin was P or B. It was represented by a P or a B. So what we're really seeing here is suver, suver, okay? But it was pronounced in Latin super, like super. Well, what does super mean? Super, you're beyond, you're above and beyond, okay? It means above or beyond, that's what it means. A superman is one who's beyond an ordinary man, right? The Latin noun regnum comprises the second part of the etymological root of this word. Regnum, it comes from rex, rex regis in Latin, or regis. It means king. So regnum was the king's rulership. Regnum means his reign. It's where the word reign comes from in English. Regnum in Latin. It means rulership or externally imposed control. Okay? Not, not control in the context. I'm going to control my emotions. I'm going to control my behavior. No. It means I'm going to control you externally by imposing my will over your will through coercion. That's the context of rulership or control that I'm talking about here. So put them together. Super regnum, sovereign, means above or beyond externally imposed rulership or control by another. That's what it means. 
Sovereign means not a subject to another being, like a king, like one who considers himself a king. And it means not a slave to someone who considers themselves your master. That's all sovereign means, folks, not a slave. And why I say every single person here is a sovereign is because there is no such thing, never has been any such thing, and never will be any such thing as legitimacy to slavery. That has never existed, does not exist now, and never will exist. Slavery is an illegitimate concept. None of us are slaves. The condition of slavery has been imposed upon people, but it has never in history been legitimate, and it never will in history be legitimate. So there is no legitimacy to the concept of slavery, of the rightful rulership of another being through directly imposing your control through coercion. Doesn't exist. That's a big part of what natural law is about. We have to understand when we're saying this word, this is what is meant by sovereign, not a slave. Okay, we did a, a, a study where we asked people, are you a sovereign? Like 11% said yes. Maybe, I think it was 10 or 11%. Which I, I thought was almost encouraging that one in 10 people knew that they were sovereign beings. It was amazing. But 90% of the human population doesn't feel that they're sovereign, doesn't know that they're sovereign. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I don't, it doesn't matter an iota whether you believe you are or not. I'm telling you it's an eternal truth that you are a sovereign and can never be non-sovereign. There is no such thing as someone else's legitimate rulership or ownership of you. Because there's no such thing to the legitimacy of slavery, and there never has been, and there never will be. So everyone is a sovereign. A sovereign is a monarch. Again, mon means one, and archon means ruler. So when people ask me, what kind of government do you want? I tell them I want anarchy, and I want, and I want monarchy. And they're like, how could you have those thing, things simultaneously? Because if you have internal monarchy, you can have external anarchy. See, we need to have the rulership within, and we need to get rid of the rulership without. This is the kingdom we need to master, and we need to set aside the concept of mastery and slavery in the external domain, in the, in the physical world. Sovereignty, so uh, a, a sovereign is a monarch, which means a single ruler who rules only the kingdom of self. Sovereignty is a state in which one controls one's own thoughts, emotions, and actions, and by bringing them into unity or non-contradiction or non-duality, attains mastery over one's own consciousness. Sovereignty could be considered the equivalent of true self-control, true self-mastery, true self-love, or true self-ownership. It's all of these things. And ultimately, it means not a slave. That's what has to be remembered above all else. Let's look at the negative internal expression for natural law, which is confusion. Now, confusion results when we are in ignorance. That's the emotional dynamic, the feeling that takes place within the individual. This is the lack of understanding. Confusion only happens in a lack of understanding. When we have not taken in knowledge, because we are afraid, we are in fear, okay? Ignorance results, and then confusion happens internally. So look, this is the, remember, here's the essence. That's the foundation. This is that first stage, that first building block that we called knowledge or lack thereof. Okay, this is the second building block that we call understanding or lack thereof. This is true understanding when truth has been taken in and accepted. And this is the lack of understanding. Now, in that state of lack of understanding, we're confused. So there's no rulership within. Inside of us, there's anarchy, which means the absence of ruler of a ruler, not the absence of rules, which I'm going to get into later, 
Anarchy means there's no ruler, no master. So if there's no master inwardly, we have a big problem because that means there's no self-mastery, there's no self-control, there's no self-discipline, and ultimately there's no self-love. And that results in an understanding that we don't truly own ourselves. It would result in the absence of self-ownership, which is what we're experiencing as a species. That other people believe they own other people. This is what I found as a picture representing confusion. Someone who doesn't know themselves. Doesn't know themselves, completely attached to an ego identity. Their, their, their whole mind is all wrapped up. I believe I'm this businessman. I believe I'm this uh, banker. I believe I'm this lawyer. I believe I'm this doctor. And that's my identity. And if something goes wrong with that, there goes my identity. There's who I am down the drain. You know? So this negative aspect of in the internal expression of natural law is confusion. Or what I call internal anarchy, meaning no ruler within. Confusion is the state of mind in which the being is ruled by fear and ignorance. Confusion could be seen as internal opposition, opposition within one's own consciousness. In other words, being torn apart from within in such a way that one's own thoughts, emotions, and actions are in perpetual contradiction with each other. A thought, emotion, and action are not in alignment as we think, is not how we truly feel and is not how we act. There's total contradiction and separation, no, no uh, unity amongst those three aspects of consciousness. That's confusion. The fourth expression of natural law is what happens externally in the macrocosm in society. When you have a bunch of people who are in either this dynamic w within their own consciousness or a bunch of people who are in this dynamic in their own consciousness, a state results in the society at large because the society at large is comprised of the aggregate quality of the individuals that comprise that society. All right? So if there's love present and knowledge has been taken in and, and it's been understood and we understand that we're sovereign and we're expressing self-ownership and self-mastery, what state manifests in society? Freedom. There it is. Freedom can only manifest when those preceding conditions are in place. It cannot magically manifest by any other means. If we say we want to be free, this is the path we have to take. Consciousness, acceptance of truth, and an understanding of our own sovereignty through self-mastery. It can't happen any other way. It's not possible. Okay? So, this is what the picture I chose for freedom. This is actually from the cover of probably one of the greatest books I think that's ever been penned by human hands. And I've read a whole lot of books in my life. And, I'm, and for me to say that, it's a high compliment. Okay? I think I'm a pretty good judge of books that can impart some wisdom to people. And I'm telling you, you need to read the book the End of All Evil by Jeremy Locke, if you haven't already read it. This is one of the, co the cover image from that book. Very rare book. T to find it physically online, if you find it at a decent price, snatch it up and give it, give it to other people or sell it to other people. Okay, I happen, I had a physical copy of this book. I lent it out, took off. Forgot who I lent it to. It happens, right? But this was a rare book. I think it was only pressed so many, th a couple thousand, and it was never repressed. So it's a single printing or something like that, never repressed it. Now, you'll find that book for $150, $200 in some places, right? I finally found it at some foreign source online for like 20 25 bucks, and jumped all over it, and I finally have a new, co a new physical copy of it. Um, one of the books, along with uh, Larkin Rose's book, um, the most dangerous superstition, that if I had to tell you, destroy every other book on earth, it would be down to these two. You know what I mean? It's that, it's that much. They're, they're that important. Um, this is the cover image from that book with chains being broken that were formerly holding the earth in captivity. I think it's a great image that represents what freedom is about. It's not about my freedom. It's about our freedom. 
It's about freedoms for all beings. And guess what? Our, when I say that in relationship to the earth, doesn't just mean human beings. It means all beings, including the animal kingdom. So the positive aspect of the external expression is freedom, or what I call external anarchy, meaning externally there are no rulers. There is no condition of masters and slaves. Okay? So that's what anarchy actually means, the absence of slavery. That's what it really means. True freedom for all should be seen as the goal of spiritual development. Such a state can only manifest as a result of human society's adherence to natural law. Can only manifest. Not just will manifest, the only way it is possible for it to manifest is if we understand and adhere to natural law. Okay, so that's the positive external expression, what happens in society. Now, there's a negative external expression, and you can call it multiple things. You can call it totalitarianism. You could call it slavery. I term it simply control, externally imposed control. Okay, it doesn't mean, you know, self-control. It means literally someone outside of your own being is trying to control you and own you. So yeah, a good way of looking at it would be slavery as well, because control leads to slavery. Control is what I call external monarchy, meaning there's a ruler from without that believes and wants to, believes they do own you and wants to continue to own you as their subject or slave. And this manifests in things like the oncoming police state, which I wouldn't even say is oncoming, I would say it's here. I'd say we're already living in it. It's not something that's going to happen in the future. It's something that's happening in the present. You know, people talk about it as something they're trying to avoid from happening. What makes people think it's not already happening? The negative aspect of the external expression of natural law is control, what I call external monarchy, one external ruler, the concentration of illusory power, okay, in the hands of institutions like government. Control is the pathway to all forms of evil and destruction. It results when a society lives in direct opposition to natural law. The fifth and final expression for natural law, how it operates in our lives, is what I call the manifestation, or the result that we create. So, again, here's the foundation for that little four-part building, right? Here's the first block, knowledge or lack thereof. Here's the second block, understanding or lack thereof. Here's the third block, wisdom or lack thereof, which is why we're in a society that's completely based in control because we're drowning in knowledge and having a, a, a lick of wisdom, you know, or very, very little, I should say. Certainly not enough to go around, okay? Uh, that's the action stage or the wisdom stage, what happens externally, right? This is that top block. Remember the top white block that sat on top? We had the uh, blue block at the bottom, then the red, then the green, and then the white block. This was the manifestation, the result that we create. Remember what I, little question I put on the top of that white block? Who can tell me what it was? The manifestation. No. The manifestation was either order or chaos. What do we ultimately create? So the positive manifestation is order. Or what we would call all the things we say we want. Manifested goodness. Everything being okay. Not creating self-inflicted chaos or suffering. This would be we get what we say we want to get. And there's requirements for that, and here they are. There's the requirements. You gotta be in this vibratory energy of consciousness. You have to accept the truth and develop knowledge. You have to have an understanding that you're a sovereign being, and you have to work toward the manifestation of true freedom. Then you'll have all the things you say you want, manifested goodness and order in your life. And that's the only path to it. I'm telling you that's the only path to it. Blanket statement. The, the human mind has a hard time with blanket statements. Has a hard time with always, every, without exception. The ego doesn't want to hear that. 
Again, humanity's greatest fear may be that the truth is absolute. I, th I would say an even greater fear it has is that the truth is singular. That there's no such thing as my truth, your truth, his truth, her truth, their truth. There's just the truth. And whether we align our perceptions to it or not, that's humanity's biggest fear. So this is what I viewed order as being like, okay? We have beings that are actually full of the light and they're working toward a world that is based in freedom, cooperation, knowledge, sovereignty, no control, okay? It's what I call in some of my former presentations cooperative spiritual anarchy, which is the natural condition of humanity. The natural meaning spiritual, natural condition of the human species that has been blocked from manifesting through mind control, indoctrination, fear-based, trauma-based methods. So that's what I call order, the positive manifestation, manifested goodness. It represents everything we say we want, and it only results when there is balance or justice Justice comes about through adherence to natural law. Justice can only be present when truth has been accepted in our lives and our behavior has been brought into harmony with natural law. Cannot manifest any other way. That's the positive manifestation. The negative manifestation is the opposite of order. Chaos. Chaos is manifested evil. I just put this as, you know, Complete disregard for other people, break down, me, me, me first. Knock everybody else down, get what I want. Don't worry about anybody else being hurt. Don't worry about anybody else's freedom. Don't worry, other, don't worry about whether anybody else's rights are being tread all over. Doesn't matter. Let me get mine. Self-preservation is the highest law. Survival is all that matters. Even if I have to step on somebody else to get it, to make that happen. Yeah, it's an animal. That's exactly right, sir. That's exactly correct. That's not a human being. That's an animal. That's how animals in the animal kingdom behave. And again, natural law doesn't work the same way for animals as it does for human beings because they do not have the same capacity for consciousness that a human being has. So let's not start saying that's the natural order. No, it is not. It's the exact antithesis of the natural order. The natural order is just that. Order. It's in the word, it's in the phrase, natural order. What people are describing as the natural order through this utter nonsense concept called social Darwinism is, as I've called it before, psychopathic chaos. <laughs> and break down that word, psychopathology means an illness of the mind. Psychopathy is mental illness. Psyche in Greek means the mind, okay? And patho pathology is an illness, sickness. Psycho psychopaths are mentally ill. And they don't create anything resembling order. All they can create is chaos, which is why they want us to mimic their mindset because they're just bent on hell and destruction. To manifest, and they have to have our complicity and cooperation to make that dynamic happen. Our energy has to be given over to them by our mindset being made like theirs. Otherwise, their worldview can't come into manifestation, which is one of chaos and disorder. The negative manifestation, chaos, or manifested evil is the exact opposite of what we say we want. Chaos results when there is imbalance and injustice, which results whenever there is ignorance of truth and behavior which is in direct opposition to natural law. So that's our chart. And one last thing I want to say about it is that the, the manifestations or the expressions of natural law are what I would call they're, they're unilateral. They don't cross into each other, okay? There's no such thing as, well, I've accepted the truth and I've developed knowledge, so now I'm in a state of confusion. It doesn't work like that, okay? You can't go from ignorance to sovereignty to the understanding that you're sovereign. You cannot cross this er the area of these charts. Once you're here, you can only go here. 
In order to get here, you got to come from here. In order to get here, you got to come from here, 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 and here. You, you don't get there from any of these, you don't get here from anything in this column. You don't get here from anything in this column, okay? Please keep this in mind. These expressions are unilateral, okay? Can, can, no, they cannot be skipped either. Good question. They must proceed in order and in the same column of expression. So you can only get to order through freedom, which comes about through the understanding that we are sovereign, which comes about through taking in knowledge of truth, and which comes about through staying in a vibratory energy of love or higher consciousness, the openness to truth. That's it. Same thing here. We can only create chaos, chaos when our society is bent on control, okay? Because we are confused beings that don't understand our sovereignty and think other people can legitimately own us or rule us, and that comes from a place of ignorance or refusal of the truth, which is based in fear. Can only manifest that way. Blanket statement, too. And I will not retract on that blanket statement because this has nothing to do with what I think or feel or my beliefs. This is how laws operate in creation. Not a belief system not a religion, has absolutely nothing to do. I, I did not develop this. I came to an understanding of it by seeking truth. I'm telling you, this is not my information, never has been my information, never will be my information. There's no copyright on it. I don't claim it. It's eternal truths that have existed forever and will exist forever, whether human beings are here or not. Take it and share it freely and widely to anybody that's capable of comprehending it because it's the only way we're going to get out of this mess. Okay? Those are the expressions of natural law. Now, when I say living in harmony with natural law or living in opposition to natural law, what do I really mean? Well, what this has to do with is knowledge. And we're going to keep going back to this trend. This thread is not going away. Okay? And guess what? Every time I, I, I teach any of this stuff, whenever there's the new age community around or present, okay, and you'll encounter them from time to time, they'll insist, they'll even see the word. It's like I, you can tell knowledge is becoming a bad word to these people. No. When you say K-N-O-W, no, it's almost like they immediately have an avulsion, <laughs> a extreme negative reaction, and it is fear. But it's mind control, moreover, because they ha are being fed this poisonous untruth that there's not really any such thing as knowledge and that knowledge is not the way out of this prison. And I'm telling you, it goes hand in hand with religious traditions because they want you to externalize your power, externalize everything. And I'm not telling you, don't, I'm not saying don't have a model for behavior, and okay, this person, Buddha pattern, you want to pattern your behavior on the Buddha's life? Great. Live the great life. You want to pattern your behavior on the life of Christ? Whatever. And again, I'm not getting into this discussion here today about the actual historicity of the man Jesus, regardless of what you believe regarding that. I understand I could write books on astrotheology, okay? I, I understand that, that being may never have existed in the way a lot of people believe he did. So what? Whether Siddhartha Gautama existed in the form of a man or not, or whether that's an allegory, who cares? Understand the, the spiritual teachings they were trying to convey to humanity and then apply them in your life. Live by the, that, that ethic, that code, and great, okay? And believe, have whatever religious notion you want, okay? What I'm saying is what this religion called the New Age movement and what many uh, uh, official um, organized regional religions, okay, do, is they try to take the emphasis off knowledge. Because again, if you're not seeking truth and trying to develop knowledge, that's how this information remains occult. And that's how the control system stays in place. They want you to externalize your power to a deity or a guru. Once you do that, you're, 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 you're accepting your chains. You're saying, I have no power. Let me tell you something, folks. I'm not powerless. I am full of power. 
Why? Because I have knowledge of how things actually work. Nobody can tell me that I'm owned by somebody else and can get me to believe it because I have understanding of my sovereignty. If they can take that away from you by getting you to de-emphasize the importance of knowledge, of self-knowledge, they own you. That's when you're owned at that point. Okay? Knowledge is the way out of this. Knowledge, understanding, and then converting that to true wisdom through actions. Not believing in something, not accepting everything, not waiting on somebody to come down and save you, whether it be Zoroaster or uh, the aliens from Zeta Reticuli or Ashtar Command or Jesus Christ. Okay? You keep waiting on an external savior, you're going to be waiting in your chains forever. The knowledge of truth is what the Christ figure himself proclaimed would be the pathway to true freedom. Now, whether you put any emphasis on even exoteric Christianity, I'm telling you, that's the core of all the mystery traditions, is that until you take in the light, you'll never dispel the darkness. And the light is knowledge of truth. That's what it has always been symbolized as and represented as. Okay, Knowledge is the answer. And here's what the biggest piece of knowledge that comprises natural law needs to be understood. There is a difference. It is a 100% completely polarized antithesis. These are diametric opposites that exist in nature. These concepts, right and wrong, do not exist as constructs within the human mind. Anybody who believes that is thrown completely off the path. They are, they are engaged in Satanism. Let me just say it just openly right out in, in, in a way that is completely unambiguous. If you believe there's no real difference between these things and that they do not exist in nature, you are accepting Satanism. It's a satanic belief system that comes directly from dark occultism. And once again, you could say whatever you want about believing that or not. I was a priest within this religion. So if you go up to a Jewish rabbi and you, you would expect you, he would have some knowledge of the Judaic tradition, would you not? If you went up to a Catholic priest, you would say, well, he has some knowledge of Catholicism and how it expresses the Christian tradition, would you not? If you go up to an uh, Islamic, uh, um, uh, what do they call them? Uh, uh, yeah, right. You know, would you expect that, that this uh, practitioner of his religion, who's in, a, in the priest class of his religion, would have some knowledge of Islam? Well, I'm telling you, I was a priest in Satanism. And I'm telling you, the concept of moral relativism is satanic belief. It is satanic ideology. It's one of their, te it's their second tenet. They have four pillars. The four pillars of Satanism are self-preservation is the highest aspiration and nothing comes above it. The second tenet is there is no such thing as the, the objective difference between right and wrong. Right is what's good for me. Wrong is what's bad for me personally. And that's it. And I get, to, I get to make that up based on my likes, preferences, and whims. Okay? The third tenet is social Darwinism, which is an extension of macrobiological Darwinian theory. Okay? Social Darwinism, an oligarchy or a ruling class gets to direct the herd because we know better. And it's just our right to do so because our intellect makes us superior. And the fourth pillar is eugenics. Since we are ultimately God, since we decide what's real and what's not real, and we give that perception to the rest of the herd, and we get to decide what's right and wrong, well, we're God here. And therefore, we get to decide who lives and who dies. You, that's the four pillars of Satanism. And you know how many people believe that nonsense? A whole lot. Way more than people in the priest class of this religion, because they are propagating these tenets everywhere in human society. So many people are Satanists and do not even know that they are Satanists. It is a secret, infectious ideology. And I'll, I'll tell you a personal anecdote real quick. And I'll tell you who it is now, because I don't care anymore. 
my own grandmother. All right, let's make it personal. All right, okay, and I hope she sees it. My own grandmother, who it was, I believe was in her late 70s or maybe early 80s at the time, okay? Uh, I think she's in her mid-80s now, and I don't speak to her anymore. Um, uh, I took a, I took a uh, printed sheet of paper that I printed out of my printer, printed it out of a laser printer, and I put a little piece of white tape. I taped a piece of white paper over the heading, the title of the document, and I asked her to read this. It had four paragraphs, right? And the paragraphs described each of the tenets of Satanism very briefly. Self-preservation is the highest law, etc., etc. Moral relativism is what we believe in. Social Darwinism is what we believe in. And we believe in eugenics. Okay? She said to me, well, I pretty much agree with everything that's written there. And I said, you do? And she said, yeah, that's how I think. I don't see anything really wrong with it or bad with it. I said, okay. I said, peel that little strip of paper off that I've taped to the top. I want you to see what the document's called. And on top it said, the tenets of modern Satanism. And you know what her response was? Well, then I guess that makes me a Satanist, doesn't it? Not horrified. Not, oh my God, what, do, what is my belief system? What do I believe in? No. Well, guess that makes me a Satanist, doesn't it? As if it was just no big thing. And you know what? You know how many people were in that mindset? Hundreds of millions, if not billions, and don't even understand what it is. Because they think Satanism is something that it is not. They don't understand what the ideology of Satanism is. They, under, they think you have to be associated with the trappings of Satanism, okay? That you have to dress like, the, as if there's such a thing as dressing like a Satanist. Or you have to have certain things on your walls in your house or in your garage if you're a Satanist. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. Satanists are the owners of banks. They own hospitals. They own schools. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> Certainly that university right across the road. <laughs> and many people ascribe to this religion in their thoughts, emotions, and actions and do not even understand it because they don't even understand what that belief system is about. They don't understand what that ideology is. They don't know its tenets. So, again, going back to this, if you don't know that there is an objective, meaning in nature difference, okay, between right and wrong. That is a satanic belief system. Morality, it's not right versus left. It's about right versus wrong. This whole left-right paradigm that people are, oh, you fall in with, with the left, with the Democrats or the right, the Republicans has nothing to do with any of that. It's a false paradigm. The, the thing that all of that's a distraction for not getting you to pay attention to and understand is the difference, the real, true, and objective difference between right and wrong. And we're going to explore what that is because it can be known. It can be known, and most people will be shocked and horrified to understand the real differences between right and wrong because they'll have to look into themselves and recognize in many ways that they are cooperating with wrong and that they don't really truly know the difference between right and wrong. When you tell people this, I'm telling you, I told this to somebody in a bar once, which was a big mistake of even trying to bring up this, this discussion in that environment. But occasionally I even, you know, make asinine mistakes like that and think I'm going to be talking to even a semi-conscious being when you're talking to a block, okay? So I said, you understand what actual morality is, is true common sense. We're going to look at that term, common sense, and explore what it really means. And she said, so what you're saying is if I think that there's no really objective right and wrong, that I don't have common sense. And I said, yes, that's what it, no. I said, that's not what I think. I'm trying to explain to you that's what it means by definition, not by what I think. The definition of common sense is to truly know the difference between right and wrong. 
And I said, you're, uh, because I say that you are, are not fully in that state of awareness, don't even take it personally because m billions of people on the earth are in that same state of awareness. You're, you're not special and it's not a, a personal attack against you. And I thought this person was going to throw a glass at me. <laughs> I literally got so enraged because she's associating the concept of common sense with that you are functional and can adequately perform the daily activities of living. And that's not what I'm talking about as common sense, okay? Having common sense about, oh, uh, I can eat, prepare my meals and eat for myself and wash my own clothes and, you know, go to work. That's not what I'm talking about as common sense. That's your every man's definition or connotation of common sense. We're going to talk about what common sense really is. Okay, a deep understanding of morality, which are the principles concerning the distinction between right and wrong behavior, lies at the very heart of natural law. This is the essence of it, folks, right here. And here's the difference between right and wrong, in a nutshell, about as simply as I am capable of describing it. All right? Now, we use the words correct or to right to mean correct and moral. When you say, okay, what's five plus five? It's 10. You're right. Meaning you are correct. That is true. That is the correct answer. That is right. Okay. And then we say, was, was, uh, stealing from, was stealing that money from Jim? Was that, was that right to mean, was it a moral behavior? So now, wh why would we use the same word, again, like the ancient Romans used the same word, book and free, okay, the, the, those two different concepts were represented by the same word, liber, right? And there's a reason, because reading will put you on the path to true freedom if you read the right books, okay? Why would in English, in the English language, we not really, we have other words to mean the same concepts, but the word right means two things simultaneously. It means both correct and it means moral. There's a reason. Because they mean the same thing. Correct is moral. Correct meaning that is, it is in alignment with that which is true. Means, literally, by definition, if it is true, then it is moral. The more you are following something that is false, that is not based in truth, the more you are going down the path of immorality, of wrongdoing. So we have to come to know what is true regarding right and wrong if we are going to be able to correctly, with wisdom, choose between these two modalities of behavior. So right, again, it means both correct which is based in truth and moral, which means that the action, if taken, if acted upon, is in harmony with natural law. Actions based in it do not result in harm to other sentient beings. That's the definition of right. Now look at how simple that, that definition is. And, and think about it for a moment. We're talking about what is a right, meaning what do you have a right to do? And what you have a right to do is no different than what I have a right to do. What I'm telling you here is every single human being on this planet has the exact same rights. Not one person has one more right than another being. Not one person has one less right than another being. To think that anybody has more or less rights anywhere on the earth at any time in history is a fallacy. It is a lie. It is a deception. It is wrong. It is not correct. It is not based in truth. Rights are universal and the exact same for every human being. Blanket statement, absolute truth. Let the ego chew on it and deal with it. Okay? And again, the ego will have a hard time with this in many cases, with many people. They'll hear that and they'll want to throw a glass at me. So, look at the definition again. A right, 
So when you, when you make a definition, right, this is a noun, right? Noun's a person, place, or thing in the English language. We're talking about a noun here. You look up the word right, it's a noun, meaning a right. A right that we have to enact, to take, is an action. You have to start a definition with the same type of word. You, you're defining a noun, you gotta give it a noun to start the definition. A right is an action. Most people will never even be able to tell you that. Just say, can you define what a right is to me? They will not give you this noun. A right is an action. So is a wrong an action. A right is an action that if you take it, it does not cause harm to other sentient beings. That's the simple and easiest definition that anybody can give for what a right is. And I guarantee you, you go and engage as many people as you want on the street. I have not asked this question and had anybody raise, ever raise their hand or even contact me later and say, you go up to somebody on the street and ask them if they can define what a right is. Nobody can give you the correct definition for what a right is. Now, if you don't know what the definition of a right is, you certainly don't know whether you're choosing accurately between a right and a wrong, between right and wrong behavior. You can't. It's not possible. So, so many people believe that they're allowed and they can do actions with no consequence that actually aren't in alignment with natural law because the taking of those actions do result in harm. And they don't really even understand that. So let's look at what a wrong is. We're going to deeply look into what a wrong is. We're going to focus on what wrongs are. Because in reality, to even start this, right, what have we based this definition on? Actions based in it do not result in harm, right? That's the negative of another definition. Well, it's the negative of this definition. So you can only actually define a right by knowing what a wrong is. A right technically cannot be defined outside of the negative. A right can only be defined apophatically, meaning understanding what a wrong is and then stating that it is anything that falls outside of the parameters of wrongdoing. Okay, and we're going to get to what those parameters are. All right? So, I'm sorry, I, I want to focus on wrong for a moment. Okay? Wrong, again, we say this, what's five plus five? Nine. Wrong, it's not true. Incorrect. Incorrect answer. It's not based in truth. We use the term wrong to mean both incorrect and immoral. Well, that was wrong what you did to that person by hitting him for no reason. You didn't have the right to do that. Immoral means in opposition to natural law. Because actions that are based in it result in harm to other sentient beings. That's the simple definition of a wrong. Now, we can go, we can go deeper into the definition of what a wrong is and look at different types of wrongs, which is what I'm going to do in a moment. So this is the concept that is referred to as apophatic inquiry. Very, very critical to understand concept. And you have to apply this concept. What this essentially is, is it's a filtration process. This is the process of the, the, the middle process in the trivium. Okay? It's, it's weeding through the inconsistencies and saying, well, is this inconsistent? Is this inconsistent? Is that not true? And you're, you're, you're setting those behaviors aside and you're saying, here's the behaviors that are wrong. Don't engage in those behaviors. It's negative. It's a negative process. It's a destructive process. You're taking away from the body of everything that can be done and you're saying, I'm pulling all of these out through a weeding down process and saying, these are all inconsistent with truth. It's called apophysis apophatic inquiry, and that is to be delineated from what's known as cataphatic inquiry. Cataphatic inquiry means you're reasoning in the affirmative, and you're not trying to weed down through a, um, a, a process of elimination to get to the truth. Okay, So cata cataphysis or cataphatic inquiry would be equivalent to inductive reasoning, whereas apophatic inquiry or apophysis would be akin to deductive reasoning, all right? Rights are most easily understood when they are considered through apophatic inquiry or what is known as the process of apophysis. 
This process helps us to understand what a right actually is by understanding actions that are, which actions are not rights because they cause harm to others. They are the cause of harm. Here's what apophysis is. It's been called apophatic inquiry. Okay, really look this up. Understand what apophysis is because it's part of the trivium process. All right, it comes from the Greek noun apophysis, written there in Greek script, which comes from the Greek verb apophanai. Okay, so apo in Greek means away from or the negation of, and uh, phanai in Greek means to say or to speak. So when we put them together, it means to say no or not to say, or to say what something is not, in other words. That's what apophysis is. You're saying this is not this. It's the opposite of that, okay? So it is a method of logical reasoning or deductive reasoning that is employed when you are given a limited set of possibilities in order to arrive at knowledge, arrive at knowledge, by way of the exclusion of known negatives. You're setting the logical inconsistencies to the side and saying, this is not what this thing is. That's called apophysis, okay? You are describing what something is by explaining what it is not. This is called affirmation through negation, is another term that this truth discovery process is known as, okay? So, what we're going to do is apophysis. We're going to do apophatic inquiry regarding right and wrong. So, what is not a right? What are ways that people can cause harm to other people or animals? Ways that we can cause harm to other sentient beings. One of the first thing, so what we're doing here is we're going to list the boundary conditions for natural law here, for breaking natural law. If we take these actions, we are breaking natural law because the action is a cause which results in the effect of harm to another being. All right? So these are what are simply, I call them the natural law transgressions, which means sins or wrongdoings. They're simply harmful actions that a person is capable of taking to another being, against another being. That's all. So, of course, many people will get the first one. What's one of the main horrible wrong things that somebody can do to another person? Kill them. Murder them. Take their life. Okay? Murder. And, and I would distinguish murder from killing as well. Because occasionally, to defend oneself, killing may be necessary. But murder is always immoral and wrong. Okay? See, the fifth commandment in Hebrew... Do you know what it says in Hebrew? It does not say thou shalt not kill. The term for murder in Hebrew is tirzach. The fifth commandment in Hebrew is lo tirzach, which means do not murder. Murder as a verb in Hebrew is a completely different word and a totally different connotation than the verb to kill. Because what they're saying is don't take life without any right to take it, meaning that you initiated the violence, and that's what murder is. It's the initiation of the taking of somebody else's life when you have absolutely no right to take that life. Now, if someone is coming after you, your rights, there may be times when you do have to take defensive action uh, and forceful action up to and including deadly force. We're going to talk about that later. But murder is the first natural law transgression. And if you want to go down to a subsection of this transgression, you could list it as a totally separate wrongdoing. I'm keeping it in the same basic category. Assault, meaning you're directly physically accosting without right the well-being, the bodily well-being of another being is also, it's like it would be you could consider it attempted murder. Because assault is something that you do without right. If someone assaults somebody, they have no right to commit assault. Never exists. The right to commit assault does not exist. The right to commit murder does not exist in any circumstance ever. Blanket statement. The right to defend oneself through physical force exists 
and possibly in certain circumstances, the right to kill exists. But murder and assault can never be rights because they always are done by being initiated without the right to do so. It is the initiation of violence. All right? Rape is the second natural law transgression. Okay? You're coercing the free will of another person and making them sexually associate with whom they wish not to. That's rape. And it's always wrong. Blanket statement. All right? The third natural law transgression is theft. It is the taking of property that does not belong to you. Someone else, you know, got that, that property through lawful means without hurting somebody else. That's their property for as long as they are using it and being responsible for it. And you don't have a right to just take what doesn't belong to you. Nobody has a right to take my projector or my remote control or my computer any more than I would have the right to take Richard's cameras. Okay? That would be theft of somebody else's property. It's not mine. And this is the problem. We don't understand property. As we're going to get to, all rights are property rights. We'll get to that in a moment. That's the third natural law transgression. The fourth is trespass. And that means going into somebody else's lair that they are using, that they own lawfully and that they're responsible for, without their permission or consent, and you're just invading their, their privacy and their space, and you're taking their security away from them in that process. And we do have a right to set aside a place for ourselves for our own lair. Okay, And to, to violate that is to trespass against somebody else in, in their own property. The fifth and last natural law transgression is coercion. This is forcing somebody through the threat of violence to have their will comply with your will, whether they don't wish that to be the case or not. Making somebody do something that is against their will. Coercing them. And that's also not a right. Now, that's a small list. Very small list, right? We could add one more. We could add lying. Lying is also a wrongdoing. Okay? And I would consider that a theft of truth or a withholding of truth that somebody needs to understand to make accurate and informed decisions, lying to them. Okay? But essentially, these five are the overarching natural law transgressions. I challenge anybody to come up with a wrongdoing that doesn't fit into one of these categories. So far, I've never had one person able to do it. Any wrongdoing, any action that you could think of that doesn't fall into one of these wrongdoings. <laughs> yep. It, 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 I would probably categorize it as pure ignorance, but, uh, you know, I would say, hey, maybe, maybe you could look at it like that because that's propagating the slavery system indirectly. So, you know, you're actually, uh, you're not doing anything to help anybody else's freedom, certainly. I don't know if I would categorize that as a natural law transgression because, it, you know, it's, uh, it's giving consent and propping up that system. It's not technically what I would call an action, but um, it's more of like giving consent. Hey, you could say that is a wrongdoing, I guess, because you, giving your consent is tacitly saying yes to control, and that's ultimately affecting everybody else's freedom negatively. So, you know, possibly. Um, uh, but in general, what I would say is, uh, if you could think of an actual physical action that doesn't fall into one of those categories, let me know, because that's a pretty comprehensive list, and it's only like, you know, six words. So, uh, now, what if I told you I could narrow it down? What if I told you I can get rid of five of those words and take it down to one, okay? These are the wrongdoings. Let's try to narrow it down, right? Okay? Every harmful action that a human being is capable of taking is a form of theft. Now, many people will hear that for the first time. I've never heard that said. There is no action that you can take that causes harm to another person that is not a form of theft in some form or fashion. I challenge anybody to come up with an action that isn't a form of theft, uh, that is a, a, that an action that is a wrongdoing that isn't a form of theft. You won't be able to do it. I put that challenge out on my, on my podcast. Say, email me if you know. You know, no, not one person. The only person, one person challenged it and tried to say, uh, lying. I say, okay, it's, it, that's really taking the truth from somebody, thieving truth. And whether you want to look at it as you're, you're simply 
dissuading them from looking at the truth too, deceiving them or not offering correct information, still you're taking away their ability to, take, to make correct judgments based on the availability of information. So it is a form of theft. Some form of property. Now look at that word. Property. Proper. Meaning right. Is always being stolen when a wrongdoing is committed. All rights are property rights. All wrongs are theft of property. Once again, I challenge anybody. It's an open challenge. If you can find me a right that is not a property right or a wrong that is not the theft of some form of property, please do it. Please let me know. Okay? Life is a form of property. So taking life you had no right to take, murder is stealing property that wasn't your own because that was that person's life, possessive. They own it. And I didn't have a right to just go and take it for no reason. Rights are a form of property, meaning actions that you may do because they are in harmony with natural law and do not cause harm to others. I don't have a right to stop you from taking. If you're not harming somebody else, nobody has a right to stop you from taking a right, taking an action. You may perform any action which does not directly result in harm to somebody else. Okay? Rights are a form of property. Freedom is a form of property. Somebody doesn't have a right to take somebody else's freedom and hold them against their will just because they don't like what they're doing. They have a distaste for what they're doing or they want to, them to comply with their behavior, with their commands, okay? They want them to make their behavior comply with commands that they're being given. So if you really break it down, let's look at the wrongdoings once again. Murder, is that not the taking of somebody else's life? Assault is the taking of their right to remain unharmed in their person. You're taking their health if you assault them, right? Their homeostasis in their body is, being, is put, being put under assault, and that's robbery. That's somebody taking something that isn't theirs to take. Rape, you're taking somebody else's free will to sexually associate with whom they choose to sexually associate, and therefore that's a property theft because that's their property, their free will. Theft itself sa says it right there. You're taking physical possessions that aren't yours to take from somebody else. Stealing. Trespass. You are taking someone's security in their own lair, as we talked about, which you don't have a right to take. That's also their property. Coercion. What are you taking? Somebody else's free will, which isn't yours to take. That's a gift from the Creator, which belongs to each individual. And if somebody's coercing somebody by telling them, you must do this because I said so, and if you don't do this, I will come and do some form of harm to you, that's not a right. That's a wrongdoing, coercion. And it's a form of theft. Exactly. Sure. You must buy this. Imagine this. Great. We're going to take five more minutes, and then we're going to take a hour, uh, an hour and 15-minute break. So all of these things are forms of wrongdoing. And they're all ultimately one wrongdoing in different forms. They are all theft, every one of them. There is only one wrongdoing. There's only one way anybody can wrong anybody else. Stealing. That's it. Every form of wrongdoing is a form of theft against another being and their property. A living being or their property must have been harmed in order for a violation of natural law or wrongdoing to have taken place. Any action which does not cause such harm is a right. There's the apophatic definition of a right through understanding what a wrongdoing is. And I'm telling you, billions of people, not millions, not hundreds of millions, billions of people on this planet do not know this, could not tell you this, because this is it. This is it, folks, right here. This is the crux of natural law. What is a right? What is a wrong? And I was laying, I couldn't sleep last night. After we got home, and I never have problems sleeping, ever, ever. I'm just going to tell you this before we break. I was laying in bed last night before we went, I went to sleep for the night could not sleep because all I was thinking of is how 
preposterous. I told, I told this to some people at lunch. I'm just sitting there thinking about how preposterous and ridiculous it is for me to even ever have to utter any of this. The fact that this is not 100% pure common sense knowledge on the earth is so abominably preposterous to me that all I was sitting there thinking is, how could I be going out and explaining this to people? This is what I must do? Me, though. And I, I, I was almost, it was almost like schizophrenic in a way. Because I was just thinking, th I was waking up and then falling back to sleep and waking up thinking, where am I? Why am I here? And I, I'm the person who's coming out and doing this. And it's just so absurd and ridiculous to me. Some punk from South Philadelphia taking in the knowledge of the mystery traditions and teaching them to people. Me. It's, it's the most ridiculous thing. I, I can't even imagine it, you know? I still can't. I can't imagine that it's necessary, you know? That that's the position that our society is in. It's so profoundly sad that, I, you know, I can't believe it. And unless we deeply start to understand this and propagate this knowledge to other people, things are going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And there's no reason for it. There's no reason to go down that path. We want to choose the way of maximum pain because we don't want to give up thoughts that we're addicted to just because the pattern has been there for as long as we can remember. We would rather go down the path to the grave and the abyss rather than admit we were wrong and just say, I need to give up this negative way of thinking. You know? I'm going to leave it right there and just say, the bottom line to what this section comes down to is if someone hasn't been harmed, no wrongdoing has been committed. No victim, no crime, in other words. Many people insist, oh, there doesn't have to be a victim for there to be a crime committed. You know how many people are rotting away in a jail cell right now as we speak who have never harmed another living being? You know how many people? Tens of thousands. Okay? And there, there, no, no one has any right to hold them. Unless you've harmed somebody else, nobody has a right to stop you from continuing to take the action that you are taking. Okay? We're going to talk about some of those things in the last section. So let's take a, an hour and 15 minute break and we'll be back here at about 520. Okay, so we ended uh, before the dinner break. I hope everyone enjoyed their dinner. At um, uh, the concept that if there is no victim, if no actual wrongdoing has taken place, resulting in harm to someone else, there is no crime. And many people are, you know, being jailed for victimless crimes that they've actually never actually uh, harmed another being, and yet their freedom has been taken away. Another aspect about this uh, concept of the difference between right and wrong behavior is we have to understand that there is no such thing as the ability to delegate a wrong to someone else. No one can say to someone, you may harm him, un unchallenged or unaccosted, okay? That you're allowed to do that morally, okay? No more than anybody can say a group of people may commit a wrongdoing, and they have the moral right to commit it, to commit that wrongdoing. There's no such thing as that, okay? So this is what many people who believe in things like government believe in, that we can delegate to a group of people who are calling themselves a government something that is not a right and agree, all come together and agree upon, they now possess this right. Rights can't be granted by human beings to other human beings. Everybody is born with the same rights because rights don't come from human beings. Rights, like the laws of nature, come from the creator of the universe. They don't come from human beings. Human beings don't make up what right and wrong are. Right and wrong are inherent to creation and are up to us to discover and recognize what they are and then live in accordance with those principles. So if a specific action is not a right for any individual, that action cannot be, quote, delegated, granted, or licensed to any other individual or group and magically called a right. It does not become a right. 
If it's wrong, it, stay, it remains a wrong, no matter how many people believe they can do it or delegate it or otherwise. Similarly, a right can't be turned into a wrong. If it's a right and you're not harming somebody by doing it, somebody can't magically say, well, that's a wrong and you're not allowed to do that. And yet we have things that go right hand in hand with that and it's called government. Uh, an action that is a wrong would forever remain a wrong under natural law. So how do we know what rights are? Uh, part of knowing rights is understand that natural law, the difference between right and wrong, always holds true regardless of a population's belief system. Like natural law being in effect, the difference between right and wrong are not dependent on anybody's belief. They are eternal truths that need to be understood. So this means it does not matter how many people agree that a wrong can be turned into a right or that a right can be turned into a wrong. Such things can never be done in reality. We can believe we can do that and act like that, but in reality it cannot actually be done. A right forever remains a right, a wrong forever remains a wrong. People can only believe that they can claim such reversals and that this will magically make it so. Unfortunately, most human beings erroneously believe that it is morally possible for them to create and delegate rights, quote unquote, which do not exist, or to take away actual rights from people which do exist. They believe we can do that. So when in doubt as to whether an action is or is not in harmony with natural law, the visualization exercise that I always ask people to do is to imagine a scenario of a planet, a world, where there is only two people, where only two people exist on, a, on an entire planet, okay? If the behavior in that circumstance, in that visualized instance, is either a right or a wrong in that instance, it remains a right or a wrong in any size population, regardless of how many people may believe otherwise. Okay, so if a right is a right for one person to do toward another, okay, or if it's a wrong, the action is a wrong for one person to take toward another, population is irrelevant. People will say, well, yeah, if there was a couple of people, that would be okay, but if in a world of seven billion people, we can't let people do that. Well, this has nothing to do with what right and wrong is, you know, as if they're changeable. Let's, um, let's look at this scenario. So there's our world, and there's two people, okay? two well-groomed businessmen, <laughs> and they're, you know, we're going to look at it at an instance. Uh, let's look at taxation, the concept of taxation. Is taxation of any kind a right or a wrong? Is it morally acceptable and justifiable, or is it something that is actually a wrong? So let's look at what taxation really is, and again, we're not going to euphemize. We're going to talk about it straight on. So here's what taxation is. It's not what I believe it is. I'm getting down to the heart of the matter and describing what it actually is. Taxation is the claim that a specific group of people who call themselves government have been given a quote right. They've been delegated a right, okay? We've written down a law and we say the, this people calling themselves the government and the IRS have a right to do this particular action, this activity, okay? This behavior. They've been given a right to confiscate, uh, unwillingly, I might add, an arbitrarily chosen percentage of the product of another individual's labor. Now, let me just start with this, right? If you ask anybody, how many are you going to voluntarily pay more taxes? Nobody will raise their hand. And you say, why not? Well, because I can barely afford to pay the ones I'm paying now, and I don't want to volunteer any more money toward that endeavor. Quite frankly, I want my resources for myself to use as I see fit voluntarily. But if the government then said, well, your taxes are going up by 5%, how many people would pay them? Most people would. Because subconsciously or, or consciously, they recognize this is, they're under coercion. They're actually under duress. They're being told that if they don't give this at the command of the people who are confiscating it, that some for form of violence will be conducted upon them, whether through the form of finding them and saying, we're going to take more of your resources, whether by saying, we're going to throw you in a cage and make you stay there for as long as we say you need to stay there, okay? 
uh, or by actually conducting actual physical harm upon them. So, again, it's we're saying that this quote-unquote right is given to individuals who call themselves government, and then they have the right to confiscate this arbitrarily chosen percentage of the product of another individual's labor. Because that's what money is, okay? Or that that's what, you know, whatever we make through what we, we work, that's the product of our labor. We work and then we get compensated for it. So that's an exchange for labor that we have done. That's our property, because we gave labor in return for that. So this is done whether or not the other agrees to share that product voluntarily. It's not a voluntary process. Coercion is involved. Taxation is enforced by the threat of violence, which is behavior that will result in bodily harm, or imprisonment, which is the taking away of physical freedom of movement. If those from whom the product is being seized attempt to resist this confiscation, this practice is always, quote, justified, and the word justify actually breaks down etymologically. It, it means, the word justify means to create a right. That's what justify actually means. Jus in Latin means right or law. And then uh, faceo, facere means to create or to make. So to justify means to create right, to make a right up and conjure it into existence. So it's always justified or made into a right, quote unquote, by those who claim that such a practice is necessary and required to, quote unquote, uphold the common good. This is the justification offered for the seizure of the product of people's labor involuntarily. Now, if we are honest with ourselves, if we define the concept of slavery, and I think this is a good definition for slavery, would it be fair to say slavery is the involuntary confiscation of 100% of the product of the labor of another human being? Would that be a fair definition? You're saying you're working, I'm going to take whatever you generate as a result of that work that you're doing. It doesn't belong to you, the product of your labor doesn't belong to you, all of it belongs to me. So you work for me, I take everything that you have been able to amass or create through the labor that you have done. I think everybody here would agree that's slavery. That's as good as a definition of slavery as you're probably going to get. I mean, we can come up with some other definitions that involve coercion and physically shackling and keeping people. But if we really are honest with ourselves, what is the purpose of slavery to begin with is to make others work for free and then take all of the product of the labor. That's what slavery was conducted for. Okay? So, if we're defining slavery as the involuntary confiscation of 100% of the product of the labor of another human being, we should be able to clearly see that there is no magical percentage to which we could lower this number that would no longer make it slavery. So I ask people, if, if the person who's saying I'm going to confiscate 100% of your labor and keep it for myself would say, well, I'm going to take 75%. I'll take three quarters, you can keep a quarter of what you've created, would that no longer constitute slavery? And I don't care what you say I'm going to use the 75% for, okay? If you're telling somebody you have no choice, 75% of your labor belongs to me, would that no longer be slavery just because they allow them to keep 25? Okay, let's lower it to 50. Is it still slavery? Okay. Well, what percentage could it possibly be lowered to for it not to be slavery anymore? Zero. Only zero. There is no percentage that it could be lowered to for it not to constitute slavery. And again, if we're being honest with ourselves, many people want to justify this in many ways by saying, oh, it's used for services, services which someone doesn't have a right to refuse. You know, I tell people, hey, if I said to you, I'm a computer technician, you own a computer? Okay, I'm now your computer technician. You're not allowed to refuse my services. Think, just think about that for a moment. You may not refuse that I am now providing the service for your computer to keep it in, in good shape. Okay? First of all, what have I just taken from that gentleman? Right to choose. Right to choose free will. Right there, that's slavery. I don't even have to keep going and say, hey, if you refuse, or you know, if you whether you want or don't want my computer services, I'm now your technician, and I need uh, $200 every year 
uh, I'll come over a couple of times. I don't care whether you're happy with my service or not, okay? And if you don't pay me, I'm coming and taking the computer. Now, is that your, really your property if, if you're living under that kind of duress? Or am I just a violent criminal who's saying, I'm going to steal your stuff if you don't give me what I say? I'm holding you under extortion. That's duress. That's called duress. It means I am threatening violence unto the person unless they conform to my will. And that's what we're all held under. We're held under duress. All forms of tax taxation are duress. It is a master class telling people you have no right to refuse the arbitrarily set confiscation of your labor that I, I deem is going to be necessary for what I say it's necessary for. So how could you possibly claim that your home belongs to you if you're paying something called a property tax? That somebody is saying, for the services we provide in this community, you must pay us this percentage, and if you don't pay it, your house is, is going to be turned over to, to the government. And it's, you know what that's called? There, there's a term for that, okay? When, when a, a society doesn't actually have true private property ownership rights and a higher class of, of, you know, masters actually owns the land and owns the property and only allows the, the, the peasant class to live upon the property for as long as they pay tribute to the master class, who can tell me what system of government that is? That's called feudalism. And that's the, that's the United States government and just about every government on the earth. You live in feudalism. There's no such thing as democracy. There's certainly not a constitutional republic, that's for sure, okay? The state of, the de facto state of government, which means indeed in action, is feudalism. And feudalism is just another euphemism. It's a euphemism for slavery, okay? Because slaves aren't allowed to own property. Slaves aren't allowed to keep the product of their labor. You know, that's all it really is. If we're being honest with ourselves, once again, there's, there's my catchphrase for this se section, okay? We want to euphemize it, justify it, call it something else, right? I, I said this to that New Age woman at the, at the UFO conference, and she said, again, I prefer not to see it that way. Well, you're not being honest with yourself. You're lying. It's called lying to yourself. That's what cognitive dissonance is. It's called lying to yourself. Okay? So, um, if we're being honest with ourselves, taxation is merely a euphemism for theft, violence, and slavery, the practices upon which it is actually based. And since no individual anywhere on earth has the right to claim ownership of the product of another's labor, such behavior can never be, quote, delegated to a group of people and called a right. Therefore, it follows logically that all forms of taxation, I don't care what they are, excise tax, property tax, you know, gift tax, inheritance tax, income tax, I don't care what form it is, taxes on corporations even, okay? All forms of taxation are always wrong according to natural law because they are all based in the destruction of free will, they are based on coercion, and they are ultimately based upon violence, all of which are wrongdoings all of which are forms of theft, and all of which not one individual has the right to perform upon another. And this is what people want to justify and believe can be magically turned into a right, just because they want to euphemize it and call it taxation. Let's look at another example. Prohibition, one of my favorite, it's one of my pet peeves, okay? You know, I'm big into health, into eating right, okay? I, I'm huge into juicing. You know, it's one of my favorite things to do. Um, purification of the body is part of purification of the mind. All right? But I'm going to tell you, I'm 100% for anybody being allowed to put anything into their body because they own their body. If I want to chew up, break up this remote control in little pieces and eat it, with a, a, a sprinkling of pepper, then that's my right to do so, regardless of what the chips may do to my intestinal tract, okay? There's a reason I have the right to eat this remote if I want to. You want to know why? My body is my property. It belongs to me. Now, we did this in the natural law seminar. We asked people, do you own your own body? 
Almost every single student in the seminar, now of course they immediately answered yes, I own my own body. The students grasped this, okay? The people they were asking the questions to, okay? Because the students were doing the, the, the tabulation of, you know, uh, uh, accumulating the answers from people that they asked the questions to. And they, one of the questions I asked them to ask people is, do you own your own body? Almost every student in my first natural law seminar, when they asked people if they owned their own body, they came back to the next class and almost every student said, almost everybody they asked that question to paused for a long time and thought about it. Had to sit and think about this question could not immediately spit out, absolutely, my body is my property. And you know, because I think people want to overthink things and say, well, am I going to own my body forever? I'm going to die one day. Does that mean I don't own it now? You know, what's the over-intellectualization and mystification of this concept? I tell people, I recognize fully I'm going to die one day and this flesh is going to crumble and pass in, into the earth, okay? Does that mean I don't own my body right now? I'm using my body right now. That's why I own it, specifically. <laughs> specifically because my consciousness inhabits this body and I'm using it as the vehicle for the expression of my consciousness is the very reason I own my body, okay? And people can't spit that out. It's, it's like unfathomable to me. The ridiculousness of some of this, that the human mind could be worked into the situation that it has been, is, is, is almost incomprehensible. So let's go forward with prohibition, okay? It's the claim that a group of people who call themselves government have been given the right to pre prevent others from putting any given substance into their own bodies, and if others refuse to comply with those terms, that they will be fined or imprisoned. And um, it should be self-evident that if an individual's body is actually their own property, and it is, then then that individual always maintains the natural right to decide what will or will not be put into their property, which is their body. Why can you put what you want into your car or your home? Because you own it. It's your property. Okay? Uh, technically, it should be. I mean, you know, technically it isn't really. But the, my whole point is nobody else can tell, no other individual can tell you what you can and can't put into your home. Okay? You know? You know, could I tell you, hey, I, I don't want you putting uh, that jacket in your car. You're not allowed to put it in there. Well, who am I to tell you you're not allowed to put that in there? It's your property, okay? So why would we accept that, we'd not accept that, but we would accept I can't put something in my own body that I deem that I want in it, okay? Because people can't separate the act of imbibing the substance or, or putting the substance into the body, okay, from the action that people may subsequently take. And they're two different things. So somebody might go out and want to get smashed tonight and do a bunch of drinking. But if you then go out on the street and start clubbing somebody with the nearest available blunt object, you don't have a right to do that. You had a right to go drinking, okay, any more than you would have a right to go snort some cocaine or bang some heroin into your arm, okay? I don't think those two things are particularly good ideas, but I support your right to do it. But hey, if after you do those things, you go and hurt somebody else, you've got to be held accountable for the actions you just took. That's what personal responsibility is all about. And these two things need to be delineated from each other. We have to clearly be able to separate the act of the right to put something into my body and me still being personally responsible for what I do with my body. Okay? So understanding that this is a claim made to tell people that they're, I'm going to make the decision about what you put into your body. We can easily see this claim of this right to command what will or will not be put into the body of another person. What it actually amounts to is a claim of ownership upon the body of another person. If I'm telling you you can't drink orange juice, I'm making a claim, your body belongs to me because I'm going to decide what goes into it or what does not go into it. Okay? So if I say carrots are off limits for your consumption, sir, and they may not be ingested, I've just made a claim that I own your body. Well, what's the claim on the ownership of another person's body called? Slavery. If we're not euphemizing it, and if we're being honest with ourselves, okay? Prohibition is merely the claim of ownership upon another person's body is called slavery. Therefore, prohibition is merely a euphemism for slavery that is backed by violence, 
regardless of the justifications made by those who claim such practices are, quote, necessary for the common good. That's always the justification. Since no individual anywhere on earth has the right to claim the ownership of another person's body, such behavior can never be delegated to a group and magically termed a right. Therefore, all forms of prohibition are always wrong according to natural law. Doesn't matter what the substance is. Doesn't matter what it is. How destructive it may be to the body or brain. Look, if I, if I want to go under my sink, take some cleaning supplies and make a nice cocktail with some lye and some roach poison and some rat poison, stir it up in, in a water solution and go glug, 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 glug. That's my right. Want to know why? Because I own my body. I own my consciousness and my body, period, the end. So if I want to do that, that's my right to do so. Okay, nobody has a right to tell me what I can and cannot put into my body. Yet we accept this because of these justifications. Oh, it's for the common good. Forget what rights are, you know, it's for the common good. We, we need to accept slavery for the common good. Yeah, yeah, it works out like that. So how about licenses and permits? These are claims that a group of people who call themselves government, and again, we're going back and visualizing. Imagine one person trying to make this claim to another person. Nobody would find it legitimate. Nobody would find that one person may make that claim to another person. Yet we think these other people called government have rights that individuals don't have. That's what we think. That's called mind control. Mind control is getting people to accept some people have rights that other people don't have. That's what it is. You know? So go back to that visualization exercise. Can one person make that claim over another and have it be legitimate? Of course not. So if nobody has that right, how could that right be delegated to somebody else? It can't. Licenses and permits, they're claims that a group of people who call themselves government have been given the right, quote unquote, the right to prevent others from exercising specific behaviors, even if such behaviors cause no harm to others or their property. Unless those others petition, meaning beg, or pay the government for permission. That's what a permit is. It means permission to be allowed to exercise those behaviors. This amounts to the claim that, the, that rights are actually merely privileges that may be granted or revoked by government at any time. Okay? based upon the people in government's preference, their discretion, all right? Remembering that the definition of a right is any action which does not cause harm to another living being or their property, there is no such thing as the right, quote unquote, to stop another person from exercising a right. If, if, if something is a right, meaning it doesn't cause harm, there is no such thing as someone's right to stop you from performing that action, okay? That would be called coercion, which is a wrong, okay? So the actual ingest ingestion of, let's say, marijuana, for example, harms no one else. You can put that into your body, sit there perfectly peacefully, and not cause harm to another living being. That's called a right, for the very specific definition that it caused no harm, okay? I would not have the right to tell another individual, you may not do that action. That would be a wrongdoing. Well, it's the same thing for, for something when it comes to licenses and permits. You're telling people, hey, if you pay me $50, I'll let you smoke that marijuana without doing violence to you, unless I change my mind, and then I won't, I won't give you a permit. I'll just say, hey, you're not allowed to do that. Even something that is a right, like assembling and speaking, like what was done in the state of Pennsylvania a few years ago when the G20 visited it in the city of Pittsburgh, okay? The city telling people, we have revoked the right to assemble and speak and petition for grievances. You don't have the right to come and speak. No protests will be tolerated or we'll hit you with sound and water cannons, you know? And people just laid down and, and accepted it. The whole city of Pittsburgh, you know? Because, oh, we're going to go and ask them for a permit. And they just said no. No, 
You don't have that right anymore. We find you on the street. You're getting blasted with a sound cannon and deafened. Some people are, went permanently deaf. Permanently deaf. Lost their hearing from what happened in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You see the stuff that was, was happening in, um, uh, it wasn't Egypt, um, uh, where they were hitting people with water cannons recently and killing some of them. Uh, it was in the Middle East somewhere. Turkey, correct. You know? Hitting people, some people died. Getting hit in the eye with such pressure it hits the brain. People were dead from water cannons. They call these non-lethal weapons. Because they're telling you, you may not speak. You may not assemble. We're going to revoke that right, really. See, there is no right to stop someone from exercising a pre-existing right. That's, that's you making the claim, I own your rights. That's what that's really doing. That's saying, I'm God. I get to grant what a right is or revoke what a right is at any given time. It's basically what it is. It's the, it's, it's the, it amounts to someone claiming to be God. The claim over the rights of another person is called slavery. Even more so, it is the claim to be God. The claim that the rights of another's, of another flow from you. Therefore, licensing and permits are merely other euphemisms for slavery, regardless of the justifications made by those who claim such practices are, quote, necessary for the common good. Since no individual anywhere on earth, no single individual, has the right to claim the ownership of another person's rights, such behavior can never be delegated to a group and magically called a right. Therefore, all forms of licensing and permits, according to natural law, are always wrongdoings because they are always based in coercion and the theft of someone else's rights. So again, that's the visualization exercise. There's three quick examples. You have to envision there's only two people. Would one person have a right to conduct that action against another? If, if the answer is no, the right cannot be, that, there's no such thing as calling it a right and delegating it to other people and telling them now you're allowed to perform that behavior. It's always a wrongdoing. But people, because of this idea, this mind control called government, want to believe that that right exists, that we can delegate something that is a wrongdoing. Force versus violence. We need to understand that these concepts are complete opposites of each other. They are not the same. The terms should never be used interchangeably with, with each other because not only are they not even remotely similar, they're direct, diametrically opposed opposites. Let's look at the difference. They're often spoken about as if they're the same and they're used interchangeably when in fact they are actually diametrically opposed to each other. Force the definition of force is the capacity to do work or cause physical change in the physical world, okay? For any change to be created in the physical world in any capacity, force must be used and applied. There's nothing you can do that doesn't require force if you're going to make a change happen in the physical, okay? So to set up this equipment, force was required. We had to lift it. We had to set it up. We had to plug in the cables. Force is required to do all those things. It's the capacity to perform physical activity, physical work, okay? Action, force is actually action with which is in harmony with morality and natural law because the taking of it, the usage of it, doesn't violate rights of other people. So as soon as you're stepping over the line into coercive usage of force, that becomes violence. The initiation of force for coercive reasons, for coercive applications, becomes violence. That's what makes it violence. Force itself is not violence. As such, force is action which one always possesses the natural right to take, and this includes the defense, the physical defense of someone's person, their, their body, against the act of violence. Force may be applied in that situation. When you are accosted with violence, you do reserve the right to use physical force defensively against such an assault. Violence, on the other hand, and this is the key to keep in mind with violence, it is the immoral initiation of physical power to coerce, compel, or restrain unrightfully. No one has the right to ever enact violence because violence is always starting it. Initiation, that's the key word there. 
It's the immoral, the unrightful initiation. So, you know, teachers in schools will, you know, if there's a skirmish that happens between a couple of male students one day, they'll say, it doesn't matter who started it. All that matters is who started it. All that matters is who started it. All that matters. Because the person who actually conducted violence is the person who struck first. They initiated the immoral use of physical behavior, of physical force, to coer physical power to coerce, compel, or restrain. Therefore, when the person beats back that physical assault with force, they have not committed an additional wrongdoing. Okay? It's difficult for many people to understand who are in right brain imbalance. They don't want to acknowledge that you maintain the natural right to use force when you are accosted with violent behavior. If someone just came up to me on the street and started swinging, okay, because they want something I have or just because they don't like the look of me for whatever reason, they don't have the right to do that. If I replied by beating back their attack with sufficient force to put that action down, how many wrongdoings would have been committed? One. Correct. One. Not two. One. Because I maintain the right to defend myself with physical power, with physical force when necessary, when violence, meaning someone else, started the immoral behavior. That's what matters, the initiation. Who started it is all that matters. All that matters. And again, it's a very difficult thing for the ego to comprehend. The ego doesn't want to hear that. It's been conditioned so long that responding with force is also violence. We, we are verbally and mentally equating these two things. And when they, in fact, they are actual complete opposites. Okay, if somebody, if, if, if a kid got hit by somebody else in a school, and then that other kid said, maybe even said once, stop what you're doing. And then when the other kid wouldn't stop, he punched him and knocked him out. Okay, I would ask other people, who's, who, who struck first? And if the kid lying on the floor struck first, I'd say, you got what you deserved. That's it. Because that person had a right to defend themselves. You had no right to strike him. You initiated the violence. He responded with defensive force. Many people don't want to hear that. Because they're very conditioned. And I'm not saying you have to do that. You also reserve the right not to do that. But the right does exist. Both things, both rights exist. You would have the right to not respond with physical force, but you would have the right to respond with physical force. See, that's a free will decision that the person has the right to choose between those actions. I don't even look at either one of them as the high road. You know? Personally, I think if somebody keeps beating somebody and keeps conducting violence to them and the other person keeps accepting it and ne never rebels against it and never uses any force to put it down, I almost look at that as the low road. I'm not a pacifist. Not a pacifist. Okay? I am 100% about nonviolence, meaning don't initiate harm to other people. Don't start it. Don't start none, won't be none. In street lingo. That's how, that's how it really is, okay? But if somebody else starts it, they're asking to be put down with uh, the amount of physical force that is required to put down the act of aggression. Violence is coercive action. See, that's the key. It's always coercion, saying you're going to do what I want you to do or then I'm going to strike, then I'm going to commit the act of violence. It's coercive. It's action which is always in opposition to morality and natural law for the very reason that it involves the violation of others' rights. That's why it's called violence. It's a violation. The act of violation caused, it resulted in violence. Your rights have been violated. That's why it's called violence. It's the same root word. Violence is action which one never possesses the right to take, ever. There is no such thing as the right to commit violence. It doesn't exist. Because violence is the immoral initiation of physical power to compel, coerce, restrain, which no one has the right to do. No, you don't have the right. No one does have the right to initiate that type of action. Force, on the other hand, there is a time and a place to exert that force in a defensive capacity. All right, so we'll talk about that here. This 
piece of trash comes up to somebody on the street and says, give me all everything that's valuable. I want your shoes. Oh, they're leather? Take them off. Take the wallet out, all the jewelry. Give me your purse. Give me your wallet. Okay? It's called a thug. Nobody would believe he has the authority or the right to do that, and we would have the moral obligation to obey this criminal. You know? You know, if the criminal started calling himself government, we might start believing him. Right? But let's say, let's say I, uh, somebody on the street saw what was being done, took out their own 9 millimeter and blew this guy away. How many acts of violence were committed? One. One. But, but, but what I understand. But again, that's somebody saying, I prefer not to see it that way. Well, again, perception and reality do not really align in many cases. They're not the same. That person is in, incorrectly perceiving what is. They're not seeing the truth. And many people don't want to hear that that's the truth. Because they're very conditioned and they are very well-behaved slaves. You know, as harsh as that is to say. They don't want to understand that the inherent right to use force against violence exists and is always our right. Always. Now, I'm not telling you go out and immediately do that either because the perception is so screwed up in the body of humanity that the majority of people don't believe that would be a right. And they'll persecute you for doing it. You see, the, the self-defense principle is continuously being eroded. Human beings possess the natural right to defend themselves from violence with defensive physical force. A person who is accosted by violence possesses the right to stop the person who is conducting the violence from continuing to do harm to them with any amount of force that is necessary to stop the attack or the assault, okay, up to and including deadly force. I would say, to, if you want to be nice about it, Give the person one verbal warning to stop. Say no once. After that, it's on. That's it. And that's really my policy. Okay? That would be my policy on the street with an individual. The problem is here, the so-called authorities of the government, like you say, don't want to see it that way, and they're constantly trying to take this right away from somebody. They're constantly trying to say, no, we own the monopoly on the usage of force. And all you may do is wait and be uh, accosted and assaulted until one of us shows up. Well, you know what that's called? It's called a big crock of bullshit <laughs> is what that's called. And it shouldn't be accepted by anyone who has any common sense. It shouldn't be accepted by anyone. Unfortunately, again, like I said, people are very, very well conditioned. And they think that... They think that this is an example of two wrongs don't make a right. There's no two wrongs committed there. There's one wrong committed, and then there's a right that is being exercised. Big difference between exercising a right that involves the defensive use of force and committing a wrongdoing which involves the initiation of violence. And people got to get clear on this. They have to get clear on it. So the question becomes, does violence magically become a right when it's conducted by government? when they shut down people's free speech rights and assembly rights, or when they conduct direct theft from people through what's this euphemized form of slavery called taxation. And like I said, I'm not, I'm not asking you to accept or believe ta taxation is slavery. I'm telling you, if you don't understand that, you're wrong. I don't care what you think. I'm telling you it is that way in truth and in reality. Taxation is slavery. Shutting down a people's rights is slavery. Telling people what they may or may not put in their body is slavery. It's not my perception. That's what is. Okay? And that's what we're accepting as a people. We're accepting that. These people have no more right to do it than any other individual would. And this concept brings us to what my, the way I try to define and explain to people what real spiritual enlightenment is. Because what the New Age community is telling you that an enlightened being looks like is equally as a big crock of bull of what people who don't understand self-defense, the self-defense principle, believe. Okay? Enlightenment is not what this New Age nonsense community is trying to tell people that it is. All right? 
It's not about not taking action and sitting under a tree and meditating until you're magically enlightened. Okay? Enlightenment means knowing what's going on around you. Enlightenment means knowing what's going on within you. Enlightenment means truly knowing the true objective difference between right and wrong and living that in your life on a daily basis. Enlightenment, enlightenment means not aggressing upon your fellow human beings, but not agreeing voluntarily to be aggressed upon by them either. Okay? There's two pillars, two dynamics that go hand in hand with real enlightenment. I call this the two pillars of enlightenment. Okay? So here they are. The first pillar is the sacred feminine principle. This has been called the non-aggression principle. All right? It is the simple, simple law of don't engage in violence or Quite simply put, don't steal. Don't steal. We talked about that. That's what all spiritual law can be boiled down to. Don't steal from other people. Don't take what isn't yours. Don't take life that isn't yours. Don't take property that isn't yours. Don't take rights that aren't yours. They're the property of others. Respect their ownership. Okay? Most people can grasp this pretty readily. Okay? And even in the New Age movement, they grasp this. In, in other words, don't immorally initiate non-rightful use of physical power to coerce, constrain, or compel the rightful physical behavior or free will choice of another sentient being. Respect other people's free will, their rights, their property, their life, period. Real simple. It's the golden rule. Don't do things to other people that you don't want done to you. I always state it in the apophatic, in the negative. It's much more powerful that way. But there is a second principle, a second pillar or tenet of enlightenment, if you will. This is the sacred masculine principle. This is what religions of the world, whether they be government, organized religion of different regions of the world and cultures, the New Age movement, all right, this is what they want, they are seeking to suppress because religions are right brain modalities. They're right brain methods of mind control. Just like government who thinks it's a monopoly on the physical use of force, that's a left brain imbalanced mindset. All right? The second pillar of enlightenment is the sacred masculine principle, which is also known as the self defense principle. Your body's your property, you have a right to defend it when it comes under attack by violence. This principle states sentient beings have the inherent right to use force to defend themselves from violence conducted upon them by another. This is the part many people don't get. You know, that's why we're not rebelling against our slave keepers, our slave masters who are masters of other people in their own sick, distorted, psychopathic minds and are nothing but thugs and criminals that people magically believe have the moral authority to continue to do what they're doing just because they euphemize slavery and call it government now. That's the sacred masculine principle. There is no such thing as an enlightened being that doesn't fully grasp both of these principles anywhere. Never has been. There's no such thing as half measures. You got to get them fully both or you're, you're not there. And that's the problem. We're not all the way there. If people were already there, they wouldn't be tolerating what we're putting up with. More, uh, more aggression against people's rights is being conducted in this country than when the founders of this nation actually separated from England. And they would have been horrified. I tell people, look, to, not to get nasty, but I tell people, if the founders of this country could magically come back to life somehow and see what's going on in this country, they'd take a piss on people. That's what they would do. That's how much disrespect they would have for what we're putting up with. You know? Again, just to, to just say it the way it really is. That's what they would want to do to us. Because they would tell us, we warn you about all this. We warn you about it all. And you know what you did? You ignored it. Ignored it. So what did all those people who died in that revolution die for? We have to understand true ownership, real, deeply, not peripherally, super deeply. 
We got to know what we own and what we don't own. We have to understand why is this our current condition? That's the question we asked at the beginning. And here's the reason. The reason our species to continues to experience a systematic and growing loss of freedom is because we collectively do not deeply understand ownership and we continue to commit and condone theft. This is a prison for thieves. That's what Earth is. It's a prison for people that don't want to respect ownership. They want to take things that aren't theirs. And that's what we're here to learn. We're here to learn that there's only one natural law. Stop stealing from other people. Stop taking things that you don't own. Stop condoning theft of things that other people don't own. Don't condone that activity, that behavior either. So what is ownership? What's the definition? What does it entail? To own a thing means that regarding that thing, an individual maintains three basic things regarding it. The first is rightful possession. It means you acquired it without doing harm to somebody else. So you rightfully own it, lawfully own it. Okay, you're in possession of it. You have it in your possession. It is yours. The second thing is you control its usage. Okay, so your house, you control its usage. Your car, you control its usage. Your clothes, you control their usage. My computer is mine. I control its usage. I'm using it. Okay, control of the usage of something means that you own it. And most of all, Maintaining personal responsibility for that possession is the third aspect of ownership. So to own something means I'm in lawful, rightful possession of it. I control the usage of that thing and I maintain personal responsibility for it. All right? And this is what we have to understand. Natural law can be essentially reduced to one single spiritual law. I gave you the working definition, the soundbite definition before. Here's the super simplified two-word concrescence of all of this information. Natural law gets boiled down to two words. Don't steal. That's it. You want the key out of the prison? You got to understand property. You got to understand all rights are property rights. Stop taking the property of other beings. Stop condoning the taking of the property of other beings. The end. You know, I could just say, I should just get up here and say, don't steal the end, everybody go home. Should be that simple. That's the key, folks. That's the key to the prison door. And what we're really talking about here is common sense. That's what conscience is. People don't think of conscience as common sense. You know, they don't think of conscience as knowledge. Conscience is knowledge. It's not action, it's not behavior, it's knowledge. Again, knowledge is the way out of this, okay? And this is the knowledge that has to be developed. Conscience comes from the Latin prefix con, meaning together, and the Latin verb sciere, meaning to know or to understand. You put them together, to know together, to understand together. Conscience is common sense, common sense knowing, common sense knowledge, literally, from the etymological breakdown of the word. Con together, science to know. That's why the problem is people don't have common sense. That's why I'm sitting there almost laughing hysterically that I need, I need to try to teach common sense to people. The ridiculousness of it. Now, what we all need to be doing is doing that work, you know? I know you guys get a lot of this. We need to start reaching out to other people. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Conscience, the definition of it, is the definitive knowledge of the objective difference between right and wrong according to natural law. Objective. Definitive. Okay, it's not up for debate. It exists inherently and objectively. It can be understood, known, discovered. This is different from action. Conscience is the knowledge. Then we act upon it. Okay? So it's different from understanding something and acting upon it. Right? To have conscience is to have common sense. It's to know the difference between right and wrong and understand that difference deeply. Then we're con going to convert that into action. We exercise conscience. The exercise of conscience is actually action. The exercise of conscience is the free will choice of right action over wrong action 
once the definitive knowledge of the objective difference between right and wrong according to natural law has been acquired and integrated into the being. We acquire that knowledge first, understand it, then we act in either accordance with it or disharmony with it. If we act in accordance with it, it's called the exercise of conscience. That's action. The law of freedom, this is one of the basic laws within the body of natural law. It's real simple. The law of freedom states that freedom and morality are directly proportional. It's a mathematical equation that works 100% of the time flawlessly. As morality increases, freedom increases. As morality declines, freedom declines. This means the more moral a population is, the freer it becomes. The more immoral a population is, the deeper into bondage and slavery it goes. Another way of saying this is to say that the presence of truth and morality in the lives of the people of any given society is always inversely proportional to the presence of tyranny and slavery in that society. The more truth and morality there is, the less tyranny and slavery there is. The less truth and morality there is, the more tyranny and slavery there is. That's the law of freedom. And many people don't want to understand that that these two things are inextricably interwoven and connected and can never be separated from each other. The presence of truth and morality in a society and the presence of freedom or its lack in a society. True freedom can never exist in a society that embraces moral relativism, which is the idea that there is no inherent and objective difference between right and wrong. So that humanity may just arbitrarily create or decide right and wrong for themselves. That's the ideology called moral relativism. As I've said before, it is the second tenet of the satanic religion. And it is deeply entrenched in this country and in, and in the world. In our polls that we conducted, the psychological little uh, tabulations that we did asking several people questions, two-thirds of people were moral relativists. 66%. Think about that. Two out of three people believe there's no such thing as an objective difference between right and wrong and feel these are just constructs that exist in, in he, by human beings and we get to make up what's right and what's wrong. Two-thirds of people. That's where we're at. That's where we're really at. Natural law versus man's law or government. Here's the differences. Natural law is based upon the principles. It's based upon principles and truth meaning things that are inherent to creation are not made by humankind. Natural law can only either be harmonized with due to knowledge and understanding or rejected due to ignorance. So it's not, it's not something that is based on compliance because of we fear the punishment that would result of not understanding it. Okay, If you don't understand it and live according to it, the result is inescapable. Because men and women are not actually creating the result, okay? The universe is bringing that result to us, intelligently and dynamically, all right? In other words, once again, this is about consequences. You behave a certain way, there's certain consequences. You change the behavior, you'll change the consequential results. Natural law is universal, which means that it exists and applies anywhere in the universe regardless of physical location. There is no place you can go in the physical universe to escape natural law. Let me know if you find a way out of this universe and into another where natural law no longer applies, and uh, you know we'll take a look at it together. But until you figure out the way out of this universe and into a place that's not governed by law, you're bound by natural law. Okay? Natural law is eternal. It, it will exist for as long as the universe exists, and it is immutable exists and applies for as long as the universe exists and cannot be changed by anything humanity is capable of doing or any other species in the universe is capable of doing for that matter. Man's law, on the other hand, let's look at how this contrasts with natural law. It's not based on principles and truth. It's based on dogmatic beliefs that are programs that are running in the human mind. 
These are constructs of the mind that operate like programs. Nat uh, man's law is complied with due to the fear of the punishment that will be conducted upon people who attempt to not comply with it. It's most of the only reason people ever comply with the law of man. And that's a very low state of consciousness, fear. That really is only going to get you all the negative things that we say we don't want if we're in that vibration. Man's law differs with location based upon the whim of legislators, like prohibition. Well, I'm allowed to smoke marijuana in one state, and then I could be jailed for it in another. My freedom could be taken if I cross this imaginary line. Hey, I'm, I'm a gun owner, okay? If I, take one, if I take certain weapons that I own across an imaginary line, I could be jailed for years. But over this side of the imaginary line, it's okay. And you're just exercising a right. Hey, over here, it's morally wrong. We'll, we'll cage you for it. Over here, yeah, you're allowed to do that. You can have that high-capacity magazine. But over here, you're going into a cage for it just by crossing an imagine, imaginary barrier called a state border. And people think that makes sense. They think the moral relativism of man's law makes sense. They actually believe something can be moral in one place and immoral in another place. You know? That's cognitive dissonance. That's holding two contradictory notions in the mind simultaneously and accepting them both when they're clear contradictions with each other. It's called lying to yourself. Let's be honest about what it really is. It's called lying to yourself. Man's law changes with time based upon the whim of legislators, which is also moral relativism. Prohibition in the 1920s. Oh, well, it was legal to possess and consume alcohol. Then for years it became illegal to do so. Then it switched back to becoming magically moral again. We won't cage you for doing it. Well, it changes over time based on our preferences and likes and dislikes. Yeah, we get to make up what law is, what right and wrong are. It's called moral relativism, all right? And it's one of the tenets of Satanism. So what does this mean for the law of man, actually? You know, the people seem to have so much respect for, you know? Oh, we're a nation of laws written by men, you know? We don't, we don't give a damn about moral law. We don't really give a damn about what's right and wrong, you know? But we have so much respect for the law of man, which we people actually believe is somehow based in morality when it's n nothing of the kind could be further from the, it's not couldn't get any further from the truth than that it's based in moral relativism which is about the whims of the legislator in any given time or place you, know, you listen to certain forms of music in certain countries in the Middle East you could be jailed for years just by putting a certain song on imagine this no, and we would think that's unacceptable and deplorable. Yeah, we think, you have this 30-round magazine here. This state only allows 10 cartridges to go into a magazine. I bring the physical object, even if it's not loaded with any ammunition, into another state. I can be put in a cage. Physical piece of plastic. You know? It's just total nonsense. Either something's a right, and you're allowed to own it, and you, you need to be responsible for it, or it's not a right, because you're harming somebody. You know, it doesn't get any simpler than that. So what's this all mean for man's law? In light of natural law, what does it mean? To understand natural law, what does that mean for the laws of man here on earth? Well, what it actually means, it's simple if-then logic to apply. If a particular man-made law is in harmony with natural law, then it follows logically that it is redundant. It is stating the obvious. It is stating what is already known. It's like saying... I'm going to write down, yes, during the day, the sky uh, uh, refracts a blue frequency. And it, it, the sky is blue. I'm going to write that down and make it so. Well, it's redundant. It's self-evident. You can go out in the sky and look at the natural color of the sky on a clear day and, and see what the frequency is with your own eyes. No, you don't need to have it written down. Okay? It's a redundancy. It, so if it's in harmony already with natural law, it's stating a truth that is already there. It's an inherent truth. It's pre-existing. It's self-evident. Therefore, the writing down of that concept and calling it a law is irrelevant and unnecessary. Now, look, let's look at the opposite. What if something that man writes down as a law is in direct opposition to natural law? So if a particular man-made law is in opposition to natural law, 
it follows logically that it is both false, meaning that it is incorrect. Okay, that's what natural law is. It's based in truth, that which is. And it's also immoral. Because if it's not based in natural law, it means that it is doing something that is actually harming somebody by taking something from them that doesn't belong to you. Like taxation. Like permits and licensing. Like suspending rights that do already exist, etc. so forth. All right? So, therefore, it's wrong. And it cannot be legitimately binding upon anyone. You can't write down a wrong and say, this is morally binding upon you, even though it, it, it creates harm, it causes harm, yet you must follow it. You know, and people believe this. We asked in the natural law seminar, how many people believe that if a law is passed and it restricts a right that you feel you have naturally because that action that, that it's saying you may not do causes no one else any harm. Do you have any moral obligation to obey that law until you could find a way to get it changed? And over two-thirds of people said, yes, you have a moral obligation to obey that law because these people are, are have the moral right to issue commands and write down laws that constrain you even if that behavior actually doesn't harm anybody and therefore is a natural right, you would still have to try to find a way to get that law changed. Nonsense. Nonsense. No one can be legitimately bound to a dictate of man that prevents somebody from exercising a natural right. It's called mind control, is what it's called. So in light of the differences between man's law and natural law, in light of natural law, man's law is both irrelevant and unnecessary, as it is either redundant, because it is in harmony with natural law, or it is completely immoral, because it is in direct opposition to natural law. This is a system of slavery that is not needed. There is equality under natural law, perfect equality. Everyone has the exact same rights. No one has any more or less rights than anyone else. Also, since rights are not created by humanity, and since they are the birthright of humanity, gifted to us by the creator of the universe, no human being or group of human beings is actually capable, in reality, of granting rights to anyone else, nor is any human being capable of revoking rights from, from anyone else. Everybody has the same rights. No one can make up a new right. No one can grant a, a, a right to somebody that is actually a wrong does not exist, never has existed, never will exist. This is an illusory belief system. All right, I'm not telling you people don't believe that can be done. I'm telling you in reality, in truth, it can never be done. Chris Leispooner uh, phrased it pretty well. He said, government is nothing but men acting in concert. The morality and value of government, like any other association of men, will be no greater and no less than the morality and value of the men comprising it. Since government is nothing but men, its inherent, quote, authority to act is in no way greater or different than the, quote, authority to act of any individuals in isolation, like that example of two people on the planet. Government has no magic powers or, quote, authority that is not possessed by private individuals. Let he who asserts that government may do that which the individual may not do, assume the onus of proof, that means the burden of proof, and demonstrate his contention. And you know what? There's nobody on this planet that can do that. Because when it comes down to it, if you're telling that somebody else they may either commit a wrong against somebody else or prevent someone else from exercising a right. That's a lie. And that does not exist. Not in reality. It exists in a diseased mind is where it exists. Only in a sick mind is where that belief exists. You have to be imbalanced in the mind, in the psyche, to believe that that's true. It's a, it's a mental illness. I mean, that's what it really is. The word government, you break it down. People say this word every day almost, and yet they've never looked at the etymological roots of the word. It comes from the Latin verb gubernare. Once again, no V in classical Latin. No V, okay? 
So again, V's were rendered as either B's or P's in classical Latin language. So the, the, you could write this in what would be more modern Latin as guvernare, with a V. But in classical Latin, or ancient Latin, there is no V, so it would have been rendered with a B, gubernare. Now, what's the election of a governor called? It's called a gubernatorial election, gubernatorial, gubernare is in there, okay? Gubernare means to control. The verb gubernare in Latin means to control. The Latin noun mens, which is where the part, the second part of the word meant is derived from, means mind. Okay? So you put these together, and the word government actually literally, from its etym etymological roots, means to control the mind. Or in other words, mind control. Now, I'm going to put something else up here for a moment. The etymological origin of the English suffix ment, M-E-N-T, is often debated in this etymological breakdown, all right? And I've gotten stuff about this constantly, and I've told people I'm not interested in hear about, hearing about it anymore. I know where this comes from. I know why the creators of the English language made it so, made it like this, okay? It is overwhelmingly clear by people who have studied linguistics and the origins of words, okay, in English from ancient languages, that the creators of the English language deliberately chose the Latin noun mens, meaning mind, to represent or mean in English the state of or the condition of. And this was done in direct keeping with the first principle of natural law, as we've already discussed, the principle of mentalism, which demonstrates that in order for any particular thing, event, or circumstance, any state or condition to exist in manifested reality, it as it currently does, the, which is known as the plane of effects, it must have first existed in the plane of causality or the mental realm, the mind. Okay? We've already looked at that principle of natural law. So anything that ends in meant, the original etymological derivation means that it was made that way first by a state of mind which led to its creation in physical reality. Okay? Any word you can think of that ends in M-E-N-T, meaning the state of or the condition of, means it happened in mind first and therefore it led to the state of or the condition of in physical reality. Okay? So... When I say that government means mind control, it literally does, and that is an accurate etymological breakdown. Okay? The word mens was deliberately chosen for specific reasons. And I just explained the reason of that meaning, the state of or the condition of. And pe many people want to hotly contest that. I'm telling you outright they're wrong. They don't understand why that was chosen. Men's, meaning mine, was chosen deliberately to mean the state of or the condition of. Government is based on this illusory and false concept called authority. People think certain people are authorities, that they actually have rights that other people don't have. The right to command, compel, coerce, and tell people, this is right, this is what you're going to do, and if you disagree, I have the power to actually co compel, coerce, or con constrain you against your will. If you're not har harming anybody, even in the taking of that action. Authority is based upon an equal illusion that is called jurisdiction. Now, if we break down this word, it comes from the Latin noun. Jurisdiction comes from Latin, jus juris. Jus juris in Latin means law. Juris is the possessive case. And the Latin verb dictare, so jus dictare, juris dictare, jurisdiction, okay? Dictare means to say or to speak. Thus, jurisdiction literally means to say what the law is, or in other words, we get to make up what the law is. The law is not something that exists in nature and is based upon right and wrong and truth and morality. No, we get to make it up. We're God. We get to say what's right and what's wrong. And therefore, since we make the law, 
we're the owners of these people. We're, they're, they're in our jurisdiction. You know, we own them. And we get to make up what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. Authority ultimately is an illusion, again, of a diseased mind, a diseased psyche, based entirely in violence and built upon the erroneous and dogmatic belief that some people are masters who have the moral right to issue commands and others are slaves who have a moral obligation to obey the commands of the masters. I don't care what you want to call it. You can euphemize it any way you want. I call it what it really is. Slavery. That's what it really is. It doesn't come down to anything else. You can call it whatever you want, euphemize it, try to make it sound as nice or as pleasant as possible. It's all one thing. It's called slavery. It's always immoral and it needs to be ended. That's it. And we have to develop the knowledge and the courage to end it. The knowledge, the care, and the courage to end it. The belief in the legitimacy of, quote, authority, this illusory nonsense notion, is the belief in the legitimacy of slavery. Anybody who believes in that authority is legitimate and government is legitimate, whether they want to admit it or not, or know it or not, or understand it or not, I don't care what they believe. They are advocating the legitimacy of slavery. That's not my belief. Uh, you can call, I don't care who calls that my belief. I'm just looking right into the camera and saying this. Because I know the people in this room know that that's not my belief. I'm telling anybody who's listening to this, that's not my belief. That's eternal truth. Eternal truth. Okay? You believe in these concepts, you, you are a supporter of slavery. The end. That's how it really is. Not because I said so. Because that's how it really is. Okay? And that's called mind control. For somebody to believe that slavery is legitimate, you got to be under deep mind control. you got to be either that or a sick, psychopathic, absolute piece of garbage. Okay? One of those things or another is true if you believe in those concepts. And again, I'm not afraid to tell it to somebody right to their face like that. I don't care. I'm not here to serve truth, make friends, or be liked. I'm here to tell people what the truth... I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not here to serve human beings, make friends, or be liked. I, I am here to serve the truth. Whether it will be accepted is not up to me. I'm doing what I'm charged to do by creation. Okay? Whether it's accepted is somebody else's karma, not mine. Ultimately, authority is the idea that man can become God and through, quote, jurisdiction, dictate the law. What the dark occultists of this world, who are behind ostensible governments in the world, you know, they set up all of these institutions as temples, right? What this sick psychopathic priest class ultimately believes is they're going to become God. We're going to turn natural law on top of its head and we're going to rule in hell. That's it. We're going to rule in hell. It's a religion. This is a religion. Hey, okay? government's a religion. The concept of authority is a religion. People don't, most people don't see it that way. And I mean religion in the term of false religion. Okay? It's, it comes from the Latin religare. I laugh when I hear people say it comes from religare. Or, or relegare, R-E-L-E-G-A-R-E, -E -E, or relegare, okay? Which means to read over again, to go back over something that you've already read and read it again. It's the most ridiculous, nonsensical derivation I've ever heard for the word religion, to reread. I mean, please, let's put this to bed, folks. Government, uh, religion does not mean to reread. It doesn't come from re relegare or relegare. I can't remember which infinitive is used for that verb offhand, but um, it comes from religare, hence religion, R-E-L-I-G-A-R-E, -E. all right? Relegare means to tie back, to hold back, or to thwart from forward progress by tying or binding. Tying up so that you can't move forward. That's what religare is, and that is the etymological root of religion. 
Because a false religion is a system of control that is based in unchallenged dogmatic belief which keeps the mind in a prison in order to hold back the progress of consciousness. And that's where the bulk of humanity is at, in a brain cage. They're in the, the mind cage, okay? There is a positive connotation of religion. It also means to reunite with. And what we need to reunite ourselves with is the truth and common sense and natural law and a knowledge that there's no such thing as legitimacy, as legitimacy to slavery. That's what we need to reunite with, you know? And then we'd be living with true religion. We'd be practicing true religion instead of fake religion. We've got to stop trying to make our religion truth. And we got to start making truth our religion. That's what needs to be done. So what's the one true divide that exists in humanity? People say, oh, it's, this is separation talk. We're all one. No, we're not. There is one true divide that does exist in reality. And here's what it is. The one true divide that separates humanity into two distinct types of individuals the criteria for this divide is whether or not an individual believes in, quote, authority and therefore believes that there is legitimacy to slavery. The two groups of people are the people who know slavery is never legitimate and people who believe that it can be legitimate. That's what actually separates humanity. That's the, see, all the other things, divide and conquer. Race, religion, sec, sexuality, uh, income, uh, you know, religious belief systems, these are all divide and conquer techniques. There's one real difference, whether somebody believes in slavery or not. And of course, people have called these, this difference, statists and anarchists, right? So here's a couple of memes that I picked up on Facebook. Statism is the brilliant idea that we give a small group of people the right to kidnap, imprison, harass, steal from, and kill people so that we can be protected from people who kidnap, harass, steal from, and kill people. Yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense if you ask me. I think it's going to work out brilliantly with that system in place. Okay? An anarchist, I couldn't find any good pictures of anarchists because they're all fake anarchists who want to destroy property and think that they're somehow doing the world some good. You know, the black bloc. They're really communists in disguise. Okay? When you really boil down to it, they don't know what anarchy is at all. They're just some, you know, Marxists who thinks that that's some, that ideology, that, that junk ideology is some kind of a pathway to freedom. You know, it's a bunch of left brain clowns who have no understanding of natural law. You know? Now go, go put your polka dot jumpsuit and some floppy shoes on. And go get yourself a nice clown nose. Seriously, because that's what those people are. They're a joke. They're a joke. They don't know the first thing about what freedom is. Not the first thing. Okay? So, I was looking for good pictures of anarchists. So, I was, I was going to put, like, you know, maybe myself, Larkin Rose, uh, Freeman, you know, Freighter X, people who, who get all the stuff, who I, I personally like their work, Michael Tessarion, et cetera. David Icke. Um, but I said, hey, let's put a, a meme up there that really expresses it. So I found this picture of G Jesus, a meme that says, I'm an anarchist, but most of my followers are statists. You know? People who are these fake ass Christians who believe they somehow are following the teachings of Christ and they believe in government, they believe in financial institutions. They believe in organized religion. These are the three things that killed Christ. If you even accept the historicity of the event. Who was Christ waging basic conflict with? The Pharisees and Sadducees, the organized religious order and, 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 and controlling religious orders of his day. Okay? What really got him into deep trouble, he was pissing them off, but they were already on the, on the wane. The old world order was on the way out, and the new world order was already in, on the way in at that time. You know? He got himself in real trouble when he went against the financial institutions, the money changers at the temple, taking people for a ride for temple coins, right? And he flogged their ass. He took out the switch on them, right? Not somebody who never got angry, 
who accepted evil and said, oh, it's just, a, it's just an experience, you know, none of it matters, took out the switch and beat their ass for usury, okay? Um, and then who finally put them to death? The police of their day, the Ro Roman Empire, you know, Roman centurions, the operating standing army and police of their day, the government. So who is, he who, who is he waging spiritual warfare against to try to bring righteousness into the world? And again, I don't care whether you accept it as historical fact or al spiritual allegory. I could care less. Believe what you want. doesn't matter. All that matters is the teaching. He was waging water, war, spiritual war, against the three entrenched mind control religious establishments of his day. Organized religion, organized finance, and, and government. And people don't see it that way, so-called Christians, you know? Because they're not interested in the real teachings. They just want to call themselves something and identify it and say, oh, that, that magically makes me this, you know? Because you go to church on Sunday, it doesn't make you a Christian. You know, no more than going to a synagogue would make you align with the true teachings of the Torah. No more than, you know, attending a, a mosque would align you with the true teachings of Islam or any other religion. To take the core essence of the teachings of morality from those systems, you know. They're all people who claim these faiths in name only when they don't understand real freedom. So a statist is an individual who erroneously believes there's such a thing as authority that is vested in certain human beings, magically giving them the right to rule over other people. This authority means that certain people who we call government have the, quote, moral right to issue commands to those whom they rule, those under their jurisdiction, and that their subjects or slaves have a, quote, moral obligation to obey the arbitrary dictates or laws, quote, unquote, that are set by their masters. Most simply put, a statist is nothing more than someone who believes in the legitimacy of slavery. Conversely, an anarchist, a true anarchist anyway, is one who knows that there could never be legitimacy to authority or government because those terms are simply euphemisms for violence and slavery and coercion, which are always immoral and in opposition to natural law. Let's look at what the word anarchy really means. Again, you've got to break it down from the Greek prefix an, which means without or the absence of. And the Greek noun archon, they're written in Greek script, which means master or ruler. And again, I mean externally. One who externally rules another or claims to be the master of another. That's what the term archon means in its connotation. Anarchy, as we can see by putting these together, does not mean without rules. The word archon does not mean rules. Okay? Because there's always going to be rules in effect called natural law. The laws of morality. It means rulers. Imposed rulers. That's what archon means in Greek. It literally means anarchy now, putting it together. An, absence of, archon, master or ruler. The absence of masters or rulers, externally imposed, masters or rulers. Meaning, when we put it together, okay, it means without rulers, without masters. Now, if you give people that term, no masters, no rulers, no masters, no slaves, what word are they going to associate those phrases with? Freedom. But if you tell people, what does anarchy mean to you? What do you associate it with? What are they going to tell you? Chaos. Chaos, which is the exact opposite. That's in that other column. Okay? They, they have deliberately obfuscated the meaning of the word through a mind control technique called endless repetition. If I could keep telling you a word doesn't mean what it means, that's not a projector, that's a hammer. Hey, could you check out my hammer over there and make sure it's projecting the image on the board correctly? You know, the bulb burned out in my hammer. I might need to go buy a new hammer. If I kept doing that endlessly, endlessly, endlessly for years and years and years, people would start calling that device a hammer if I got enough people to keep calling it that. So they've gotten enough people to call freedom chaos. 
think about that. They've gotten enough people to believe that the absence of the state of slavery means chaos instead of freedom. It's almost unfathomable. It's almost incomprehensible. The mind job that's been done on this species. It's almost incomprehensible. Anarchy is the state of existence where there are no masters and no slaves. Therefore, what it really means is the absence of slavery, or in other words, true freedom. That's all it means. I prefer to call it anarchani, okay? Keeping the word, entire word archon instead of taking out the O-N, okay? If we keep that there and call it anarchani, and I say I'm an anarchonist, people will ask, well, what the hell is that? And then you could really break the word down and say the absence of archons, the absence of those who would claim to be masters over a population of slaves. That's what an anarchonist is. It's saying that's illegitimate, that's unnecessary, and that we need to do away with that state of existence. Okay? So we look at these two, this true divide again, the statist and the anarchist. I call the statist the archonist. This is somebody who believes in the legitimacy of the archons, the rulers, okay? And I'll be talking about in future presentation the concept of the archons more in future presentations. And the anarchist, as it's been called, I think should be called the, called the anarchonist because that's somebody who knows that there's no legitimacy to the mastery over other people or the rulership externally over others, keeping them as slaves or subjects. There's no legitimacy to that. And that's the one true divide that separates all consciousness here on the earth. The, the real divide and the real enlightenment comes, do you understand there's no legitimacy to slavery or do you continue to believe that there's legitimacy to slavery? That's the divide in consciousness that has to be bridged. The fear of chaos, this is what keeps this system going. Chaos can't be viewed as something to fear. It's got to be viewed as a teacher, a harsh teacher, but a teacher nonetheless. See, chaos teaches us through the apophatic process what not to do. Okay, that's a bad idea. Okay, you probably shouldn't do that if your desire is not to burn your hand to the point where it's blistering and flesh is starting to peel off of it. If you don't care about whether that happens, by all means, keep it right on that stove, okay? Right on that electric stove. But see, if you say, I don't want to be burned, there are requirements for obtaining that condition. It means you can't keep your hand on something that is extraordinarily hot, or natural law will take over and burn your flesh doesn't require your belief. That's how it works. Well, this is humanity. Humanity is the little child that is a little slow, and they want not to be burned, yet simultaneously they insist, no, I want to put my hand on the burner while the range is on and not be burned simultaneously. Well, good luck with that, folks, because it doesn't work that way. You don't want to be burned? The hand can't be kept there while the stove is on. The end. You don't want negative, self-inflicted suffering and chaos in your life? you got to align your behavior to natural law, which means you got to know the difference objectively between right and wrong and willfully, through your free will, choose, deliberately choose the right action over the wrong action. Then you won't be burned. But as long as you don't want, as long as you have your hand on that stove, which means you're in opposition to natural law, enjoy the burn. Enjoy it. Right? Get used to it. Till the flesh melts off the bone and then the bones turn into dust. Because that's what you're going to get. That's how it works. And again, nobody wants to hear that. They don't want to hear that the natural laws don't care about you. They work flawlessly all the time and bring you the result that you're creating. The control and slavery system is actually about the limitation of free will through the destruction of possibility. See, all they've done 
right? The old world order used to be religion and priest kings, right? We're in between you and God. We're the intercessors, the intermediaries. We make the law, you're our subjects, you're our slaves, you obey, or it's our wrath. All they've done is take the concept of a singular ruler, which was the old world order, and they've converted it into the concept of now, there's a ruling class called government that gets to make up what we tell you you may or may not do, okay? And they're up here at the top of the pyramid now. That's all. They turned it from a monarchy to somewhat of an oligarchy. But it's the same concept. We're the moral masters that you have a moral obligation to obey, and you're the slave class, you know, that, that has an obligation to obey our commands. That's it. Nothing changed. All they did is say, well, no, people don't no longer believe in the, in the priest king, so we need to create an institution where this quote-unquote authority is seemingly diffused through many people. It's, it's always been nonsense. It's, it's always been mind control. It's not going to be anything else other than that until it goes away. True freedom includes infinite possibility because infinite possibility, by definition, includes the possibility for chaos. For real freedom to exist, we have to accept, hey, things might not go right all the time. We live in a physical domain, a physical world. Hey, there, there could be dangers. You know, nothing could ever be sanitized or made completely safe as far as physical world activities are concerned. There's always going to be the possibility something could happen, go wrong, somebody could get hurt, chaos could, could happen, okay? If you live in that state of fear that that's going to happen, what is that? Is that high consciousness or low consciousness? It's low consciousness. Low consciousness can only create what? Chaos. The fear of chaos itself can only get you more chaos because it's based in fear. As we see, just keep referring to that expression chart, you know? Go online. I have slides of it online. It's in videos I've done. Print it. Read it. Look at it. Print it and stick it up in your home. Understand how that chart works. You know, those expressions that I went over, those 10 expressions. The possibility, okay, of chaos from manifesting, the possibility that it may manifest has to be embraced without fear if we're going to be truly free. It must be embraced. You have to say, I am going to allow for the possibility that chaos may occur because that's, that's getting out of the consciousness of fear, which that's what will lead to freedom, removing that fear. The fear of the possibility of chaos is actually equated to the fear of true freedom. When somebody says, I can't ever believe that a system with no masters could work out, I can't even envision how it could work out. What's that called? What's been deadened in that person? What have they lost? Imagination. Imagination. There it is. That is actually the equivalent of the death of the imagination. Now, what is the imagination? The imagination is the powerful ability of the human mind to envision a different state or condition than the one which is already manifested in the present. So imagination must first be present in the mind in order to create a different state of existence than the one currently being experienced. And this is because according to the principle of mentalism, for any different state to manifest in the physical world, the plane of effects, it must first exist within the mind or the plane of causality. If the imagination is stifled or destroyed, and the destruction of the imagination is what I refer to as total mind control, you can't go into any more total mind controlled state as the imagination being dead. All right? If that happens, any positive change to our state of existence becomes completely impossible. And this is where many people are already at. The fear of the possibility of chaos is more than even the fear of true freedom. Freedom. It is the death of the imagination. It is putting the mind permanently in the cage. Okay? You can't let that force within us called the imagination die. 
because that's the only way to envision a way out of the prison. You have to envision it first, then you have to put that that uh, those thoughts and, and emotions that you used for that in, envisioning process into actual action so that it becomes manifested in the physical world. Through their fear of the possibility of chaos, which is actually the fear of true freedom, most people advocate the legitimacy and continuance of authority in government and are therefore actually advocating the legitimacy and continuance of violence and slavery. Those who believe that authority is necessary and that it must continue because of this fear of chaos have actually been duped into believing that human slavery is necessary. And get this, folks, human slavery must therefore continue in order to prevent chaos. Now imagine that. Imagine that. That's what statism is, though. That's what the religion called the belief in government or statism is. It is the belief that human slavery is necessary and must continue indefinitely in order to prevent chaos from manifesting. Now tell me how that could possibly work. Can violence and slavery, which is actually what government is a euphemism for, statism and government are just euphemisms for violence and slavery. Okay. Can violence and slavery ever possibly prevent chaos? Why? What? Be why can't it? Because they are chaos. Violence and slavery are chaos. We are already in the state of chaos. Being held under the threat of violence and duress which is slavery, is the state of chaos. So forget about fearing chaos coming on. You're in it now, surprise, surprise. Hate to break the news to you all, okay? We're already in the state of chaos. We're tr we need to create real order by getting rid of violence and slavery. Order followers, these are the people who keep the system of slavery in place, okay? They're the people who keep the system of, sla in, of slavery in place. Let me just say this again. Order followers are the people who keep the existence of slavery in place. Not the ruling class, not the masters, not the so-called elite, which aren't the elite of anything but the bottom of a trash can. Okay? The people who keep slavery in place are the people who willfully follow their orders. Nobody wants to hear that. And people will hate you for saying it. <laughs> Following orders means, by definition, doing what you are told to do without judging for yourself whether or not that action that you are being ordered to carry out is actually right or wrong. That's the definition of following orders. I mean, can anybody refute that? Is that not the actual definition of following someone else's order? By definition, you're not, if you're following the order, you're given the order and then you just act. You just do it because you're following the order. You don't sit there and go, is what that person told me to do right? Do I have a right to do that? Is that moral? Should I do that because, it, it, you know, it, it's okay and it doesn't hurt somebody else? Or should I not do that because it actually does cause harm? It's not what an order follower does in their mind. An order follower says, yes, sir, and follows the order. That's why it's called an order follower. That's why it's called following an order. So that's the definition of what an order follower is. It's not my perception of what an order follower is. It's the actual definition of order following. Okay? If an individual, this is key to understand, if an individual is performing the task of following orders, by definition, that individual can not be exercising conscience. Since by definition, exercising conscience means that one is willfully choosing through their free will for themselves right action over wrong action. 
So the, the concept of following orders is completely polar opposite to the concept of exercising conscience. You cannot be doing the same things simultaneously. It's impossible to do those two things simultaneously. They are contradictions in terms by definition. Okay, most people don't grasp that. Okay, by definition, if you're following orders, you cannot be actually exercising conscious, conscience, which involves free will choice based on the knowledge of right and wrong. Here's what order following gets us as far as a nation is concerned. You know, not that we're not already there, not that these people already didn't take us, because we're taken by them already, covertly. They took us through the school systems. They, they couldn't beat us militarily. So they said, well, let's send our ideologues over there and get into the minds of their children. And if you don't believe that's what happened, you're very, very, very naive. Not only the Nazis, but the communists as well. Because really, it's all just forms of socialism. That's what feudalism is. Worldwide socialism is, there's no such thing as private property. State owns everything. Rights don't exist. Property rights don't exist. Everybody's a feudal serf again. It's called neo-feudalism. I don't care which branch you come at it from. You want to come at it from the left, that's called communism. You want to come at it from the right, that's called national socialism. Communism, international socialism. They're both the same force. It's called feudalism. Let's just call it what it is. It's called feudalism, which is in itself just another euphemism for slavery. They want neo-feudalism, which is the new world order of, of slavery, okay? And it's already here. It's not something that's coming. It's here now. The object is to get out of it. This is the result of following orders. That's what following orders gets to society. Following orders should never be seen as a virtue. Following orders is evil. I don't care whether you're, I don't, I don't care if somebody, I don't care if somebody who is considered a holy man gives me an order and I'm, I follow it, I've just committed an act of evil, as far as I'm concerned. If I'm acting based on solely what somebody else has told me to do, that's evil. There's no morality in it at all. At all. At all. There's, it's not a virtue. It's evil. Okay? Let me just make that so abundantly clear and state it so unequivocally. There's no such thing as any possible moral following of orders. The two terms are contradictory. All right? I was just following orders is never a valid excuse or justification for immoral criminal behavior and this lame attempt to abdicate personal responsibility should never be accepted as a valid excuse for such behavior. And why it's done is through justification. And again, that means to create a right from jus, meaning right or law, and the Latin verb facere, which means to make or to create. And this is what they say, I was just following orders, I was just doing my job. I was shutting down your protest. You don't have a right to speak. The politicians commanded me so. So I just came out and I was just doing my job, hitting you with a sound cannon. You know, just doing my job, just following my orders. It's a justification. You're a criminal. There's nothing moral in that, there's nothing virtuous in that. It's called criminal behavior, criminal activity. And what they do is try to create it into a right, make it into a right by a justification. And nobody should ever accept their justifications. Because you know what their justifications is? You know what they are? It's called a 100% crock of bull that is a complete lie. It's a lie. They're just straight up looking you in the face and saying, I'm not responsible for that. I just did it, but I'm not the one who's responsible for it because I was acting on orders. Well, see, this defense didn't work as the Nuremberg defense, and nobody in America should be accepting it. Right. Nobody in America should be accepting it because they believe in the legitimacy of authority and government through mind control. That's what the, they believe it. They believe there's legitimacy to it. Most people actually believe that there's legitimacy to this criminal behavior because a class of people calling themselves government have magically been imbued and gifted with such rights, quote unquote. They believe they have rights other people don't. They themselves believe it, but worse is that the people who are actually affected by that criminal behavior, they believe they have the authority to do it. 
Gandhi said, you assist an evil system most effectively by obeying its orders and decrees. An evil system never deserves such allegiance. Allegiance to it means partaking of the evil. A good person will resist an evil system with his or her whole soul, which means saying no. Moral culpability, what does this mean? The determination of who is ultimately at fault or deserving of blame. Again, this is a legitimate and real concept. There is fault, there is blame. We gotta get over this new age nonsense that nobody's at fault, nobody's to blame. You should never say, hey, you shouldn't have done that. That caused a lot of chaos and trauma for other people. You're not to blame. It just happened. No, wrong. The people who did the behavior are to blame. Who carried out the Holocaust in Germany? The people who followed their orders to do it. That's who carried it out. Order followers is the answer. Who carried out the purge of political dissonance in Soviet Russia? Order followers. And they're always in the form of police. Why do you think they call a totalitarian system a police state? Why don't they call it a banker state? How come they don't call it a politician state? What about a lawyer state? How about a judge state? Why not call it any of those things? You want to know why? Because none of those people are ultimately responsible for bringing that condition into manifestation through their behavior. They're the order givers. The order followers carry out their commands and through their behavior make that condi condition a reality. That's why it's called a police state because every police state ha that has ever existed has always been created by police who follow their orders because they don't want to take responsibility and think for themselves and know the difference between right and wrong for themselves like an adult. Instead, I want to be a child who obeys daddy because I have daddy issues. All right, and that's what it's really about, folks. We're going to get to that. There is such a thing as blame for the commission of actions which have resulted in harm or loss to others. This is what culpable means. It comes from the Latin culpa, meaning fault or blame. It means at fault or deserving of blame. Now, who's more morally culpable? The order giver or the order follower? And please recognize, I've underlined and capitalized the term more. I'm not telling you the order givers are not morally culpable. They are. That's not the question. Is, are, are any of these people morally culpable is not my question. My question is, look at the full question. Who is more morally culpable? The order giver or the order follower? Always. Always, at all times and places, at all times and places. I put this meme up on Facebook, and I mean I got some hate back for it, okay? People don't want to hear this. Like I said, I'm not here to be popular to make friends. I'm here to tell people what the truth actually is, and they have to accept it or reject it on their own. I put this meme up, I made this meme and put it up on Facebook, and it, it had politicians on the left that said, my actions, underlined and capitalized, didn't cause that. And then there were some soldiers or Marines, whatever they are, order followers on the right side, and they're also saying the same statement. My actions didn't cause that. And then at the bottom, I just put this question. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I um, looks like, oh, I'm sorry. At, at, at the top, I put this question. Who is lying and who is telling the truth? So who's, who's lying here? And if people can't see, I, I hope that they can see this horrific picture. This is the result of, you know, bombings that took place in the Middle East around, I think, around uh, Iraq. And uh, it's, a, it's a father carrying his dead child in his arms, okay? Uh, maybe if bombs were raining down on our children, we might think differently about going in and waging imperialism on other nations. I don't know. Maybe we might think differently about it, right? But when it happens to somebody else's child, that's okay. That's done in the name of freedom. Okay, well, who caused this? Did they cause it? No, they didn't cause it. 
They are not the actual cause of this. Because you know what all they did? They signed some pieces of paper wearing their expensive suits, okay? And they told these guys, they said, well, you're under our orders now. Go and bomb these people. And you know what these people did? Say, yes, sir, and go and drop the bombs. And, and, and fire off the ammunition. Okay? These are the people whose actions create things like this. Not these people. All they're doing is speaking into somebody else's ear. All they've done is speech. Speech, not actions. See, again, look at the... Look, really look. My actions didn't cause that. Yes, it is. If these people are saying my actions didn't cause that, they're lying. Very, very, very painful and difficult thing for people to comprehend and accept. I'm not telling you you shouldn't feel bad hearing this, but I'm, I'm telling you it's true. The painful truth, the order follower always bears more moral culpability than the order giver. For the reason that the order follower is the one who actually performed the action and in taking such action actually brought the resultant harm into physical manifestation. Order following is the pathway to every form of evil and chaos in our world. It should never be seen as a virtue by anyone who considers themselves a moral human being. Order followers have ultimately been personally responsible and morally culpable for every form of slavery and every single totalitarian regime that has ever existed upon the face of the earth. That's the painful truth that people don't want to accept because they want to believe the absolute nonsense that order following is a virtue of any kind. And it needs to be obliterated from the face of the earth because it's not the way to any kind of virtues or order. It's the pathway to evil and annihilation. That's what it is. Responsibility versus abdication. So why don't, why don't, why don't these people want to think for themselves? It's too easy to just follow the orders of somebody else. This, they believe somehow magically this absolves them of personal responsibility to choose right from wrong. An individual's personal responsibility to choose right action over wrong action for themselves always belongs to that individual. And that responsibility can never be given to another person or passed along. One can only claim and imagine that they can abdicate their personal responsibility for such choice to someone else. It can never actually be done in reality. You're only making a claim. I'm not responsible for that behavior because this person told me to do it. That's just a claim. And what, moreover, what it really is, is it's just a damn lie. Okay? More simply put, an individual is always personally responsible for their own actions, period, in the end. If you did it, you're responsible for it. There are no cop-outs. Stop trying to make excuses or justifications for criminal behavior. Own up to personal responsibility. If you did wrong action, you did it. You caused it. I like how David Icke words this. He says, accept responsibility for yourself and your actions, thoughts, and words. You alone make these choices, so you alone are answerable, answerable to the consequences of your behavior. The feeble excuse that your boss required it, that the establishment expected it, holds no truth or justification. What is the point of having principles if you allow others to dictate your behavior? Really, those who allow others to dictate their behavior don't have principles. And there's a reason they don't have principles, because they hate themselves. They're in psychological self-loathing, and there's a reason they're in that state, which my future work is going to cover in depth, in extensive depth and detail. At the end of the day, you will judge your performance and the contribution you've made to creation. It will not be based on what another expected of you or what you did because you felt trapped. Like, oh, there's no other way. I can't envision my way out of this. I can't envision doing something else. I might have to get another job. I might have to read and learn. 
I can't envision becoming a different person than my, the identity I've already forged for myself. How could I possibly imagine that? I have all my eggs in this basket. My whole ego identity is all wrapped up in my job and what I do. That defines who I am. You know, I can't go against that. It's all nonsense. It's all what people are doing just because they feel trapped and they can't imagine that there's another way. Most people erroneously believe this is the second part of the abdication of responsibility on the part of the people. Most people erroneously believe that they can hand over their natural law right to defend themselves to another individual, group, or entity. In making such a false claim that somebody else is my protector, somebody else, it's their responsibility to protect me, okay, and defend me, they have attempted to abdicate a personal responsibility which actually always belongs to them and can never be given away. That's the self-defense principle. You own it. You, it's, it's yours. You can't give it away to somebody else. Shock and amazement. Okay? That is your responsibility already. And guess what? You know what? They're all too happy. These controllers are now even all too happy to say, it's not our responsibility to protect you. Because what their actual goal is, is they're just revenue men for the new king. That's all they are. And to slap people back in the line if they try to exercise rights that the, the new king called government has decreed that they may not exercise. That's what their real role is. They don't serve and protect the people. They serve and protect the ruling class. And they don't want to admit that to themselves. You know why? Because they're liars, most of all to themselves. It's a bunch of childish liars. Franklin said those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither and will lose both. And this is, addresses the fear of chaos and the desire to abdicate your personal responsibility to defend yourself to other people just because you're afraid and you don't want to take the responsibility of doing it yourself. You want to stay in that mindset? I'll give up my freedom to be safe? Well, enjoy your safe slavery. I, for one, will take my dangerous and chaotic freedom. Okay? I'll take the... I'll take the, the absolute cannibal lurking around every corner and I'll take my chances thank you very much give me my freedom and my assault rifle and I'll take my chances thank you okay so the idea that you just want to be kept slave, safe and you'll give up your freedom to do so it's just a child that's how a child thinks and that's what this is really about not wanting to grow up and become adults. And again, there's a reason for this. There's, this is the underlying psychological reason, but there's an even deeper one. But I'm going to touch on this one first. Self-respect versus self-loathing. People who don't want to take personal responsibility and become an adult are in this psychological condition. It's called self-loathing. What it means is you hate yourself. Nobody who wants to perpetuate slavery can possibly like themselves. They cannot love themselves. It's impossible. You are already in a state of self-hatred if you believe in government, if you believe in its legitimacy, okay? Because you believe in slavery, and therefore, you're in that slavery system, and you want it to continue. How could you possibly love yourself? It's not possible. Self-loathing is the underlying psychological condition that causes people to attempt to abdicate their own personal responsibility to exercise conscience and fall into patterns of, of order following and justification. Just as it is not possible for an order follower to truly be exercising conscience, it is not possible for an order follower to truly love themselves. These two states cannot exist simultaneously. You cannot be an order follower and love yourself. It is impossible. They are contradictory psychological conditions. Okay? Here's what an order, a self-loathing person really is. They're trapped in a trauma abuse victim cycle. A trauma happens, there's an abuser, there's a victim, and then it repeats itself. Because often the one who's abused becomes the traumatizer, and then the cycle repeats again. Talked about this pretty extensively on my podcast series, all right? That's what self-loathing, that's what this mind state, okay? This is a golem creature, okay? It's a 100% programmed and lifeless thing that is imbued with the ability to actually move like a robot. It, you can liken it to a flesh robot, 
okay? And it's a concept in ancient dark occultism, all right? And the golem is driven by the force of self-loathing. And that's what the order followers are. They're golems, okay? I'm not saying this to insult people. I don't really care how people take it. I'm telling them what they really are and what the dark occultists think of them. They call them their dogs and their pets. That's their name for the police and the military. I did a whole series on that, okay? And I'm not telling you that from book knowledge. I'm telling you that from their lips to my ears. That's what they call them. The golem is in this mindset. Since I have suffered, I will cause suffering to others. Since I can't deal with my nested psychological traumas and childhood issues and inadequacy issues, okay, I'm going to take out all of that nested subconscious psychological frustration on other people that I have no right to take it out upon. That's the golem mindset. Self-loathing is created when an earlier trauma has been suppressed and buried deeply into the subconscious. That's the role of the subconscious, to protect the conscious mind from traumatic experiences so that the conscious mind doesn't keep reliving it and therefore re-experiencing it in the physiology. However, if we never bring up that shadow material to the conscious level, it builds and builds and builds until it ultimately destroys us, psychically and spiritually, all right? Instead of confronting, dealing with, and healing that trauma, people don't want to do that work. It's too hard to dredge up that shadow material. It's hard work. Believe me, to come out of the mind state I was in, I had to do that shadow work for years, years of more suffering and pain, saying, what do I have to look in the mirror and confront about myself and then work to change and admit thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of times I was wrong. I was wrong. I was wrong. I don't know how many thousands of times I had to look in a mirror and say that to myself. Sometimes to a point where I was so depressed I couldn't get out of bed for days. I would just sit and lay in bed and play doom metal all day. Literally. Endlessly. Repetitively. And just sit, sitting there in that condition of total self-loathing and total depression. Because of what I know I took part in. And that I know was still my mental makeup, was still my psychological makeup that was going to take years to get out of. And I'm trying to explain this to prevent people from having to go through all that suffering. This knowledge can be gleaned without having to go down that path. It can be done. I'm not telling you that's easy work, but it is possible. Such trauma could take the form of feelings of inadequacy, whether they are real or imagined. And you know what that mind state ultimately is? It's self-prison. That's somebody putting themselves in a cage. These people who want to take out their psychological frustrations on other people, they're prisoners. They are in the cage, and they love being in the cage. They don't have any desire for freedom. The only kind of person that would have no desire for real pr freedom is a person who's in the psychological state of self-loathing and hates themselves and does not love themselves. Now, what heals self-loathing? Self-respect. And we have to know what the word respect means. And this is about looking at yourself. Introspection. It co respect comes from the Latin re, meaning again, and the Latin verb spectare, which means to look at. You put them together to look at again, to take another look at. Well, what are you taking another look at? You're taking another look at yourself. That's what respect starts as. You can't give something to somebody that you don't have. If I don't have $10 in my pocket, I can't give it to you. If I don't have a, you know, a coin in my pocket, I can't give it to somebody else. You gotta have it first to give it. So nobody can give respect to anybody else unless they first developed it inwardly. Self-respect has to come first. And that's why these people don't respect anybody, order followers, most of all themselves. Until they do that work of self-introspection, they're not going to develop that self-respect. And I'm not tell again, I'm not telling you that's easy work. It's hard work that can take a lot of time. And it's dredging up shadow material that most people want to run away from. They don't want to confront that about themselves. Only self-respect can heal self-loathing and therefore help to put an order follower on the path to conscience. We need to take another look at ourselves. The lost word, 
All right, this is the end of the natural law segment, and I'm just going to talk about solutions toward the end a little bit. All right? The lost word, it's a concept in esoteric Freemasonry, which represents a state of consciousness that has been largely, quote-unquote, lost to the majority of human beings. In order to speak the, quote-unquote, lost word, a human being must work upon themselves in order to achieve a state of equilibrium or balance between the left and right hemispheres of the brain. In such a state of balanced consciousness, the being has come to know oneself, as well as the working operations of the macrocosm, meaning natural law. In doing so, that person has also come to understand the objective difference between right and wrong, or as these concepts are referred to in the tradition of Freemasonry, they have come to understand the difference between light, which is right, and darkness, which is wrong, or light, which is knowledge of right and wrong, and darkness, which is ignorance of right and wrong, respectively. All right? What is the lost word, though? That's the lost word, ladies and gentlemen. You, you know the knowledge of the highest levels of Freemasonry now. Most actual Freemasons in the Lodge system don't know the lost word. The lost word is no. And I would suggest to you, it is a dual word. The lost word is dual, meaning it, it's two things. It's not just one. It is the word no, N-O, and it is the word no, K-N-O-W. Those are the lost words, okay? In the enlightened state of consciousness generated through the knowledge of natural law, a human being is finally able to speak the so-called lost word, which is no. No is the word of all power. Only when we say no to those who would claim to be our owners, those who would claim that it is they who will decide which rights we have or do not have, do we stop externalizing our power to anyone outside of ourselves and in doing so, reclaim all of our rights, all of our property that has been taken without right. Sadly, very, very few people in our world have the knowledge, care, and courage that is required to do this. This is why this all-powerful word is considered lost. And there's the other variant of the lost word. Know. Know your rights. The reason you have to know what the difference between right and wrong is, and therefore know what rights you have and what rights you do not have, is because those who do not know those things will never say the lost word to someone who claims to be their owner. They will not say no and O. Oh. So let's look at some solutions. I call this section teaching natural law to others. Because as we're talking about, education is the only solution. Knowledge is the solution. The propagation of that knowledge is education, which means to lead out from. Educare in Latin means to lead one out from something. And what is education? It means to lead one out of darkness, out of ignorance. That's what a real teacher does. You know, doesn't push somebody out. It says, I'm going to go first and show you the way. And you could follow, you know, if you feel that this is the accurate path. Okay? But you could do the same discovery process. It's a repeatable process. That's what a science is, which I've said this is not a belief system or a religion. It is a science. This is also known. Teaching natural law to others, which is what I am doing, is, has been called in all of the positive occult traditions the great work. And I, it's, I call it the true great work because the dark occultists take everything and twist it around, and they have their own variant of the, quote, great work, which is creating a world of total slavery. That's all. That's the dark great work. I call this the true great work, or the light great work, however you want to refer to it as. It's just a piece of jargon. It's just a tag that we put on it. Shift happens. Well, maybe, but maybe not. 
The result's not guaranteed here, folks. The New Agers want to tell you it's all guaranteed, it's all in hand, you know. The, 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 the Zeta Reticulians are going to be coming in from orbit any moment here, give us all the secrets to the universe, save us from our own ignorance, you know. You just got to wait a few more years or decades or millennia, but they'll be here soon. A quantum shift in human consciousness is required for humanity to become free of its self-imposed state of slavery. Unfortunately, this great change is not an automatic process, nor is it guaranteed to happen at all. We can be in this condition for a very, 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 very long time, or it can snowball and lead to total annihilation and the extinction of the human species. It's not get, the positive outcome is not guaranteed. Anybody who thinks it is is very naive and you know extraordinarily right brain and overly positive. I'm not telling you the negative outcome is guaranteed either. I'm telling you it can go either way, depending on how consciousness goes. About how many people in quantum numbers are going to choose truth over deception. That's what's going to guarantee the that's what's going to determine the outcome. Whether or not it will occur is a function of the human will to learn the truth and to teach it to others. This involves enormous effort, enormous dedication, and most of all, enormous persistence. You can't give up. Continuous application of will is required. Continuous work. There, there's a, there, in alchemy, there's a saying. It's like the, 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 the catchphrase for the alchemical tradition. Labore et constantia. It means work and constancy, continual effort. That's what's going to get this boulder up the mountain. That's it. And it's going to go kicking and screaming, folks, because of the level of calcification the human mind is at. I don't expect this to be an easy process. I'm not blowing smoke up your rear end and telling you, hey, Come over and do the side, do the work, the great work. It's going to be so much fun. It's going to be so easy. We're going to get it done real quick, and everything's going to be fine. Okay? If I was some new age guru who was trying to get you all to believe what I'm saying, that's what I would tell you. Because all I'd be, be worried about is how popular I am and how many followers I can accrue. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in telling you how it really is. That doesn't make me popular. As a matter of fact, that makes me hated by a lot of people. Okay? This is not going to be easy. A quantum shift has requirements. Quantum, the word quantum is derived from the Latin noun quantum. It's the same word in Latin as it is in English. Quantum in Latin means an amount of something. In order to tip the scales of truth and justice back to balance, a certain amount of people actually need to be doing the great work to help others to receive truth. If we don't have enough people doing that, that those scales are not going to tip in the opposite direction. Got news for you. We need to hit a critical mass number. Numbers are required. The New Age movement wants to tell you, no, numbers aren't required. A tiny, 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 tiny portion can make great, great, great change happen. Nonsense. It's not called a quantum shift for no reason. It's called a quantum shift because quantum means an amount. Okay? You need to put enough force on that scale to get the truth to tip in the other direction. If you don't have that amount, it's not going to tip. All right? So, individual behavioral choices, whether either they are either based in harmony with natural law or opposition to natural law. They combine in their energy and effect, and in the aggregate, meaning in the sum total, they influence the quality of the manifested shared human experience. That's how reality is created. We're not a, a very contradictory to the New Age notion. Each individual is not creating their own reality. In the aggregate, humanity is creating, co-creating the collective shared experience that we are all undergoing. We collectively create our shared experience. Not each individual creates the, the reality that everybody experiences. Yeah, you do create a microcosmic aspect of how you experience your life, whether you're experiencing self-inflicted suffering, large amounts of it or not, 
That's how the laws of attraction work at an individuated level. But at a mass level, they work in the aggregate. We need a population who understands and lives in harmony with natural law. And numbers are required for that to happen. This dynamic acts as a perfect expression of the principle of correspondence. As above, so below. As below, so above. As the individuated units of consciousness are co-creating reality, so the macrocosmic reality shall become and shall be experienced. Decisively, contrary to the New Age view, in order for a quantum shift to take place, numbers are required. So what is the true great work? The true great work can only be performed after one has already realized the truth regarding natural law and brought oneself, one's own, one's own actions into alignment with natural law. That's when it begins. Because once you do that and you're no longer in that internal co uh, contradiction or opposition, that's when you can legitimately start teaching it to other people because you know it deeply enough and you've actually aligned your behavior to it. So the true great work is what comes after that. And here's what it is. This is actually what the true great work is now. It is the arduous task of influencing other people to go through the very same process of change, of positive change in consciousness that you have gone through. It is to help them to realize that in supporting and condoning the legitimacy of authority and government, in other words, man's law, that what they have actually been supporting and condoning is the legitimacy of slavery and that they were immoral for having done so. Now that is hard work. Because people don't want to hear this. They want to believe what they want to believe. They want to be true what they want to be true. They filter their perceptions through those lenses. In short, what the true great work comes down to is to actually get people to abandon their religions, their false religions, really, I should make this slide say, the false and dogmatic beliefs which hold back the progress of consciousness by impeding the reception of truth and natural law. They're calcified religious belief systems. That's what has to be broken down and abandoned. Carl Jung described the great work beautifully. I consider him a modern-day alchemist as I consider many other teachers of the great work. He said, one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. Making the darkness conscious. Not wishing for it to become conscious, not meditating upon it, by making it happen through an act of will. And that can only be done if enough people are doing the great work. Okay, Th This latter procedure that he's just described, he says, however, is disagreeable and therefore not popular. So few people are doing this work. The answer is to actually become the teacher. I don't do this because I want a lot of people to be students and follow what I'm saying. I could care less whether you follow me. Believe me, I'm telling you the wrong thing to do would be to follow me. You wanna f That's a bad example. You follow me, you're going to go down a deep path of suffering for many, many years before you come out of it. It would be a bad choice. I'm telling you to follow truth. To know truth. It has nothing to do with me. All right? When people hear that's what the great work is, to help change other people's minds, once you change your own, <laughs> it's like this. Let me run away from that as fast as possible. Are you crazy? You want me to do what? That's the hardest thing there is to do. Exactly. That's why so few people are doing it. Many hands make light work. If we had more people involved in the effort, it might go smoother. It might go faster. Jefferson said, educate and inform the whole mass of people. That is the only sure reliance for the preservation of our liberty. Education is the answer. Researcher, researcher Donald McIlvaney said in his book, Toward a New World Order, in every declining civilization, 
there is a small remnant of people who adhere to the right against the wrong, who recognize the difference between good and evil, and who will take an active stand for the former against the latter. There's a small group who can still think and discern for themselves and who will courageously take a stand against the political, social, moral, and spiritual decay of their day. Brilliant. The words that are attributed to Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, and many people will never have heard this quote. He says, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. We're going to talk about who the enemy really is. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Th these are words attributed by Jesus, but what you want to put in place of Jesus is the word truth. The way, the truth, the light, knowledge, knowledge of natural law, Christ consciousness, okay? He's telling you, there are going to be people in your own family that aren't going to align themselves with right over wrong. They're going to continue to choose slavery. They're going to continue to advocate slavery. These aren't people who you want to continue to align yourself with if you have made an effort to truly explain what's really taking place. See, this is the concept of true forgiveness and turning the other cheek. It doesn't mean turn the other cheek and continue to ignore evil and excuse evil indefinitely while it destroys you. It means you have to give people who you're close with and you have an affinity with more chances than you would give just the, you know somebody who you don't know to learn the truth. It's like saying, I'm, because I really care about this person personally, I'm going to keep going back, keep going back, keep going back, and I'm going to keep hitting them with the truth. And eventually if they come over to the side of truth and right, fine. But what he's saying here is eventually this spiritual war is going to go hot, so to speak. And the people, even who are closest to us, if they don't align themselves with right, are the people who are ultimately continuing the evil in the world. They're the real en spiritual enemy. What will this battle really be against, this spiritual war? Well, I say it will really actually be against inner demons that exist in the psyche of mankind. And these inner demons are egos that are hardened into what I've referred to as negative knowledge. Emotional mind control and the fear of true freedom. So negative knowledge is the concept that somebody already knows. They don't want to look at something because, hey, I already know what's really going on. Okay, It's the illusion of knowledge. The greatest enemy may not be ignorance, but rather the illusion of actual knowledge. And people don't have the truth. And not only don't they have the truth, so they're, they're at zero there, right? They're at the zero point there because they haven't really started looking in the truth for themselves. But they're attached to all this stuff that isn't true. So that puts them in the negative. They got to do work to get back to zero of knowing nothing. That's why I call it negative knowledge. Got to do hard work to get back to a clean slate to start taking in some good stuff. Many people are in that state, and the people who are in that state largely are the overly intellectual, the super left-brained, the left-brained prison folks. Emotional mind control is the second inner demon. Uh, you know, I, I encounter this all the time through people with my work. So many people don't have the thick skin to listen to somebody like me, and that's okay. That's all right. Again, what Art talked about is that in the ancient traditions, they talked about Reserve the meat for the strong men and furnish the milk for the babies. All right? I'm not here to convert the babies. That's, I don't have the patience for that. I don't, ha I don't have the energy for that. What I'm trying to do is get the other teachers ready who might have the energy and patience for that. Because that's not me. And I'm being 100% perfectly honest with you that that's not me. That's not, I'm, I'm not here to do that. Okay, I'm hoping to 
bring some other people that are most of the way there, all the way there, so they can start doing that on a wider scale. You know, they're going to be the people who are going to work with people like that, not me. I'm just being honest with you about it. Emotional mind control comes in a couple of forms. Well, if this is unpleasant, the new age variant is this right here. If it's unpleasant, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to see it, and I certainly don't want to tell others about it. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. I'll just ignore it and it'll go away on its own. Well, what happens when you do that with any kind of a sickness or a problem? Does it, does it get better? It gets worse. The second form of emotional mind control is people have a problem hearing truth because they don't like or prefer the way it's delivered. I'm not going to stop delivering truth the way I deliver it. This is my style. I like my style, personally. I don't think I have a problem at all in the way I present. I listen back to my presentations, and I don't you know, totally pat myself on the back, but I say, I did a damn good job there. I'm proud of how, how I did, personally. Okay, I'm making an honest assessment about how I present. And again, I realize my presentation style is mostly for the thick skin. It's not for the people with super delicate sensibilities. So be it. That's not really who I'm trying to reach. I'm trying to do vertical integration, not horizontal integration. You know, build up the community of people who really get it, and they can start propagating it to the masses. This concept is about, you know, the attractive newscaster on the, on the nightly news. She can whisper sweet nothings in your ear all night with the blue frequencies behind her, you know, okay, and say, two plus two equals five. Two plus two equals five. And she's going to get a lot of people to believe that nonsense, right? But the person who's actually telling you the truth that you might not like the sound of his voice, you might not like the harshness that he comes to you with the truth with, the truth with he might be screaming through a bullhorn and saying, hey, you're in danger. You are actively in danger. There is an imperative here, okay? There is a, a, a time consideration here. You don't have all the time in the world to correct this, all right? People say, well, I don't like the way he said that. That comes off as negative to me. I think he's fear-mongering or making a bigger deal out of this than it is. They're not interested in the content, the actual information. They're saying, the way that was said offended me. I don't prefer the sound of his voice or the tone he just took. Well, does that have any damn thing to do with whether the information was true or not? The people who are in this mind state are under emotional mind control. They believe you can determine the veracity of informational content based upon how it makes you feel. And this is a logical fallacy. That cannot be done. You cannot think with the emotions, and I'm not telling you to disregard the emotions. They're unbelievably important. They are our compass for morality in our lives. They're the compass through which we should set the direction of our behavior. But you can't come to determine and analyze and break down what's true or not and make a filtering system based on just how the information made you feel when you heard it, okay? You have to actually think with the mind, with both hemispheres of the brain, with true intelligence to come to uh, filter and determine what's true, okay? No matter how much anybody wants to, you know, give you that soft, sweet, pleasant, emotional voice, okay? That person's still lying to you. And no matter how much the person who comes with an abrasive, abrasive harsh, nasty, or scratchy voice might keep telling you two plus two equals four, and, and, and you don't personally like their tone, guess what, folks? It still equals four at all times and places. That's the truth. No amount of pleasantry or wrapping up the lie is ever going to make this statement on the left here true, ever. But yet, that's what people would rather prefer to hear if it's told to them in a nice, pleasant tone. Truth is belligerent, as I said at the beginning of the presentation. It is, by its very nature, at war with the forces of falsehood and deceit. Brecht. 
We literally believe that we are in the right to ignore a message of truth if the messenger is somehow distasteful to us. I would argue this to be a symptom of total madness. That's an anonymous quote I also found on a forum. I, and that's a great piece of wisdom. That's a gem of wisdom right there. It is total madness to disregard truth just because we don't like the way it was said. It's called emotional mind control. It's been a big part of my work that I've tried to explain to people. Where does the fear of true freedom come from? All right, and this is going to lead into my future work, which is a whole another series of presentations. I'm going to go deeply into this in the future. I call, uh, it's very difficult to see here. There's actually a tree there. It's kind of in a deep red because I'm going to put some text over top of it. I should have started it in a more bright red and then faded it into the background, but forgive that on, on this slide. Uh, you can look it up here at the top of the tree. There's the leaves, all right? The leaves are one's refusal to own their own personal responsibility. Now, you would think, oh, that's way down at the root. No. That's the symptom that's manifesting up at the top of the tree, that's, that's actually the leaves on the tree, the leaves and the twigs, right? Then we get down to the big branches and the trunk of the tree. We're getting closer to the heart of the real psychological issues that are at work driving the negative aspect of the problem, all right? And this we've already talked about, self-loathing due to lack of self-respect. Now, what am I really describing here? What have we actually been describing? What kind of people want to live in perpetual refusal to own personal responsibility because they have some nested traumatic issues that have led to self-loathing and lack of self-respect? What am I really describing there? Me. What? Me. Well, yes, it's a slave mindset, but there's something else that I'm, that I'm describing. What kind of person is that? A child. Thank you. We're talking about people who are psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually immature. They have not grown up. They have not accepted personal responsibility, which is a hallmark of true adulthood or maturity. And this is due to the trauma that they've undergone that's led to self-loathing, okay, and the lack of self-respect, which is why they don't want personal responsibility. They want to remain an eternal child. Now, let's find out what is at the root of this tree of evil. Because until we go into this space, into this causal factor of these other manifesting psychological conditions, we're not actually hitting the actual root of the problem. If a child doesn't like themselves, they hate themselves, they feel they're not good enough, they're not worthy, they have all these imagined uh, feelings of inadequacy and self-loathing, okay? And, they, and that's expressing their refusal to grow up and take personal responsibility for themselves in their adulthood. What kind of trauma specifically has that child more likely than not psychologically undergone? They've gone through a specific type of childhood trauma. And I would argue that most people on earth have gone through this type of trauma. And that type of trauma is called abandonment. The human species is suffering from very deeply seated parental abandonment issues that lie at the very core of the psychological condition that we call the human condition. Until we deal with that nested psychological trauma that has been created through abandonment issues, we're not hitting the roots of the tree of evil. We're not, you know, we're not getting down to the very core issue that needs to be understood. My future work, I'm going to be presenting this on December 12th in Philadelphia for anybody who's in the Philadelphia area. It's going to be what I would call a synthesis, an explanatory synthesis of why this is the root psychological condition of humanity. I call it cosmic abandonment. And this is going to be one of the biggest, biggest aspects of the next part of my work. I think it's going, to, it's going to really set my work apart from others in the truth and freedom community and the alternative research community. Until we wrestle with those psychological abandonment issues, we're not getting to the heart of what's causing these other problems in the human psyche, like self-loathing, the lack of the development of self-respect, and the refusal to uh, own the responsibility for one's own actions.
And I'm going to connect this with human origins. And I'm going to make the case that it has always been like that. It has always been like that. We have been children on this planet since we have been on this planet. And we have never actually psychically, psychologically, and emotionally and spiritually grown up because as a species, we have undergone what I term cosmic abandonment. So that's going to be coming up in, in future aspects of my work. What will be required on the part of those performing this great work? And you know, it is like Sisyphus rolling that boulder up the hill. We just got to get it up to the top and give it that one last push so we don't have to keep doing it again. Who knows how many times we've already tried to do this and it's ended in failure. We need the knowledge of the real enemy, the real enemy, okay? And we'll get to what that is. We need to devote ourselves to service to truth, not even service to humanity. I'm not saying that's not a great virtue to have and to enact. I'm telling you we need to go beyond that. This isn't about service to me, you, or any other individual. It's about service to truth and principles first and foremost. And we need courage and persistence. And then we need practical real-world skills. The knowledge of the real enemy needs to ultimately come first. And this isn't it, folks. This priest class that goes and meets and has the rituals at Bohemian Grove, I'm not telling you they're not evil. I'm not telling you they're not psychopaths. I'm not telling you that we don't need people like that in the world, okay? I'm telling you that in this spiritual war, this is a tiny, 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 insignificant, as far as numbers are concerned, fraction of the totality of the human population that could not possibly control the minds and the behaviors, and therefore the behaviors of the masses of people without our compliance, without our ignorance, so, while I'm not telling you I, you know, like these people, do I have respect for them as an opponent? Oh, yeah, you damn, well, you damn well better believe I do. I don't underestimate these psychopaths. Not a bit. You want to know why I worked with them? I know what their will is like. I know what their intellect is like. And I'm telling you, don't ask to underestimate either one. I'm telling you, don't ask to underestimate their care. They don't have, like I said, they don't have care in the terms of compassion and the normal range of human emotions like we do, but don't think that means they don't have care. They deeply care about what they're enacting, what their agenda is, and they have the will to carry it out, and they're not slowing down. They're unified. They're on a unified front. They're on the same page. Believe it. Know it. I'm not telling you that from, like I said, reading about it or book knowledge. I've been around these psychopaths. I haven't specifically been to this psychopathic gathering, but I've been around them enough. That's not the real enemy, that is. The sleeping masses, hypnotized masses, they're your enemy. They're, you want, see, people will say, the Illuminati enslaves humanity. No, it doesn't. Humanity enslaves the real Illuminati. And think about that for a little bit, you know? Do, do those psychopaths in the last slide really enslave us? And first of all, people who call them the Illuminati, they're, they're no such thing. Illuminati means that you're enlightened, the illuminated ones. You want to know who's the enlightened ones? They're in this room. We're the Illuminati. The people who know what I'm talking about here are the Illuminati. They're the illuminated ones. They're the ones with the light. They're the ones with the real knowledge, okay? They want to refer to themselves as the enlightened ones. Well, they, they might have the dark sun, but they don't have the true sun. You know, they're imbued with the black sun. That means it's all intellectual knowledge and then you're applying it for the totally immoral wrong reasons, which is to control and manipulate other people. <laughs> There's nothing illuminated about that. So the real Illuminati, they're not the enslavers of humanity. The dark Illuminati are not the enslavers of humanity either. Humanity enslaves itself, and they're enslaving the true Illuminati, the teachers who are actually living under the conditions of slavery because they're here with the ignorant people. That's who's being enslaved by humanity. Humanity are the enslavers. And this is another thing that's highly unpopular. People don't want to hear it. They want to think we're powerless victims. There's no choice involved here. This is something that's just being done to us. Okay? And I'm here to tell you, free will is always in existence. 
and it's a matter of changing one's thoughts and therefore changing one's choices. And that's our own personal responsibility that can never be given away or shirked or shunned. You are always responsible for what we're doing. Service to truth is required. Truth itself is eternal, can never be destroyed. But you know what? Humanity can be destroyed. We can be destroyed when we refuse to act in service to truth as her defenders. People say, oh, truth doesn't need to be defended. Nonsense. Truth needs to be defended at all times and places because the attack on it is never-ending and non-stop, continuous. And if we don't come to her defense, you know what happens? The voice of untruth and deception and evil and mind control rules the day. And the voice of truth doesn't get heard. Because the truth itself doesn't have a physical voice in the physical domain. You know, we have to be its mediums and we have to be its voice. It's possible for us to co-create a positive outcome in this scenario, but this can only be accomplished if we care enough to learn the truth ourselves and then we develop the courage to continuously speak it to other people until our voice of truth becomes a non-stop chorus like the voice of lies and deception and mind control has been for millennia on this planet. Courage is required. Samuel Adams encapsulated this brilliantly. He said, the liberties of our countries are worth defending at, at all hazards. It is our duty to defend them against all attacks. It will bring a mark of everlasting infamy on the present generation if we should suffer them to be wrested from us by violence without any struggle or to be cheated out of them by the artifices of designing men. If you love wealth greater than liberty, if you love the tranquility of servitude greater than the animating contest for freedom, then go home from us in peace. We seek not your counsel nor your arms. Crouch down and lick the hand that feeds you. May your chains set lightly upon you and may posterity forget that you are ever our countrymen. <laughs> now that's about as powerful as it gets as far as I'm concerned. Because he's telling you, if your allegiance isn't to the truth and freedom, I don't want to know you. I don't want to know you. And, I, and we hope history forgets that you ever were with us at this time and place in history. And because you deserve to be forgotten. That's what he's saying here. You know, I, I couldn't agree more. Persistence is required. Constant effort we are the actual vehicles by which, tr which truth, by which truth operates in the world. Therefore, it is our shared responsibility at this time to help to awaken others by continuously speaking the truth. Even if we feel burdened by this task, even if we feel no one is listening, and even if it makes all involved in this process feel uncomfortable. It's not about feeling comfort, folks. It's not about staying complacent. It's about shaking things up making people feel uncomfortable. Who said, who ever told anybody that the truth would make you all warm and fuzzy inside? Who ever told anybody that? Why do people want to believe that? Who ever said that that was the case? The truth is horrible and yet needs to be embraced as a lover, okay? With dedication to it, even in its full horror. Thomas Paine, who I feel was the most enlightened person on the continent at the time of the American Revolution, personally, he's one of my, my personal heroes, um, and walked in the vicinity where I, I walk sometimes now. He said, these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine, sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. I think he was one of the true anarchists that was living amongst us in the colonial days. Words attributed to the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama. He said, there are only two mistakes that one can ever make on the path to truth. Not starting and not going all the way. 
all the way. I wrap up a lot of my podcasts with this quote because I love it so much. It's about persistence. It's not about saying, hey, I went this far and now I'm uncomfortable to see the rest of the picture. I, I made it three quarters up the mountain. That's far enough. Let me set up my base camp here. I'll pitch my tent and I'm staying here. No farther. I don't want to see the peak. Okay? Until we become fully enlightened and go all the way to the summit, don't expect things to change. Don't expect them to get better. The truth has to be taken in its, in its fullness. We need real world practical skills. You know, this isn't just about, oh, I know this now and I don't actually need any skills. Okay? To communicate truth, skill is required. Knowledge is required. Okay? To reach a good amount of people. Yeah, you can just talk to the people around you. You can communicate, uh, you know, to a small fraction of people that way. I'm not saying don't do that, even if you don't have these other skills. I'm saying if you want to get it out in a big way to the masses of people and in the new form of media, which is doing things like this through the correct and positive and empowering use of technology, people want to say, oh, there's no, technology is not, not you know, there's no role for it. We've got to get rid of technology. Technology is a thing that improves life at every scale and level. It's a tool. It's how it's used. Exactly. Okay? We're using technology for a powerful and enlightening purpose right now. And that's its intended use. It's to serve humanity and to serve truth. Okay? So real world skills in the technological era, I feel, are absolutely required. And here's some of them. You need good organizational skills. You know? Like, hey, Art and Chris did this right today. They set this up right. You know, I've seen people set things up real badly. And I've seen it done the correct way, which is this way. And Richard and Lisa, they've done a brilliant job here getting this all on film. And, and you know, that, this will be going online and reaching a ton, a real wider base of people as a result. All right? So you need organizational skills. Some people are better than that with others. I'm pretty good with organization. I feel I, I have put good, powerful organization skills. Communication skills. You need to have a way with words. You need to have a good vocabulary. You need to organize words correctly. You need to be able to communicate concepts in often a very linear fashion to people so that they can readily absorb it easily. You know? If you're all over the place, they're not going to get the concept. You need graphic design skills in many cases. You know? I couldn't build a presentation like this without my background in graphic design. And, you know, thank God I have it. You know, it's like I got jobs like I did in the past and sort of they prepared me for everything that I was going to do in, in my future. Synchromistically worked out like that. But, you know, you got, at least got to know how to lay out a flyer, folks. How many people here can lay out a simple flyer? That's awesome. I, I'm, I'm so highly impressed by that. I'm telling you, I've asked people that in, in other, other presentations. Like two people raised their hand. That's awesome. Okay? You should be proud of that. Presentation skills, like putting something like this together. How many people have basic presentation skills with a computer? A little less, but not bad either. I'm impressed. Okay? Audio skills. You know, sometimes you got to work with audio and, you know, podcast audio, etc. Video, video editing skills. I know Rich, Rich is a master at that. Um, website development. You know, this was laborious in, in the past, just 10 years ago. You know, we have free open source content management systems now that make this almost a breeze. You know, it's a somewhat little bit of a learning curve, but once you get there, hey, you're, you're off to the races. You can maintain multiple websites then, right? So how many people can build a simple website by a show of hands? That's also awesome. I mean, I, you know, kudos. <laughs> Whoever hates that word, you know, whatever. But <laughs> I'm telling you, that's impressive. For an amount of people in one room to have all those skills, I'm impressed. I, I, it's very rare. All right? Networking skills. I mean, literally, like people skills. I'm weak on this. All right? I can do it. I don't like doing it. <laughs> I don't like marketing pr and promotion either. I'm not a good marketer of my work. I'm trying to get better at that, but I need some work with that. And maybe there's people that can help me with that. But, you know, I have a good chunk of all these skills. I could do all of them... I'm not so good on the last two. I need need more work. But, um, you know, if uh, 
If most of us don't have these skills, we're not going to be reaching the optimum number of people. We need to become the new media that is dedicated to truth and put that out there for other people's consumption and other people's edification. All right? We are, we are the answer. We are the illuminators, the ones who will help to enlighten other people once we've taken this knowledge into ourselves. And then that's only the beginning, folks. You got to put it back out there. I tell people the story. I had all this knowledge for a long time, sitting on it, doing nothing with it, just taking more in. Oh, I want to make sure I got it all right. I want to make sure I got the whole picture. I go to a meeting in the state of Virginia. Virginia, virgin, the goddess, okay? Care, very synchronistic. A woman comes up to me. She says, you're one of the most knowledgeable people I've come across. What are you doing? So what do you mean, what am I doing? She said, I mean, what are you doing with all the knowledge you have? You're doing pre le lectures, presentations, videos, audio. What are you doing? I'm not doing any of those things. I'm just taking a lot more in, downloading a lot more videos. She goes like this, and it's just so matter-of-factly and harshly. What makes you think you have the right to do that? <laughs> what makes you think you can keep taking all of this in, all of this in, all of this in, and not put any of it back out? What makes you think you even have a right to do that? I was like, it was like somebody hit me in the face. <laughs> she, she said, this was her phrase. She said, I'll never forget it. You're Niagara Falls in a water balloon. You're taking all this in and all this pressure, pressure, pressure building up. It's got no outlet. It's going to burst. She said, you have to put an outlet valve on that knowledge and let it flow out of you and go out to others and then more will come in. Right now, there's no pressure release valve. Your Niagara Falls in a water balloon. It's like a truck ran me over, you know? Literally like I got hit by a truck. I, I came up with the idea for what on earth is happening like a couple weeks after that because that's all I could think about. All I could think about is what she said. It kept echoing in my head. What makes you think you have a right to do that? And didn't say it nice. Like said it like, you know, uh, you're not doing the right thing here. Uh, get up off your ass and do something. That was the tone it was set in. And I totally appreciate it. You know? Who knows, man? If that wasn't said to me at that time, I might not be doing any. I might not have done a thing. You never know. I'd like to think at some point I would have, but... At the crossroads, this is the last section. Then we'll get to some questions. Quote by Buck, R. Buckminster Fuller, The dark ages still reign over all of humanity, and the depth and persistence of this domination are only now becoming clear. This dark ages prison has no steel bars, no chains, or locks. Instead, it is locked by misorientation and built upon misinformation. Caught up in a plethora of conditioned reflexes and driven by the human ego, both warden and prisoner attempt meagerly to compete with God. All are intractically skeptical of what they do not understand. We are powerfully imprisoned in these dark ages simply by the terms in which we have been conditioned to think. The conditioning of our thought is what has kept us in this prison. And only now, the, the, the actual depth of the dark ages that we are in are starting to become clear to some people. We are in the time that I call the apocalypse, and actually, I want to start rephrasing this. I want to actually explain to people, we're not in the apocalypse anymore. We are now in post-apocalyptic times. We are living in post-apocalypse. The apocalypse has already occurred. It's over. We are living in the time after the apocalypse. And what do I mean by that? Well, we got to look at the meaning of the word, Okay. From the Greek prefix, apo, which means away from, off of, or removed from. And then the Greek verb, kaliptine, which means to cover, or to conceal, or to hide. So, apocalypse means literally to take the cover off of, to remove the veil from, or to take something out of hiding. Well, ladies and gentlemen, another big surprise. The veil has already been lifted. The truth is already out there. It's out. The truth about what's going on here and has been going on here on the earth is out. It has been de-occulted. 
and not just by me, by many, many other researchers, okay? There's a laundry list of them out on my website and I talk about in, po in the podcasts, all right? It's all out there. Um, it literally means to reveal or to take out of hiding. The apocalypse is the great revealing of the truth to the masses of people. Or it is what I simply refer to as the process of de-occulting the truth, removing it from being hidden. What humanity needs to do is make what I call the cosmic apology. And I'll get to what that means. See these words right here? I was wrong. That's the most powerful phrase that can ever be said by a human being. The second most powerful phrase I would say, I would acknowledge, is I love you. But this is more powerful than even that. Because this is about internal change not just a dynamic or an interaction or a relationship with another. This is about an internal metamorphosis. When you say these words, this is the, the phrase of all power. No is the word of all power by which we reclaim our power. But this is the phrase of power. All right? Uh, okay. The word apology comes from Greek. Apo, meaning away from, off of, or removed from, as we've just, just seen. And the Greek noun logos Logos means word, okay? So hence, an apology it literally means to go away from the word or to give back the word, okay? You are taking it back. So if I make an apology, I said something, I didn't really mean it or I want to retract it. I, an apology means, let me take back what I just said, okay? I'm taking it back, I'm removing the word. All right, I'm going away from the former word or phrase that I just said. That's an apology in the standard colloquial English understanding sense. All right, let's look at what I call the cosmic apology and where this term really comes from, what it really means. See, the Greek noun logos, which is written there in Greek script, which means word in Greek, it comes from the Greek verb lego. All right? Lego in Greek means to speak or to say. It's where we get the English word lexicon from. All right? The Latin noun lex, legis, is related to the Greek verb lego, to say. Again, because who put the laws into manifestation? The creator did. How did the, man, how did the creator manifest the physical universe and all the laws? Spoke it into existence. Reality and truth are spoken into existence by the power of vibration, the vibratory power of voice. Okay? So the creator created the universe by the phrase, fiat lux in Latin. It means let there be light. Okay? The Latin noun lex legis, meaning law, is actually derived from this Greek verb lego, meaning to speak or to say. God and not man is the logos the author of law, the one who spoke the law into existence at the creation of the universe, because natural law is the boundary conditions of the, the manifested reality called the physical universe. These are the boundary conditions which govern it. Humanity's work is to learn to listen to God's word, not man's word, not man's law, natural law, spiritual law, Moral law, God's law, karmic law. I don't care what you want to call it. Call it whatever you want. Okay? Consequentialism. This is the truth. That's what, you want to talk about what all these phrases really mean? It all comes back to the word truth. That's it. It's the truth about what is, what's operating here. And humanity needs to align its behavior to this law. God's law, natural law. Without alignment of its behavior, don't expect to, to natural law, don't expect a thing to change here. Expect it to rapidly grow worse. Humanity must make a cosmic apology by giving the word, okay, which means the authorship of creating law. See, we think we're the authors, we're the authorities. That's what author means, right? Author. What's another word for author? This is just a, a quick, this is how mind control through words works, right? An author is a what? A writer. Well, what are you saying there? An author who has authority, they are authoring something, is a writer. 
They are a right, R-I-G-H-T dash E-R. Okay? They're making it into a right. This is what you hear when you hear the word authority. You hear author, which means a writer, meaning one who makes rights, which means someone who believes they're God. That's all this really comes down to. In a nutshell, we're up against a class of people who believe that they can be God and own and rule everybody else. That's, that's all the dark occult comes down to, folks. People who believe they're God. Sick, psychopathic lunatics who think they're God and are going to rule the hell of the prison world that they're going to create, that they call their dark new world order. We need to give the word back. That's what an apology is. And who it needs to be given back to is the creator of the universe because that's the author of the law. That's its rightful owner. The word doesn't belong to us, folks. The word belongs to God. That's why it says at the beginning of the biblical text, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God. You know, that's what the logos is. Natural law. God is law. You want the best definition I could ever give you for the word God? Law. People don't want to look at it like that. Very few people ever look at it like that. That's what the force of creation is. It's natural law. It's how we create, co-create our reality, whether we do it consciously or unconsciously. This apology is accomplished when we open our minds and hearts to truth and we start saying the lost word, no, to evil, to the presence of evil in our lives. See, th this is a, an initiate inside what was known as the, the Jed or the Dejed pillars, depending on how certain people pronounce it. And these Jed pillars represented stability and enlightenment. And they represent the two principles, the sacred feminine principle of non-aggression and the sacred masculine principle of self-defense. The initiate is the, is the enlightened one who is, who is incorporated and bridged both pillars and has come to the place of cosmic illumination, which is represented by the uh, winged disc of Ma'at in the Kemetian tradition, which is over the lintel between the two pillars. That winged disc of Ma'at. Ma'at was considered a great mother goddess in the Kemetian, the, the ancient Egyptian traditions. Okay? She was the force. She, she, she was a personified deity. You know, the ancient Kemetians didn't actually worship a physical woman. It's not what this was. It was the personification of truth and justice and order and natural law that was encapsulated as the sacred feminine essence. And she was above all the other deities in the, in the pantheon of Egyptian deities, of Kemetian deities. Maat, there was no, god, no god, god or goddess higher. And how they looked at alignment with Maat is if you wanted to have order and you wanted to avoid chaos, you learned the teachings of Maat because she was the goddess of justice and she was the goddess of righteousness. She was the goddess that brought order if you aligned herself, if you aligned yourself to her teachings and her teachings were natural law. So that's what this is here. This is saying we need to take away the word. It's not saying remain silent and don't use your voice. It's not what it's ever been saying. This is a, a symbolic allegory for the apology, right? You know what else the G in the middle of the compasses in square is? Apollo G, the sun, the light, the generative principle, okay? We need to make the Apollo G, all right? That's what the, the G in the middle of the compasses in square in uh, allegory, also represents, because one of the big deities, uh, the Greek deities that is uh, often kind of exemplified in the Freemasonic tradition is Apollo. He was a sun god, and he was a, uh, you know, a corollary to Horus in the Egyptian tradition, and Jesus in the Christian tradition, you know, and Mithra in the Persian tradition, and many other sun gods that represented truth and light. All right? So that's the middle way, the middle pillar. That's what the initiate represents. You know, at the, I started this presentation with the slide before we begin. Now we have begun. 
And it's up to you to take it further. You know, what you'll do with this knowledge is entirely up to you. See, this is a painting by Alex Gray that shows the worldview schism. Are we going to stay embedded in the left brain and in other forms of imbalance and we're going to create the negative worldview, right? Or are we going to live in harmony with natural law, which can create this path when we incorporate the creative and nurturing and sacred feminine aspect of our beings? Natural law, living in harmony with it, can only lead to these conditions. Freedom, peace, prosperity, the continuation of our species, our actual physical survival, and our evolutionary progress in consciousness. That's what living in harmony with natural law leads to. Conversely, living in opposition to natural law will get us this side of the world tree. It'll bring this world, this hellish world of chaos and destruction. Because living in opposition to natural law can only lead to these states. Control, enslavement, war, chaos, evolutionary stagnation, and ultimately the extinction of our species. Which will we choose? You know, that's still up in the air. I can't tell you that. Only each individual can make that decision for themselves, and then that will play out in the aggregate, in the mass consciousness, the numbers. Thomas Jefferson said, a free people claim their rights as derived from the laws of nature. And this was also embedded in the Declaration of Independence. The laws of nature and of nature's God. And not as the gift of their magistrates. John Locke said, the natural liberty of man is to be free from any superior power on earth and not to be under the will or legislative authority of man, but only to have the law of nature for his rule. Former Grand Master of the Order of the Rose Cross, the Rosicrucian tradition, Francis Bacon said, nature, to be commanded, must first be obeyed. If we want the forces of the cosmos on our side, we have to learn and adhere to the principles of natural law. If we do not align our behavior to that, nature will not stand with us. It will continuously stand against us, and it will itself create more strife and suffering in our lives. And we certainly won't command it. We won't command its forces like, with things like free energy used for any positive purpose. It'll only be used for destructive purposes. The uh, psychologist Alfred Adler said, there is a law that man should love his neighbor as himself. And he's referring, of course, here to the golden rule. In a few hundred years, it should be as natural to mankind as breathing or the upright gait. But if he does not learn it, he must perish. And you know, folks, I would really hope this is going to take less than a few hundred years. But based on where we're at, I'm not so sure. You know? I think we could do it a lot faster than that if we accept the key that's been shown here today that, as I said before, has the power to unlock all the locks on all the doors to all the cages. And that's what the knowledge of natural law comprises. Will we make the choice to climb the ladder of consciousness through an act of our own free will, choice, and effort. It's not a, diff it's not a simple climb. I mean, it, it's a difficult climb. Uh, it, it's not overly complicated to learn these concepts, to learn these truths. It involves abandoning many things that we've already been conditioned with that don't serve who we are, okay? But I'm not telling you it's going to be easy, all right? It involves a lot of deep introspective work. But if we do it, we can step out of the prison that we've imposed upon ourselves by balancing the sacred feminine and masculine forces within each one of us. And by recognizing our own inherent sovereignty and that there is no legitimacy and never has been any legitimacy to slavery and control and the external rulership of human beings as subjects, okay? That recognition of sovereignty has to go hand in hand with our knowledge of natural law. It's a totally integrated component of it. 
This was the title slide. This card, this tarot card was on the title slide. When you understand, and I've talked about this in some of my work online, when you understand the deep connection to the tarot tradition and other mystery tradition teachings, specifically, it's very deep interwoven relationship to the Kabbalistic tradition of the Middle Eastern uh, mystery traditions, all right? You understand that this card right here actually represents the will of creation and what creation itself, what the, the mind of the universe itself ultimately wants to manifest in physical reality. Not in some otherworldly dream world or fantasy realm or spiritual reality that is to come or not come. Right here in the physical domain, which is not separate and distinct from the spiritual domain, they are one and the same. This card is known as the justice card. Okay? And it's based on the Latin word jus, which means right or law. Okay? That's where we get the English word justice. This card represents balance between the pillars, as you see on the right side of the king, holding the sword of truth in hand, and the scales of truth and justice have been perfectly balanced and are in the other hand. And it represents sovereignty, and it represents alignment with natural law, and most of all, it represents alignment with truth and the manifestation of order. That can only happen when we align our behaviors to the principles of natural law. Only then will we see the manifestation that the universe is itself wishing for us and trying to help us create, which is justice and order. If we let go of the things that are holding us back and break our mental chains of bondage, we can create a world that is based in actual real freedom. It is possible. I'm not telling you it's not going to be arduous work or a difficult journey, but it can be done. Okay? If we choose to do that, we're going to see advances and cr things that are going to be created that it, the world is going to look so drastically different if we go down that middle path to the truth and to order and to justice through the understanding of natural law and actually applying it and living it in our lives, that the changes we're going to experience are going to be so positive and so transformative that we're going, we can scarcely even imagine what the world will be like on the other side of that work, of, on the other side of that transformation. Will that be done? Maybe. Maybe not. The answer will come from what you see in the reflection of that device right there. That's what will determine it. Nothing else. It's up to each individual. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your kind attention today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Finally, this right here, Lex Rex, simply means the law is king. The law is king. Lex Rex. That's, that's my final slide. Thanks so much. Let's do some question and answer. How much time do we have, by the way? Did I run way over or did I leave some? Oh, my God. Hey, I'm... I, I'm, ve I'm very happy that the, that the venue allowed us to go over by this much, okay? And that they didn't just come in and say, you got to get out of here. So I really did want to leave time for questions, but I think it would be, I, I don't know if it would be really just, you know, intrusive and ignorant at this point to just stay even beyond this time. So maybe we should start packing it up, all right? I apologize for going so far over. I think, the inf I think the information speaks for itself and is worth it, and I hope I was clarified on that. Listen, I'll tell you what. Anybody has specific questions? Since there's no time for questions, let me just get this across, okay? Since there's no time for questions, I'll make a personal effort, and I, I rarely tell people I will respond to email questions. 
Tell me that specifically that you attended this seminar here today in an email. And if you have a, a specific question, get to the specific question quickly in your email, and I will make the time over the next few weeks to try to respond to everybody. I, I'll promise that. How's that? Does that sound okay? All right. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you guys all so much for being here, for staying for the whole thing. Thank you. I'm very impressed with uh, uh, with you guys today. You know that takes a tremendous effort of will and and attention. So you know, thanks. Thank you guys so much.